Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What If Broken Villain Deku Had Gamer Quirk. Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Izuku swore to God he didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. After the visit to Gentle's house, he felt like whatever that was weighing him down had finally been lifted, and he had never felt so relieved before. In a rush of adrenaline, Izuku rode his bike extremely fast, turning a blind eye to all traffic order as he sped down the street without stopping at every intersection to look left and right. It ran out too fast for Izuku to pull the brakes on time. When he came to, he was lying on the ground face down, pain all over his body and a warm liquid touching his lips. He stuck out his tongue in reflex and licked it. Blood. He was bleeding from a wound on his forehead. Everywhere hurt. Large patches of skin on his limbs had been shaved off by the pavement. A searing pain shot up his spine when he tried to move them. Something was constricting his lungs, making it hard to breathe. Izuku took a shuddering breath, his entire body rattling with exhale. Help. He thought. Your health has reached below 50%. Would you like to seek help? Gola Rip, help me, please. In his blurry vision the notification vanished and a dot appeared. Then more dots popped up, grouping together, stacking on top of each other, forming a circular shape that floated in the air. You want me to save you, master? Izuku couldn't read Gola's expression. Its voice was monotone, lacking its usual sass. Please. A rectangle appeared before Izuku. He squinted his eyes, sharpening his sight. It looked like dot 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 the bizarre page. A bottle-shaped item fell out of its diagram on the screen, much like how magicians pulled a burger straight out of the menu. The bottle floated towards Izuku, its cap popping off and allowing Izuku to see the color of the content. Red, like blood. But he knew it wasn't blood. Drink it, Gola ordered. The bottle tilted, the red potion dripping over the rim and into Izuku's mouth. Then it leaned back when Izuku had a mouthful as if it could read his mind. This repeated until the whole bottle was empty. Tastes like strawberry. Izuku murmured, wiping his with his sleeves before he realized. Ah, I can move now. His vision cleared and Izuku skimmed over his body. All the injuries had disappeared, his skin unblemished like that of a newborn. Izuku swung his arm in wild circles, testing his movement. He could move it just fine. Thanks Gola. Gola turned away. The metallic color of its surface had a red tint to it. D don't thank me. I'm just doing my job. Before Izuku could respond, he heard a soft yo behind him. Meow. A cat was lying a few feet away from Izuku. Its limbs were twisted in ways that turned Izuku's stomach upside down and its dirty white furs were smeared with blood. Izuku rushed next to it. He placed a finger before its nose. Its breathing was shallow. Gola, can I use the potion on others? Yes master, you can. Anything in the bazaar can be used on other living beings, like that gadget you bought for your friend Ayama Yuuga. Izuku brought up the bazaar page and purchased a red potion. Not even paying attention to the amount of reputation points deducted from his total as he uncapped the bottle and gently poured the liquid into the cat's mouth. Its tongue twitched, then began lapping up the liquid eagerly. Some spilled out of its mouth but most of it wasn't wasted. Izuku watched in awe as its mangled limbs fixed itself back into a normal angle and the cuts all over its body closed in and disappeared altogether. The cat snapped its eyes open and upon seeing Izuku's round face up close, it shrieked and scrambled a fair distance away, knocking over a trash can in the process and hiding underneath the trash that spilled all over it. Uh, um, Izuku scratched his head. Are you okay? The cat remained still. I can see your body through the trash, you know. It didn't even twitch. Izuku sighed and ran a hand through his hair, feeling like an idiot talking to a cat. He must be out of his mind. When had animals ever talked before? Seeing the cat still reluctant to move even as an unfinished can of soda lay on top of it spilling its content all over its dirtied furs, Izuku decided to just leave it be and picked up his bicycle. He waved a hand over it, casting an observe on the object. Plus one. Name, All Might themed bicycle. Owner, Midoriya Izuku. Durability, 420th. Worth, 7,000 yen. Description, A limited edition All Might themed bicycle for kids that was released two years ago. Now it doesn't worth as much as before, but if you save it for a hundred years I bet you it'll worth more than ten times the current amount. The durability is four already. Izuku gasped. Last time I checked it was still fifteen. Well, if the crash had gotten his HP down to less than fifty percent, then it wasn't really a surprise that his bicycle was this broken. Izuku tapped the fix option next to durability. Do you want to spend fifty rep points to fix the durability to one hundred percent? Yes obviously. Loading. Durability is now twenty over twenty. Do you want to spend another 10 rep points to customize this object's colors and size? Izuku was satisfied with the All Might colors. After all that was the whole point of having a bicycle like this. As for the size, he would have to change it later when he had grown taller and the bicycle no longer fit him. He selected no. The screen vanished and Izuku looked over his bike. 
Good as new. The next morning. Are you kidding me? The first thing Izuku saw when he exited his house was the dirty cat sitting obediently by the front door. Mew. You followed me all the way here. Meow. Izuku frowned. I can't take care of you. I have to go to school. Meow. The cat went up close to him and nuzzled its cheek against Izuku's pants leg just as an idea came to him. Plus one. Shiro LV1. Two years old. Clingy. Shy. Fidgety. Status. Starving. If it had a name, did that mean it was a stray cat? I would love to find your owner for you, but I have to go to school right now. So, you know what? Izuku took out the bowl of cereal and bag of cat food from his inventory. He peeled the plastic lid off of the bowl and poured the cereal into his mouth, munching quickly and swallowing. Then, he dumped a mountain pile of cat food into the bowl and pushed it closer to the cat. Here, eat this. I'll help you find your owner after school's over. Don't run off. Okay, Shiro-chan. Shiro didn't answer him but instead rushed to the food, burying its face into the food. Hearing the sound of soft chewing, Izuku smiled softly and stored the half-full bag of food into his inventory. Like he promised, the moment school ended, Izuku threw all his belongings into his magic backpack, keeping them out of sight and storing them into his inventory, and pedaled home as fast as possibly. This time, he made sure he stopped at every stop sign. He almost had a panic attack when he found Shiro not where he left it this morning. But then he realized, Shiro would obviously get bored and wander off. Anyone would if they had to stand at one spot for over eight hours. Even a trained soldier would. It didn't take long for him to locate it. Its white furs poking out of a pile of trash was easy enough to spot. Quest alert. Description. A famous saying goes never leave a cat behind. Heroes don't just save humans, they save animals as well. Help Shiro by finding its owner. Time limit, 7 days. Reward, 2 reputation points, 300 EXP. Failure, finding a missing cat's owner was too big of a task for one kid. You need the help of a cat expert, like one Shinsu Hitoshi. Hello, hey Toshi, it's me, Izuku, I can tell. Hitoshi chuckled on the other end. What do you need? Don't you know lots about cats? I found a stray cat yesterday and I need your help locating its owner. Ooh, now, I'm kinda busy. With what? Manami's coming over soon. For what? You never really hang out with her much. I want her to teach me hacking. I thought it's pretty cool. Oh, well, you can bring her, too. It'll be faster if all three of us work together. Okay, fine. I'll ask her about it. See you at the park in 10. See ya. Hanging up. Izuku left his mama note saying he's going to the park and will be back soon. The park was about five minutes away from his house. There were already a few children playing around on the playground when Izuku arrived with the cat on his tail. He sat down on a bench and placed the empty bowl on the ground. Shiro immediately went beside it, staring up at him with hungry eyes. Okay okay, I know you're hungry, just give me a minute. Izuku brought out the bag and emptied the remaining content into the bowl. As he watched Shiro eat, he reached out tentatively and placed his hand on its head. When it didn't react, he started petting it, letting out a pleasing smile as he did so. Five minutes later, Izuku was bored. He had poured a bottle of milk into the empty bowl after Shiro finished eating, and now it was lapping up eagerly. He had enough petting to last a long time. And now he wanted to do something else. Looking around to make sure no one was paying attention to him, Izuku got up and knelt down behind Shiro. Pressing his cheek to the ground, he squinted at the cat's butt. What are you doing? Hiya! Izuku yelped in surprise. He turned around, waving his hands frantically. It's not what you think it is. I, I just want to check whether it's a girl or a boy. Hitoshi brushed past him and crouched beside Shiro, who had already finished with the milk and was staring at Hitoshi curiously. He petted it gently and, when it didn't reject his hand, he picked it up. It's a girl, Hitoshi declared. So this is the missing cat. Where did you find it? Um, let's just say we had a fateful encounter. Izuku chuckled nervously. Where's Minami-chan by the way? She's on her way. Aba Minami was in love. She had never felt this feeling before, not for her neglecting parents, nor for anyone else. Midoriya Izuku was the first person she had felt this kind of emotions towards, and she was confused at first as to what this emotion was called. It took some googling and asking people on Reddit to find out that this unexplainable feeling was called love. Minami was terrified when she found her answers. She didn't tell anyone, especially Izuku, in fear of destroying their friendship. What if he didn't like her back? What if he didn't want to be friends with her anymore after this? She had to keep this feeling as a secret. It was painful, but for now, just being next to him was enough. It was with this thought in mind that Minami made her way over to the park. Hitoshi and Izuku were already there when she arrived. She hid behind a tree, not wanting to interrupt them with her presence. When dot 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 find dot 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 her, Hitoshi was saying, find who? Curious, Manami shifted closer. She, following me. Manami froze, a cold chill running down her back. Could Izuku be talking about dot 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 her? 
Don't dot 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 what dot 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 do dot 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 Izuku continued. Dot 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 fine dot 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 I dot 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 hate dot dot dot. Hate. Izuku was talking about her following him. He had already found out about her love, and he hated it. Manami trembled, her legs failing her and she collapsed onto the grass, covering her mouth to suppress her cry. She allowed tears to flow down her face. She couldn't be his friend anymore. He hated her after all. Nothing. Izuku gasped, wiping sweat off of his forehead. Me too. Itoshi sighed. For the past two hours they'd been running around the neighborhood asking everyone in the area, even knocking on very house. But in the end, no one knew about the cat. Do you think maybe it's not a stray? No, it definitely is. Look, Hitoshi pointed at the tip of Shiro's ear. See that ear? The tip of that ear has been notched. It means she has been spayed. It's a necessary surgical procedure for all pet cats. Cool, I didn't know that. You really are the cat expert, Toshi. Hitoshi lifted his chin and stroked Shiro behind the ears, grinning. Look who you're talking to. So, Izuku sighed and began to walk back towards the park. The only thing we can do now is make posters for her. I'll get started on that right away, and print them out at school tomorrow. Then we can meet up after school and post them on the street. There's bound to be someone who has seen. Shiro-chan, someone said from ahead, stopping Izuku and Hitoshi in their tracks. It was a very familiar man dressed in what looked like pajamas and flip-flops. His unruly hair was even messier, and he had stubbles all over his chin. Izuku had never seen him so messed up. It was as if he was up all night and day looking for his missing cat. Oh, you cat thieves. Reputation point plus two. Later on Eraserhead spent an hour checking over Shiro making sure she hadn't been bullied by them. He thanked them afterwards for caring for Shiro and making sure no harm had come to her before he left. Manami didn't show up even after Izuku and Hitoshi parted ways at the park. Perhaps she had other things to do and couldn't contact them since they didn't have a phone. Izuku didn't know and he didn't bother to ask. It wasn't a big deal anyway. Shiro was returned to Eraserhead safe and sound and everything was good. Besides, Izuku would be meeting her this set anyway on their trip to AMAP. Talking about AMAP, he should start getting ready. The moment Tashinori stepped into the house, he nearly puked as a heavy stench hit his senses. He had to cover his nose as he struggled to take off his shoes with one hand, leaving the door wide open. Young Shimura, he called as he stumbled to the boy's room. The door was locked, like always. I need to, ahem, talk to you. Go away, came Tenko's voice from inside. The pressure in his lungs forced Tashinori to inhale. The smell got in his throat and he could almost taste it. The closer he was to Tenko's room, the stronger the smell. It was a few days ago when Tashinori found out about the hand. It started out with a strange smell in the background that brought up some bad memories in his mind. Tashinori had dealt with dead bodies before so he knew what a rotten body smell like. He thought it was perhaps a dead mice at first. But after flipping the entire house over and finding nothing, he turned his suspicion to Tenko. The boy had been hiding inside his room since he arrived. Food were all delivered to his door and Tenko would only come out and get it when Tashinori had left. The only time he had seen the boy was when he used the toilet. He even went as far as to choose the time Tashinori wasn't around to take showers. Tashinori had expected the boy to be evasive and antisocial, but he didn't know things would be this drastic. He had faked leaving the house and was instead hiding beneath the table waiting for Tenko to come out. When the boy opened the door with his showering supplies, that was when Tashinori saw the rotting hand wrapped up in a plastic bag and realized what was going on. He had confronted the boy right away, imploring for an explanation, but all he received was a door slammed in his face. He understood Tenko's need to have something remember his father by, so he didn't tell Chief Tsurigami about this, yet, eventually, he would have to. But if he did it now it would only serve to further distance his relationship with Tenko and make the boy hate him more. He had to take it slow. But it was hard to take things slow when his house smelled like rotting corpses every day. It wasn't as strong as the smell of a full corpse, thank God, since it was just a hand. But the smell still lingered in the background, reminding him every once in a while that there was a rotting human hand in his house. Young Shimura, I know I haven't been around much since I was busy at work, so I'm thinking maybe we can go out this weekend and have some fun together. You know, bond with each other a little. Have you ever heard of All Might Amusement Park? Funny name, I know. Tashinori chuckled. It makes me feel so proud of myself. Tenko didn't say anything. You see, last month I received an offer to participate in a stunt show at a MAP. I do that usually once every month. And according to schedule, I have some free time on my hand this Saturday, so I agreed to participate. What do you think? You wanna go? Still nothing. Tashinori sighed. I'm really sorry for lying to you and invading your privacy. I just wanted to know what that smell was. I really don't have any ill intentions. Please believe me. How about? No. A long silence passed before Tashinori decided to end the conversation. It was going nowhere. If, if you ever change your mind, I'll be leaving for a MAP at around 9 o'clock. So, if you want to go, just, 
be ready by then. With that said, Tashinori walked away from Tenko's room. He was trying his best to make this adoption work. And according to Reddit, taking your child to an amusement park was the best way to further a relationship. He could only hope Tenko would change his mind because the next step in his 10 ways to make your child feel special book was to kiss them on the cheek every night and Tashinori was more than certain that he would get his face disintegrated if he tried that. No matter what she did, she couldn't tune out Shadow's screams of pain. Hiding under her quilt with her pillow muffling her ears, Fayumi squeezed her eyes together and tried her best to ignore the screaming from the training room. Every night the entire Todoroki household would be forced to stay awake because Endeavor wanted to train Shadow past midnight. Her younger brother's training sessions were getting longer and longer and he was starting to sport dark shadows under his eyes from lack of sleep. Sometimes, he would even lose his balance when he walked, looking as if he was going to faint any second. Everyone was worried, except Endeavor. But no one could do anything. The last time someone talked back to Endeavor, they were slapped in the face so hard their cheek was swollen for a month. Endeavor was the dictator of the household. Everyone else was his pawns and had to cater to his every whim. No one could save Shadow from this monster. No one. Fayumi knew that. She knew she wouldn't be able to do anything. But that didn't stop her from getting off her bed and heading towards the screen. She had to take a look and make sure nothing too horrifying was going on. The darkness in the hallway together with Shadow's screams and Endeavor's growls gave her shivers. Fayumi tightened her hold on the hem of her pajamas and tensed up when she heard a particularly loud thud. When she reached the training room, she stayed by the door and peeked through the crack. Endeavor was holding Shadow up by his neck against the wall. Shadow was clawing at the vain throbbing hand and kicking around desperately. His mouth opened to a silent scream and his eyes rolling back. Fayumi gasped out loud, her entire body frozen and refusing to move. Move, she yelled in her mind. Move, Shadow's going to die. But she couldn't. The terror was like an invisible beast made of shadows, strangling her and weighing her down. Her heartbeat was pounding so fast she was sure Endeavor had heard, which explained why he had let go of Shadow and was now making his way over to the door. She had to run. She had to get away. Hundreds of muddled thoughts accelerated in her mind. Fayumi's vision swayed, her breathing becoming erratic. The door slammed open. Endeavor stormed out and glared down at her with those penetrating blue eyes. The pure dominating power in that single glare was enough to drain all her energy, making her collapse onto the ground. She stayed in that position, all the while maintaining eye contact with this man. Fayumi was wholeheartedly ready to be murdered when Endeavor turned and went to his room. She waited for his heavy footsteps to disappear before she rushed to Shadow's side. Even after she helped clean up his injuries and bandaged him up, that powerlessness inside her remained. She was so weak, she couldn't do anything but stand there and watch as her younger brother almost died. What kind of sister was she? A sister's job was to protect her siblings. Yet what did she do? She let that man walk all over them. This couldn't go on anymore. She had to be stronger, stronger than Endeavor so he could no longer bully their family. It was this day that Fayumi decided she was going to become a hero. Fayumi had a head of pure white hair when she was a baby. Her mother was delighted when she found out, but her father wasn't. The only interaction she had with him was an exchange of look when he passed by her crib. He had glanced at her with cold eyes void of all emotions except disappointment, like her birth was a mistake and she wasn't good enough for him. Taya was already born by the time she received her quirk. Endeavor wasn't around at the time. Perhaps he could foreseen what her quirk was. That was also when streaks of red magically appeared in her hair. The moment her mother realized what was happening, she immediately pulled her daughter into a room and warned her to never show her full quirk in front of Endeavor. Fayumi didn't understand what was going on. So, being the good girl she was, she heeded Ray's advice and registered her quirk as ice. A few years later, Natsuo was born around the same time Taya's fire quirk manifested. Her newest brother had a head full of white hair just like she was as a baby. As expected, his quirk turned out to be ice. It was only then when Fayumi realized what was going on. Her siblings' hair color matched their quirks, and that was how Endeavor was able to predict what quirk they would get. He was disappointed at them because they didn't match the criteria. Until Shadow came to existence, his hair color was split symmetrically down the middle, red to the left and white to the right. As expected, his quirk turned out to be half hot half cold, the exact quirk Endeavor was aiming for. There was no hiding it. It was too obvious what his quirk would be. The moment Endeavor set his eyes on Shadow, a maniacal grin split his face in half and his eyes glinted with glee. That was the beginning of Shadow's condemned life. Every time Fayumi saw him shuffling in the hallway with bruises littered all over his body and dried tear marks on his cheeks, she would feel a pang of guilt in her chest. Every time she bent down to hug him, she would notice their height difference and realize what a failure of a sister she was. She was so much taller than he was because she was a teenager who could, and should be able to, handle more than he could yet. She saw his suffering and did nothing. She was supposed to share his burden. 
Yet all she did was stay in her comfortable little circle and watch as her youngest sibling was tortured every single night by that monster like it was some comedic drama. She was reminded of her selfishness every day when she looked into the mirror, the glaring red streaks in her hair mocking her, taunting her, daring her to do something. She could have saved Shadow any time, but she was too afraid of herself receiving the same treatment that she never willed herself to do it. She wanted to become Shadow's hero, but did she really have the gut to do it? Blowing a strand of red hair away from her eyes, Fayumi double-checked herself in the mirror to make sure she looked good before leaving her room. When she passed by Endeavor's room, she opened the door a crack to take a look. Her father had already left for work it seemed. When she reached downstairs, her mom was preparing bentos and snacks for the trip. You're up so early, Fayumi. Ray gasped upon seeing her. It's my birthday after all. So, how did you sleep last night? Fayumi clenched her fists. A dark look flashed across her face before she relaxed her tensed body. Not bad, could be better. Ray smiled. I didn't have enough time to prepare so everyone's eating cereal this morning. She gestured towards the bentos she was packing with a laugh. Can you go wake up your siblings? Thanks, honey. Of course, mom. Getting everyone ready took another 30 minutes. Fayumi woke Natsuo up first since he took the longest. When he realized he was the first one been woken up, he went right back to sleep followed by it's not fair. Go wake Taoya Nai up first. Taoya was the easiest to wake up. Fayumi simply slipped an ice cube down his back and he jumped right out of his futon, landing on Natsuo with a cry. Two down, one to go. Fayumi rapped on Shadow's door with her knuckles, saying wake up, Shu chan as she welcomed herself in. To her surprise, Shadow's bed was already made and he was in the middle of getting dressed. Morning, Yumini chan, Shadow said as he finished fiddling with the last button on his collared shirt. And happy birthday, I have a gift for you. He knelt by his futon and pulled out a drawing from underneath it. I drew this for you. I hid it under the futon so no one would find out. I hope you like it. It was a colorful drawing of himself holding hands with Fayumi, Rei, Natsuo, and Taoya. A big smile on their faces as they sat on the purple grass under a green sky. Endeavor was nowhere to be seen. On the top were the words, Happy Birthday, Fayumi Nichan. I hope we can stay together forever. From, Todoroki Shadow, your brother. Fayumi accepted it with trembling hands. Her eyes flickered to the bandages around his fragile neck that hid the marks he received last night and she couldn't help but let out a choked sob. Nichan, I'm okay. Fayumi swallowed the bitterness clogging her throat and plastered a big smile onto her face, matching the one on her drawn counterpart. Come on, let's go downstairs. We're eating cereal for breakfast today. Hey, no soba. It took another 10 minutes to get everyone seated at the dining table. Stupid sis. Here, Taoya grumbled as he handed Fayumi a gift back. Fayumi was already used to Taoya calling her names. It was his way of showing that he cared. Inside the bag was a neatly wrapped square box. Fayumi peeled the wrappings off carefully. The box contained a necklace with a string of beads that read to my gullible stupid sister. The beads were all stuck together with hot glue. As if a certain someone didn't want her to get rid of the beads she didn't like or rearrange them. Happy birthday. Fayumi's lips twitched, but she still put on the necklace. Thank you, Taoya. Mom, Natsuo popped up from his chair. Can we get the cake now? No, honey, that's for dinner. Natsuo slammed his head onto the table. His cereal bowl tipped over, spinning once, twice, then settling back onto the spot. Unfortunately, Yumini, you'll have to wait till dinner to see your present then. That's fine. The longer I wait, the more anticipated I am. Isn't that great? Hell yeah. Natsuo ignored Ray's angry yell about his language and continued. Prepare yourself cause you'll see how my present is way better than Taoya eyes. Talk shit, get hit. Natsuo rounded on Taoya. What did you say? Boys, stop. Do we have to do this on your sister's birthday? Ray folded her arms, especially on a day when your father isn't home. At the mention of Endeavor, everyone quieted down. Let's just enjoy this day off, shall we? Be nice to each other. It's not often we get to have some family bonding time, so cherish this day. Fayumi glanced at Shouto, who was poking around the cereal and stringing the fruit loops onto his chopstick like a skewer. To say it wasn't often was a huge understatement. Fayumi had forgotten the last time she got to spend some time with Shouto, not seeing him in the morning or passing by him in the hallway, but actually going out and having fun with her youngest brother. Endeavor had done everything in his power to separate Shouto from the rest of his siblings, calling them a bad influence to him. Mom, Shouto began in a shy voice, his hands twirling the skewer of Fruit Loops nervously. What? What if father finds out? I think it's better if I don't go. Don't worry about that, Shu Chan. Ray grabbed his hands with a fond smile. I won't let him do that. You deserve some time off. Do you know what happens to a computer if you never turn it off? Shouto shook his head. It breaks. Ray patted his head. And I don't want that to happen to you. Mom is right. Fayumi cut in the conversation. She clasped her hands together and pouted. Plus, I want you to be around for my birthday. 
Can you grant me this wish, Shu Tan? Shouto chuckled, covering his mouth. Of course, I'll grant you any wish, Ni Chan. Now, now, stop talking and start eating. Ray stood up with her empty bowl and placed it in the sink. As she began washing the dishes with her back turned towards them, she scolded, Natsuo, stop throwing cereals at Taoya. Bah, I wasn't. And Taoya, don't pour your milk into your sister's glass. You're the one who needs to grow, not her. HMPH. In a few years I'll be taller than her. Fayumi poured his portion back into his glass with a smirk. And Shouto, if you're not going to grill your cereals, don't act like you will. Shouto slid the fruit loops off of the chopstick begrudgingly and began eating them one by one, very slowly. Fayumi glanced at the clock. An hour had passed since she woke up and her family was nowhere near ready to leave. At this rate, it'd be lunchtime when they arrived at All Might Amusement Park. As she was thinking, a fruit loop hit her cheeks. Natsuo, that wasn't me. That was Taoya Niai. The moment Izuku woke up today, he realized something was very wrong. Every morning, aside from creating a save file, he would check his profile habitually because of the one thing that would change daily. And that was the luck. His luck had never gone below a 5, which Izuku guessed was the average. A 5 meant a normal day and nothing particularly good or bad would happen. Yet, today when he checked his profile, luck, 4, the number glared at him as if it was daring him to partake on a venture to challenge its authority. Why does it have to be today of all days? Izuku groaned. Today was the day of the much-awaited field trip and the day Izuku planned on coming to a decision about his quirk. A week had passed since Izuku reached level 10 and he had done everything he could to decide on a quirk. He had an extensive talk with Inko, showing her his notes and ideas for each quirk. She had nodded along and offered her own thoughts, providing him suggestions but not forcing her ideas onto him. Ultimately, the choice was in his hand, and Izuku already had an idea on which quirk he wanted. Yet, the number next to luck was making him doubt his decision. Was it truly wise to pick a quirk on today of all days? How would his bad luck affect it? Izuku didn't know and had no way of knowing until he had gotten through the day. He would have to cross his fingers and wait for the day to end calmly and then choose a quirk by the end of it, hoping all the bad luck had passed. So far, everything went smoothly. Izuku woke up early and stuffed his magic backpack with snacks. Now that the bowl of cereal, bag of cat food, and bottle of milk were gone, he had three empty slots that could be filled with food and drinks for the trip. He kissed Inko on the cheeks as he waved goodbye at YHP. He gave the permission slip to Genji Sensei and got on the bus with all of his classmates. Happy to see that no one's parents were cruel enough to deny their child this trip, they arrived at All Might Amusement Park safely. No traffic accident or bus hijacking. Could he be overthinking it? Maybe luck. 4 was also within the average range. Izuku jumped out of his seat when a hand clasped his shoulder. What are you muttering about? Let's go. Everyone's off the bus already. Itoshi grabbed his arm and dragged him out of his seat none too gently. The rest of the kids had already formed a school circle around the teachers and the chaperones of this trip. The staffs that participated in this field trip were Genji Sensei, two other teachers from YHP of whom Izuku had seen a few times in the past two years, and seven pro heroes. Like the first time they met Eraserhead, the pro heroes weren't exceptionally popular. They were all middle-tiered pro heroes. They got to choose their own teams of four. Like always, Izuku stayed with Hitoshi, Yuuga and Manami. Everyone seemed perfectly fine with the decision, except Manami who couldn't stop fidgeting and staring at the ground. And when Izuku asked if she was okay, she merely nodded timidly and shied away. The pro hero assigned to their team was the female member of Water Hose Couple, with her husband being the chaperone of another team. Her individual hero name was Water Girl. The pro hero had shoulder-length brown hair and an unwavering, determined smile as she introduced herself to their team. You're on your own from now on. Meet back here with the rest of your team at 16.30. Make sure you stay with your team wherever you go and don't lose sight of any of them. If you need to go anywhere, tell the chaperone first, Genji Sensei was saying. Now, those of you who has been on a field trip with us should already know how the badges work. If this is your first time, then your chaperone will explain it to you. Free time starts now. Everyone rushed towards the end of the line at the entrance, waiting for their tickets and bags to be checked. As Izuku's team waited, the water girl asked, Does everyone know how to use the badges? Yeah. This isn't our first field trip. Can you explain it to me how it works then? Izuku took off his badge and flipped it so the back was facing his team members. The back of the small badge had a dial around the pin, a button to the left of the dial, a tiny dial on the top right, and two sections with tiny holes in them. So basically, the YHP badge is equipped with a tiny walkie-talkie on the back and can send out a signal to specific cell phones. Genji Sensei said the staff members' phones can be used to track down the badges so they'd know where we are if we went missing. Izuku pointed at the dial around the pin. You turn this to different dots and they'll connect you to different badges. I've already set the first dot to Toshi, second to Yuuga, and third to Minami-chan. I just need to set the fourth one to you. Very good. 
Water Girl clapped her hands. Go on. Izuku pointed at the section on top. This is the mic. You push this button to speak into it. And this bottom section is the speaker where the sound comes out. You can control the volume with this tiny dial. He then ran his finger along the top edge of the badge, stopping when he found a bump and pulling out the antenna. And this sends and receives signals. Good job. Wow, someone has been paying attention during class. Water Girl applauded making Izuku blush and scratch his head. She then took out her own badge and connected with everyone's. Is everyone good? All four gave her a thumbs up. Perfect. Water Girl spun around when the previous person in line went through the gate. And it's our turn, too. Just in time. Hello, greeted the employee by the table. May I see your bags please? Of course. Water Girl didn't carry a bag with her hero costume so she waited by the gate as Izuku and the others offered their bags to be checked. Izuku had taken out some snacks from his inventory and left them in his magic backpack so as to not rouse suspicion. When everyone had passed through the security check, Water Girl gave their tickets to the employee by the gate, who scanned it through a machine and let all of them pass. As each of them went through the turnstile, the employee gave them a card with square tiles on them. On top was the sentence, Gather all the stamps and you'll receive a mystery present when you leave. The back of the card was a picture of all the staff members and heroes taken in front of the main gate. Quest alert. Description. Collect all the stamps to get a mystery present. Time limit. None. Status. 0 divided by 10 collected. Reward. 500 EXP. Failure. None. Wow. Izuku breathed as he took in the courtyard with the souvenir shops and the concession stands. Everything was in bright happy colors, with most of them being red, blue, and yellow. The moving robotic trash cans even had the same markings as did All Might's costume, including the two strands of bangs that stood up on the lid. The smell of hot dogs and pretzel was in the air, making Izuku's stomach growl even though he had just eaten breakfast. Shadowing over them was the tracks for a roller coaster ride. The thick clanking of the ride passing over their heads, the shuddering of rails and tracks, and the screams of the passengers were extremely loud from their position underneath it. As everyone moved from the courtyard onto their first theme land, Princess Bubblegum's Candy Kingdom, they could now see people floating and bouncing around in giant pink bubbles and the huge candy castle from which children were climbing on top and eating out. Izuku let out a grin so wide his cheeks hurt. This was going to be fun. I'm really glad you decided to come with me. Tenko didn't respond and continued staring at the scenery outside the window as the car sped on the highway. His hands were clenching the plastic bag that contained his father's rotten hand inside his pocket. It was probably the world's stupidest idea to let a kid bring a rotten human hand to a place full of other people and attractions that turned the passengers upside down. If someone found out, the result wouldn't be just a simple scolding from the police and almost getting killed by Gran Torino. Toshinori knew that and he was fully prepared for the consequences. He was against the idea in the first place, too. But as if knowing Toshinori wasn't a good disputant, Tenko insisted he would only go if he could bring the hand with him. After a long dissension which ended with Toshinori's giving in, Tenko finally let out a smirk and did a victory dance, throwing the plastic bag high into the air and catching it. I know I've said this before, but I just want to say it again so you. I know I know. Tenko groaned, annoyed. Don't take out the hand. I get it. I'm not deaf. Tashinori gave a dry smile. Okay, just making sure. As they neared the entrance of a MAP, the side of the road started to have signs and banners and more and more cars were beginning to slow down the traffic. Driving in the left lane, Tashinori was never so glad he had ordered tinted window films a while ago which he used to hide his identity when driving. Tashinori followed the car in front of him until they reached the parking lot. He then turned the wheel to the left, taking the alternate route which was used for staff members only. There were no cars in this path. All the staffs were probably already at work. When they reached the security guard, Tashinori rolled down the window just enough to show his face and slipped his hero license through the gap. Hey All Might, it's been over a month since I last saw you. The security guard greeted cheerfully, lifting his cover and cocking his head sideways as he looked into the car. Is that your son? I didn't know you have a son. Haha, <laughs> yeah, I just recently. I'm not his son. Tenko interjected before Tashinori could say anything. The sudden interruption surprised both adults. The security guard stared at the two, expression frozen, while Toshinori wanted to bury his face into his muscles and hide away from the rest of the world forever. Screw the responsibility of the number one hero. Ooh well, I hope you'll have a good day. Toshinori accepted his hero license with an apologetic nod and drove away in a burst of engine. Neither of them spoke a word. Tenko continued to stare out the window while Toshinori drove through the staff entrance following the path that went around the entire amusement park. They drove past a Ferris wheel, then a three-story high haunted mansion, then a construction zone where they could hear multiple voices shouting at once. And finally, they reached a parking lot with about a dozen cars parked next to a building. We're here, Tashinori announced after he parked the car. 
He purposely didn't bring up what happened earlier. This is the manager's office. I need to talk to the CEO of a MAP real quick before I take you out to play. Are you okay with that? Whatever you do is none of my business. Tenko didn't even look at Tashinori as he spoke. He unbuckled the seatbelt and left the car, slamming the door. Tashinori stared at the closed door and shook his head, slouching slightly as he stared down at his hands. They were calloused hands covered in scars and cuts and visible veins with the capability to hold up buildings and carry ten people at once, but they couldn't provide comfort to the one person that mattered. Unbuckling his seatbelt and turning off the engine, Tashinori got off the car, locked it, and made his way towards the building. Tenko was staring at the colorful walls of the construction zone, which was right next to the building. The walls were designed like the layout of a manga panel, with nothing drawn in each panel. Young Shimura, do you want to come with me? Tashinori called out to the boy who merely ignored him, opening the door. Tashinori was greeted with a bespectacled man in his mid-thirties dressed in a fine tailored suit and pink, slicked back hair. Upon hearing the bells ring as the door swung open, the man turned around, immediately beaming as he caught sight of Tashinori. All might, my old friend. Finally you're here. How have you been? The man laughed jolly, rushing to shake Tashinori's hands. His hands were bony and hairless with long, agile fingers and well-manicured nails. Not bad, not bad. Tashinori laughed good-naturedly. Just the usual, you know. What about you? How's your park going? All good. Never better. You see that zone over there? The CEO dragged Tashinori to the window and pointed at the construction zone. We're adding a new hero theme land. Ever heard of Mangaka? Of course I have. He's the one who drew the most popular manga series currently ongoing. I'm a fan of his My Hero Aka. Yes, that's him. The CEO interrupted him. And guess what? He's also the hero mangaka who recently entered the top 10. His popularity instantly skyrocketed when the paparazzi revealed his alternate identity. It was all over the news. How did you not know? Tashinori responded the over-enthusiasm with a lukewarm reply. Well, I'm not as invested in celebrity gossip as you are, Hatsu. Anyway, Hatsum interrupted him again, turning back to look out the window with his hands clasped behind his back. We're working on creating his own theme park and hoping to open within a year. Mangaka's quirk is perfect for a theme park. Since his blood consists of a special ink that can make anything drawn with it come to life, we've created markers. But wouldn't that hurt him? No, no. Hatsum wigged his index finger, winking. This man suffers no pain when he bleeds. Plus, he can replenish his blood any time by drinking normal ink. We've already talked this over with him and he has agreed to donate his blood for us to create markers. We're thinking of giving a marker to every visitor entering his theme land so they can draw using that special ink and see their drawings come to life. Isn't that a great idea? The kids will love it. That does sound interesting. Tashinori murmured, rubbing his chin in contemplation. Maybe I can get young Shimura to try it and he might even like me after. Anyway, Tatsum clapped his back, barely moving him an inch. Let me introduce you to the stunt actors who will work with you today. Come on in, guys. A door on the opposite side of the room swung open and in walked about 20 people dressed in civilian attire. None of them showed surprise upon seeing the number one hero. One of them, a teenage boy, went up to Tashinori and held out a hand as he grinned with recognition in his eyes. It's been a while, all might. Remember me. I worked with you last month. Of course I do. Tashinori accepted the handshake with his signature smile. You're the one who kidnapped Princess Bubblegum and tried to feed her to the dragons and ultimately got defeated by me. The boy smiled sheepishly. Yeah, that's me. The rest of the stunt actors followed suit and greeted Tashinori, shaking his hand. When he reached the last person, Hatsum explained. Ah, this is our new addition. Rentakun called in sick yesterday so we had to find a replacement for him. Surprisingly, he's able to memorize all the lines and learn the moves within a day. Really, that's amazing. Tashinori went up to the last person and held out his hand for a handshake. It's nice to meet you. I'm all might. The large, bulky man with short, spiky blonde hair accepted the handshake with a toothy grin. His handshake was firm and never had Tashinori met anyone with such a heavy grip. Nice to meet you all might. I will be acting as the villain boss in this show. Please call me muscular. The gondola where he resided was empty. The sludge poked his head out from under the seat and peeked out of the window. The gondola had reached the top of the ferris wheel and he could get an entire view of the amusement park from this position. He had been spying on the passengers for over an hour now and so far he hadn't come across any individuals with interesting, powerful quirks. He wasn't worried, however, since he still had about two more hours until All Might would make an appearance. He just had to find a powerful host to take over and use their quirk to wreak havoc. All Might wouldn't be able to save anyone since he'd be occupied with fighting muscular. When the other heroes arrived, they would focus on limiting the casualties and dealing with the aftermath of his destruction instead of supporting All Might. By the time he had completed his reign of terror, Muscular would have done a good deal of damage on All Might already. Then, it would be his time to shine and kill All Might once and for all. 
No one messed with his money and got away alive. Look at sir. He refused to pay the sludge. And what happened to him now? He was dead. Dead. Huh. The sludge was so close to getting his money. So close. Just two more days. And yet, his money ran away. Because of that goddamned all might. But today. Today. The hero would meet his demise. Today. The sludge would get his money. Tenko was starting to regret not following all might into that building. It was hot outside. He was bored. The grating noise from the construction zone was annoying. And there was nowhere to sit. But he couldn't give in to his desire. There was nothing to compete over. But Tenko still felt like if he went to that building now, he'd lose. He knew it was just his stubbornness making this harder for him. But he was the one who made the choice in the first place. To turn back and go against his words would be humiliating. And Tenko didn't feel like being laughed at by All Might today. Hey kid, whatcha doing here? A man waved at him from the entrance to the construction zone. He had light brown hair and was dressed in clean, casual clothes, unlike the other construction workers around him. When Tenko shrugged, the man passed the clipboard he was holding to a worker next to him and jogged over. Why are you here alone? Where are your parents? Tenko bit his lips and hesitated before speaking. He's in that building. Oh, and he left you out here all by yourself. What an awful father. You think so, too? Tenko exclaimed, jumping onto the chance to badmouth All Might. He's truly horrible. The man laughed. You're a funny kid, huh? I'm Yuraka Jurioku. What's your name? Shimura Tenko. Pleasure to meet you, Tenko-kun. Yuraka took out a marker from his trouser pocket and handed it to Tenko. You must be bored waiting out here all by yourself. Here, take this. Tenko accepted it meekly. What is this? It's a magical marker. Magical. Marker. Try drawing on this wall. Yuraka pointed at the wall that surrounded the construction zone. There are blank manga panels covering the entirety of the wall. And something magical will happen. Tenko gulped, his hand tightening around the marker, pushed by curiosity. He uncapped the marker and drew a sloppy stick figure onto the wall. Ah! Uh, he yelped when the stick figure peeled off of the wall and stood in the air with its feet. It circled around Tenko, did a somersault, and returned to the wall. How, how did? Cool, isn't it? Yuraka grinned, his eyes crinkling in delight. You can keep that marker. It contains a special ink that can make anything drawn with it come to life. It doesn't matter what surface you draw it on. Thank you. Yuraka ruffled his hair. I'm going back to work. I will be here until this afternoon so just call out my name if you needed anything. Tenko stared after Yuraka as he ran back to the construction zone. A ghostly sensation of the touch lingered on his hair and Tenko touched the spot briefly, musing what it'd be like to have that man as his father. He quickly slapped his cheeks to get rid of the thoughts, though. While waiting for All Might to come back out, Tenko drew a dog, or rather, a strange four-legged creature that he called a dog. The being fell out of the wall and pranced around him, wagging its tail happily and licking his hand with an inkai tongue, leaving a trail of ink in its wake. When it returned to the wall, the ink stain also disappeared. Tenko then drew a few more things, a soccer ball, a banana, a phone, a skateboard and a bottle of water. By the time Tenko had filled the entire wall with his doodlings and was in the middle of drawing an elephant on the other end of the wall, All Might left the building, chatting animatedly with a pink-haired man. The hero was followed by a group of people, including a man with short blonde hair who smiled at Tenko when he passed, but somehow the smile didn't quite reach his eyes. When All Might saw Tenko, he explained how he had to do a rehearsal for the stunt show and how he would try to be back as soon as possible. Tenko didn't even bother telling All Might how he was soaked with sweat in this sweltering heat, or how he noticed the rotten smell emitting from the hand in his pocket for the first time, or how he had already drank three bottles of water and he still felt thirsty or how his lungs felt as if they were on fire with every breath he took. No, he didn't bother telling the man any of that. He simply nodded and went back to his art. There was no point. He wasn't important after all. Have some fun together my ass. Tenko glowered. The number one hero has better things to do than spend time with some orphan. That was awesome. Natsuo jumped in excitement upon getting off the boat. Shouto quickly hid behind his sister to avoid getting water all over him. Natsuo, take off your poncho before jumping around. Fayumi held him down and wrestled the poncho off of him. Only then did Shouto dare to step out of Fayumi's protection. They had just gotten off the water coaster and collected their sixth stamp. The final drop turned everyone's stomach upside down, and no one felt like eating anything for the next few hours. Shouto had never been to an amusement park before so he was relatively new to this experience. He didn't like the feeling in his stomach but he did enjoy the way his heart skipped a beat when they dropped from 30 feet high into a pool of water, splashing water all over their prepared ponchos. When he was in the air, he felt a sense of freedom and liveliness he had never felt before in his life. His days had always been training, training, and more training. Never had he gotten a chance to see how small people looked when he was 30 feet in the air, 
or how reachable the sky seemed when they were climbing up the tracks. Today, he felt like he could forget about training and endeavor and the responsibility as his father's masterpiece. Today, Shouto could be Shouto. Guys, let's go check out that haunted mansion. Natsuo suggested after Rei had packed all the ponchos away. Does it have ghosts? Shouto asked, grabbing Fayumi's hands tightly. No, but it has something even scarier. Natsuo leaned up close and pulled a scary face. A serial killer who, according to rumors, has made even All Might scream in fright. Rei smacked him lightly on the head with a fond smile. Stop scaring Shouto. What kind of brother are you? Awa. Natsuo groaned. Aw oh, fine. It's not much of a haunted house, per se, more like an escape room. What's that? Taoya looked a little pale, probably still affected by the ride. It's the kind of games where you're trapped in a room and have to find a way out. That haunted mansion is called the House of Doom. You start the game locked in a room with a flashlight almost drained of battery. You have to find a way out of the room and escape the mansion while looking for spare batteries scattered around and avoiding the serial killer. It's not as hard as it sounds, and not that scary either. Fayumi reassured, last time we went there, the staff who acted as the serial killer wasn't even as tall as I am. And he was super skinny, too, like he could fall in one push. Plus, I've memorized the route to the exit so don't worry about getting lost. Last time we went there, so this wasn't their first time coming here. Shouto stared down at his toes, suddenly realizing how different he was from his siblings. Endeavor was right. His siblings were a part of a totally different world. A tight circle with no room for him. Could he ever squeeze into their relationship? Was there even a spot for him in the first place? Then what are we waiting for? Let's go. Natsuo urged on. And the Todoroki family started making their way over to the next attraction. Dot 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 only to be greeted with a height requirement stand by the entrance. This wasn't here last time we came, complained Natsuo as he kicked the sign. A worker hurried over when she saw him abusing the sign. This is a new regulation enforced this year, she explained. Last year we had a boy who embarrassed himself after receiving too much shock in this attraction. His family was so furious they made us choose between enforcing this regulation or seeing them in court. And in the end, this is what the CEO decided. As she spoke, Shouto went up and stood with his back against the sign, placing a hand flat on the top of his head and shifting it back until it hit the board. He then stepped away to see his hand placement. It was an inch below the line. I'm very sorry but we cannot let you enter this attraction without meeting the requirement. The worker bowed and apologized even though it wasn't her fault. It's fine, Shouto said. He really was fine with it. He didn't like ghosts or scary stuff in the first place. Oh, but I wanna go. Natsuo stomped his feet. Taoya kept staring at the mansion as well, obviously interested. How about this? I'll stay with Shouto and find something fun to do, Fayumi suggested. While you three go to this haunted house, we can keep in contact via phone. Are you sure you two will be okay? Ray asked, uncertainty visible in her eyes. Yes, mom, I can handle him. Don't worry. Ray was still worried but she eventually agreed after a long annoying pestering session from Natsuo and Taoya. Fayumi and Shouto stood by the entrance and watched as the other three members of their family entered the huge door with two roaring lion heads as the door knobs. When the heavy door slammed shut, rattling on follow-through, Fayumi turned to Shouto. Let's go somewhere fun. Okay, Shouto thought about heading towards the next station on the stamp card, but decided against it when he took others' feelings into consideration. If he was in their shoes, he wouldn't want to be left behind. He wanted to collect all the stamps with everyone and get the mystery present together. He wanted to share the joy, not hog it all to himself. Yumini-chan, Shouto called out as he squeezed Fayumi's hand to get her attention. Let's go to the Ferris wheel. Sure, I love Ferris wheels. Before they head out in the direction of the Ferris wheel, they turn left towards the construction zone and purchase two ice cream cones at the vendor nearby. Walking to the Ferris wheel would take about 15 minutes so it was a good idea to have something to do while they walk. Shouto was amazed at the variety of flavors he could choose from. The only ice cream he had ever tried were the ones Ray bought back from the food stores, and they were always either vanilla or strawberry flavors because his family loved these. He didn't know charcoal ice cream existed, or lobster ice cream, or Cheetos ice cream. In the end, Shouto decided to give charcoal ice cream a try. PFF a farting sound came from his sister. Fayumi was giggling uncontrollably. Her entire body shaking with laughter that seeped through the hand covering her mouth. You, you need to look at your face, Shu Chan. Fayumi held up her phone with a shaky hand. The camera app was pulled up and it was set to selfie mode. Shouto grabbed the phone from his sister. Her hand was shaking so much he couldn't see a thing. He looked into the camera and gasped. My mouth, my teeth. He cried. It's all black. Fayumi was still laughing clenching her stomach and bending over, pouting. Shouto spooned a scoop and rubbed it onto her face. Hey, Shouto dashed off in the direction of the Ferris wheel with an angry Fayumi on his heels. An eight-year-old obviously couldn't outrun a teenager. Soon, he was caught by his sister who dumped the rest of the ice cream all over his face. 
It's all your fault. Shouto grumbled when he stepped out of the restroom. His hair was slightly wet and messed up after washing his face. Sorry. Fayumi grimaced as she reached out to fix his hair. Let's just go to the Ferris wheel before the others are done and want to meet up. All right. Shouto took a step back, and another, then another. It's huge. He marveled. I know right. The Ferris wheel didn't look that big from a distance. But when Shouto stood directly under it, he could then recognize the spinning monstrosity that was the Ferris wheel. The contraption was so huge he couldn't even capture its entirety in his vision. Seeing how it loomed over him blocking the sun with its overwhelming height made Shouto slightly afraid of riding it. Come on, don't be scared. Fayumi urged him when it was their turn. I promise it'll be fun. Shouto gripped his sister's hand tightly as they entered their gondola. They sat on the same side. The door clicked shut, and they began ascending. Shouto squeezed his eyes shut until Fayumi patted him gently on the back. We're almost at the top. Take a look. It's beautiful. Shouto opened one eye, then the other as he took in the view. Wow, beautiful, isn't it? Their gondola was about a quarter way up. They hadn't reached the peak yet, but Shouto could already see why Fayumi encouraged him to give this a try. Being so, so high up in the sky, he could see all the rides and the scale of this entire park. He could even see the prominent skyscrapers far away into the city. Seeing all the tiny people gawking at them from below gave Shouto a sense of pride and accomplishment. He felt powerful being above everyone else. They were so small he felt like he could crush them with a pinky. No one could belittle him anymore. No one could step on him and call him a failure anymore. Because up here, he was the biggest of them all. I like this feeling. Shouto admitted, father can't reach me up here. Here, I'm truly free. Here, I can be myself. He looked up when he felt a touch on his head. Fayumi was smiling at him softly while running her fingers through his hair. At this exact moment, the sun shone through the window, hitting her in the back and basking her in its rays. Her form glowed, her white hair becoming almost transparent as sunlight seeped through the strands. For a second, Shouto wondered if this was what angels looked like. In the next second, the world turned dark. Disgusting wetness shrouded his body and something slimy pushed against his lips. Shouto pursed his lips as tight as possible, but he was forced to open up letting a slimy thing slither down his throat when something wrapped around his neck, choking the air out of him. He tried to breathe through his nose, but his nostrils were soon filled with the slime as well. He couldn't see. He couldn't breathe. His head started to spin as the pressure in his lungs increased. Shouto clawed at the slime surrounding him desperately. He tried using his quirk, but his fire was smothered by the slime and his ice wasn't strong enough to break through the slime. Endeavor was right. Shouto was too weak. For the first time in his life, he wished he had worked harder during training sessions. If he was as strong as his father, he wouldn't be in this situation right now. Shouto, light pierced through the darkness as shards of ice ripped through the slime clouding his face, striking the window behind him and shattering it. Shouto took the chance to wiggle his mouth free from the restraint but he only had the time to take one breath before the slime shoved itself down his throat once more. Get away from him, villain. Fayumi shouted as she blasted shards at it, each piece avoiding Shouto and hitting the slime coating his form with precision. Never would I expect to meet the number two hero, Endeavor's kids on today of all days. It's just my luck. The villain that was suffocating him tightened its choked hold on his neck. Shouto frantically grabbed and kicked at the slime to no avail. Tears formed in the corners of his eyes as his face went numb and his head felt like it was about to explode. He tried to scream for help, but he couldn't get any air out. Be thankful of your parents that you didn't get your father's quirk. The villain sneered at Fayumi. Because otherwise, I would have to take over your body. The voice was growing faint. Shouto's vision went dark. He didn't know what was going on around him. But one thing he did know was that his left side was burning up like never before. The intensity of the flame that poured out of his body was too strong for him to handle, just like Endeavor's flame whenever he was assaulted by it. Shouto could feel himself overheating and he desperately wanted to use his ice side to cool down but the slime was rendering him incapable of doing anything. Before Shouto could think of anything else, he heard a huge explosion that seemed to happen right next to his ears and the next thing he knew, his body started falling down the sky at an alarming rate. Plus one. You have reached level 5 in pistol marksmanship. Level 5 upgrade 50% chance to get a plus 25% accuracy boost on every shot unlocked. Bang, bang, bang. Izuku let out a sigh of relief as his grip slackened against the pistol. The crowd who had been watching him level up his marksmanship for the past 20 minutes erupted into cheers. Wow, you did it, Hitoshi observed, clapping along with everyone else. But how much did you spend? Izuku accepted the highest level of prize from the owner of this carnival game and presented it to Hitoshi. The newest Android phone currently on the market. The market price is 100,000 yen. And I got it for 20,000 yen. Oh, good for you. Must be nice to have a phone when most of your friends don't, Hitoshi said sourly. Hey I didn't mean to. Relax, I'm just joking. Hitoshi bumped him on the shoulders, chuckling. Come on, let's see how the others are faring. 
While Izuku took his sweet time killing paper targets, the rest of his team except Hitoshi had gone to the next booth over to watch others get a taste of defeat. Water Girl was watching a couple kids attempting to throw ninja stars that looked like the ones used by Edshot at balloons attached to a sticky wall while Yuuga and Minami were having what seemed to be a serious conversation beside her. Sorry for the wait. Izuku scratched his cheeks with a sheepish smile. But I finally got what I wanted. Water Girl turned towards Izuku and gasped at the phone he was holding. You actually got it. Her expression suddenly turned into that of a stern mother. How much did you spend, though? Not too much. Izuku quickly shook his head and waved his hands around. Only about 20,000 yen. And considering this phone costs 100,000 yen, it's a win for me. Water Girl placed a hand on her forehead as she shook her head. I'm not even going to ask where you got your 20,000 yen. Today was her first day volunteering at YHP so obviously she didn't know about Izuku's part-time job as the sweet spender. Anyway, the stunt show starts in 10 minutes. Is everyone ready to go? Water Girl asked around. Izuku and Hitoshi nodded while Yuuga and Minami jogged over to them. What were you two talking about? Izuku asked when they neared. Secret. Yuuga placed a finger against his lips and said with a mysterious smile. Secret. Huh. Hitoshi wiggled his eyebrows as if hinting at something. As for what that something was, Izuku had no idea. His friends were always talking about stuff he didn't understand. Sometimes he did feel a little excluded, like they were all in onto a secret except him, but on the other hand, he was also keeping a secret from them, a big secret, in fact, so they were even, he guessed. Many people were already there by the time they arrived. The crowd murmuring excitedly below the stage thronged the area. There were security personnel directing traffic, waving their wands around and guiding people off the road and towards the side of the stage. Izuku's group was led to the left side of the stage. In front of them was a thick wall of people. Even Hitoshi, the tallest amongst their little group, aside from Water Girl, couldn't see past the swarm even as he tiptoed and jumped. It's hot, Yuuga declared with a strained smile. Must be the passion. Izuku grinned as he wiped a drop of sweat off of his forehead. Everyone's heated excitement is leaking out and affecting the others. It's contagious. I can literally feel it drifting all around me. Yuuga watched as Izuku swung his arm around feeling the air as he said, I think I'm infected as well. Right. But still, it's hot. I really want some ice cream. Do you have some in your magic backpack? I do. But why don't you try the ones from that ice cream truck over there? They have all kinds of flavors. Yuuga squinted at the direction Izuku was pointing. I don't see anything. Izuku glanced at his All Might watch. We have a few minutes before the show starts. We can make it. He grabbed Yuuga's hand and was about to lead him away from the crowd when more people sandwiched them from behind, pushing and shoving, hoping to get as close to the stage as possible. In the midst of the disturbance, Izuku lost his grip on Yuuga's hand and was knocked around by the spectators. He lost track of his team and could only scream out I'll be back soon before he tumbled out from the back of the crowd. As he made his way towards the ice cream truck, Izuku took out the phone he won earlier and cast an observe on the object. Plus one. Name, Sharp L2 Android. Owner, Midoriya Izuku. Durability, 20 over 20. Worth, 100,000 yen. Description, the newest release of the Sharp Android series. It's fully functional underwater up to 500 meters and its shock resistance is 20 meters. To be quite honest, Izuku had half a mind to sell it to the bazaar and use the money to play that game and earn more phones. That was a multi-million business idea right there. Before he could dwell on that fantasy, another alert popped up. An integratable object has been detected. Would you like to integrate this? Gola, Izuku called in his mind. What does it mean by integrate? Gola's voice responded in his head immediately. Some technologies can be integrated into the Game of Life system. If you integrated this phone, you'd be able to access all functions by using Game of Life. Does that mean I can make phone calls and watch movies and play games using digitalization? I mean, like having an invisible screen in front of me showcasing my phone screen. That's correct. That would certainly bring endless possibilities. For example, if he were kidnapped by villains and got his phone taken away, he could just use digitalization to call for help without the villains noticing. Izuku had to put his conversation with Gola on hold when he arrived at the ice cream truck. The huge menu poster decorating the truck had more than 40 ice cream flavors. He couldn't even read all of their names in 5 minutes let alone trying all of their flavors, which was why Izuku had made it a personal goal to taste test all 40 ice cream flavors. He even had an ongoing quest for this with an unlimited time limit. So far, he had only gone through eight. Browsing through the choices, Izuku got himself a squid ink ice cream and Yuuga a blue cheese caramel swirl. He wasn't sure what a cheese-flavored ice cream cone would taste like, but he was sure that Yuuga would want to find out himself. And that's all, thanks. Izuku passed the correct amount of coins to the old man working inside. He almost dropped the coins when the next alert popped up. Your luck has changed to three due to a decision you've just made. Excuse me, what? Do you want to buy it or not? 
The old man grasped, eyeing the coins Izuku was still holding on to. Uh, oh uh, yes, I'm sorry. Izuku quickly passed the coins to the old man and moved out of the way. What's going on? He thought to Gola as soon as he was out of sight. Your luck can change based on the different decisions you. I know that. But, I mean, what, I don't understand. Why is it going down? I only bought some ice cream. Why is that affecting my luck? Master, Izuku could almost see Gola shaking its circular head right now. Silla you never know what will happen. Tiny changes can make big differences. Have you heard of the butterfly effect? No, what's that? In simpler terms, it basically means a simple movement like a butterfly flapping its wings can give rise to a tornado somewhere else. You never know how killing an ant when you're five might lead to someone holding a grudge and trying to murder you 30 years later. That makes no sense at all. I agree, master. Nothing ever makes sense. Just like how you haven't heard the old man calling you for the past few minutes is beyond me. Izuku turned around. Indeed, the old man was holding both of his ice cream cones with a murderous look on his face. Izuku gulped. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Izuku thought as he scuttled over to the truck, almost tripping over his feet in his haste. The old man didn't say anything, merely glaring at him as the ice cream dripped onto his gloved hands. I'm so, so sorry. Izuku apologized, bowing frantically as he accepted his ice cream cones. Your luck has changed to due to a decision you've just made. Gola, panic-stricken, Izuku shouted out the name as the ice cream cones slipped out of his grasp. He completely ignored the baffled look on the old man's face as he begged, Please tell me what's going on. Master, I told you, it's just, please. Izuku was suddenly all the more aware of the sweat clinging to his skin, the throbbing in his eyes, and the thumping of his heart against his chest. His breathing quickened to an unnatural pace and Izuku knew he was about to have a panic attack. He curled his hands into fists, nails digging painfully into his palms as he gritted out, I don't want to die. Death is a part of life, master. You can't escape death. I don't want to hear that right now. Followed by his cry was a loud explosion that turned all the heads in the proximity towards the ferris wheel. Silence swept over the area as the ferocious attraction dislodged from its stand and crashed onto the ground. Fire skirted it, causing mechanisms to explode and setting gondolas aflame. Some of the passengers who were caught on fire jumped out of the window in panic, while others plummeted into the ground as their gondolas fell from their support, landing in the carnival game area down below and spreading fire throughout the booths. The silence lasted for a minute until everyone came to their senses and began screaming and scampering around like headless chickens. It was like the quirky lake incident all over again. People screamed, cursed, stumbled into each other. Some took out their phone and started videotaping the incident. A couple children stood alone in the middle of the street, crying, as people navigated around them. No one stopped to help them and lead them to the safe zone. Food and drinks were spilled, causing the unfortunate ones to slip and fall against one another like dominoes. The ferris wheel was directly in line with Izuku and the ice cream truck. Due to the slight slope on the road, it began rolling down towards them. Izuku couldn't even hear his own rapid breathing above all the screaming. All he could focus on was the 300 feet tall monstrosity that was speeding towards where he was standing. His mind was filled with only one objective, to stay alive. He couldn't die. Not just yet. Not after everything that had happened. Izuku was so close to getting a quirk and becoming a hero. He couldn't die. He was Gentle's first fan and he needed to keep up the promise. He couldn't die. His mom needed him. He couldn't die. You can always use the four-leaf clover you friend gave you. Gola's voice reminded him in his mind. Right, he still had the four-leaf clover Namamano gave him that could provide a luck plus four boost. Izuku hesitated, then took a trembling step back. No, I won't use it, because I'm not going to die. Legs still shaking, Izuku took another step, then another, and then he was full on sprinting away from the ferris wheel. He had never ran so fast in his life, not away from Kakin, not from anybody. Izuku dared a glance back. The ferris wheel rolled past where he stood earlier and crashed into the construction zone. He did it. He was safe. Your luck has changed to one due to a decision you've just made. Move out of my fucking way. That was the only warning Izuku received before something rammed into him from behind. He heard an audible crack as his entire world twisted and turned and swirled. He felt weightless, like he was flying in the air. A hot burning sensation spread throughout his back. The excruciating pain numbed his senses, making it hard to wrap his mind around what had just happened. And then he caught a flash of the colorful ice cream menu before he slammed into the hard, concrete ground. All the bones in his body shattering into thousands of splinters. Crunch. I I Z U K U. Water Girl had been a hero for over seven years. She may not be one of those high-tier heroes, but she still knew her jobs very well and had enough experience to react in the nick of time during critical situations. So when the first explosion hit the ferris wheel, while the rest of the crowd was stunned, she immediately located the kids, grabbed them, and ushered them off to the side of the street to avoid being trampled by the panicking crowd. Is everyone okay? Her throat clenched shut when she looked over them. Yellow, purple, where's green and red? 
Have you two seen Izuku Kun and Manami Chan? The Uger raised his hand hesitantly, like he was in class and he was unsure of his answer to a question. Izuku went to buy some ice cream. The ground rumbled as the Ferris wheel dislodged from its stand and rolled down the street, and Manami chased after him. Heading straight for the ice cream truck at the other end of the street, the one that had always been there since Water Girl was a little girl. The entire world seemed to have silenced itself as the wheel wriggled down the street like a predator destroying everything that stood in its way. Water Girl swallowed thickly as she stumbled after the wheel. Please let me make it in time. Izuku's mind was completely blank as he hit the ground. Everything happened so fast. Not giving him any time to react and prepare himself. Title has been unlocked. More information can be found on the titles. Achievements page. Title has been unlocked. More information can be found on the titles. Achievements page. When he came to, he was staring at his own mangled corpse as a distraught Manami vomited nearby upon seeing it. Manami Chan. Izuku murmured as he reached out towards her reflexively. She didn't react. Izuku looked down at his hand. It was transparent. He could even see the ground through his hand. He then looked at the rest of his body. It was the same, transparent and weightless, his feet floating off of the ground. Game over. The world around him exploded into thousands of broken shards that sprinkled down on him like a shower of sparkles, revealing the complete darkness that shrouded him. Words blasted in a splash of blood in the space before him. It wasn't until now that reality finally sank in. Ah, uh, Izuku realized. I'm dead. You have chosen the path, hero. Here are your ratings according to this path. Emotional support for Tabaita, plus 100 points. Manami, plus 100 points. Hitoshi, plus 100 points. Defeating all for one, plus 10,000 points. People you've helped, plus 1,000 points. Precious people lost, 10,000 points. Total, 1,400 points. With every rating, his surroundings shifted into the corresponding memory, playing until his accomplishment and then cutting to the next one. When the precious people rating came up, the scenery shifted into a collapsed house with a green, slime-like monster and the familiar suited figure of all for one leaving its remains. Through a crack in the debris, Izuku could see the crushed head of Shimura Sensei. Her jaw was completely detached from her face, leaving the entire upper row of her teeth visible. Her eyes were wide with terror, the only emotion remaining in those otherwise blank stares. Stomach churning with the urge to vomit, Izuku bent over and hacked, but he couldn't get anything out. Fear, disgust, and remorse hit him all at once. His eyes stung, but the familiar, hot tears refused to spill. Izuku clawed at his eyes but his hands only passed through the mist that made up his body. He screamed, screamed, and screamed until his throat was so raw all that came out was a weak cry. He had failed, utterly and undeniably. His teacher was murdered by All for One and he didn't even know. He even hesitated when he received the quest to kill All for One, a chance to avenge for her. He could have done better. He should have done better. He should have realized that something was amiss when Genji Sensei hesitated before he spoke about Shimura Sensei's quitting the job. He should have done something. Gola, Izuku croaked out. I'm here, responded the circular metallic cyclops as it popped into existence. Izuku had never found its monotonous voice so comforting before. If I was to choose a save file before Shimura Sensei's death to go back to, would I still be able to access all my future save files if I die again? No, once you select a save file before your current time slot, all save files made after that will be deleted. Izuku murmured, oh. A few seconds of silence later, goal aside. I wouldn't recommend going back to fix her death. Because 1. You haven't reached level 10 at the time so you don't have a quirk. And 2. You have seen what All for One was capable of. He needed All Might to defeat. Do you really think you're able to save Shimura Sensei when the criminal mastermind himself was targeting her? Izuku shrugged. He knew the answer, but he just didn't want to admit. Master, you can't save everyone. That's what heroes are for. There's not one hero saving everyone, but multiple heroes because one person can't save everyone. Sometimes, you just have to let it go. Biba, Master, if you had the capability and opportunity to save her, I would have definitely encouraged you to go back and do so. But you do not. The best course of action right now is to use this failure as fuels for you to do better next time. In other words, he was too weak. If only he had a quirk. Izuku jerked up and slapped his forehead, his hand passing through. He was so stupid. He should have chosen teleportation. That way, he could have avoided the truck and Izuku shuddered as the feeling of all his bones breaking down like a collapsed puppet and the truck running over crushing his body against the pavement returned to him. He knew it was just a phantom pain, but it felt so real. He could accurately recall the way his flesh and bones ground against the pavement after his entire body was almost flattened by the truck. You're right, Gola. I'll do better next time, Izuku said in a determined voice. I won't let my precious people die again if I can help it. I won't die again either. I'll have a quirk. I won't die. A sentence appeared word by word at the bottom of his ratings. Would you like to exchange 1000 points for a chance to spin the wheel of fate? 
Sure, the screen with the ratings shifted to the side as a wheel of fate took over. The choices on it were so small there was at least a thousand on there, with most of them being a red slot with the words try again next time. Before Izuku even had to ask, Gola explained, spin the wheel of fate for a chance to win anything in the bazaar. The more an object costs, the lower the probability. Izuku wasn't hoping for anything in particular when he spun the wheel. He just wanted to hurry up and leave this space. It was too quiet and cold and empty it made him feel uncomfortable. It didn't surprise him when the pin stopped at a red slot, considering the red slots took up more than half of the entire wheel. The wheel vanished as another screen took over. Titles, achievements, the lover, activation requirements, charm someone, quirk, charm, anyone who sees your face will fall in love with you and do anything you want, won't affect those already in love with you. The protagonist, activation requirements, die once, quirk, regeneration, all injuries heal instantly. In other words, you're immortal and won't ever die or be able to go back to another save point and choose another title. Less miserables, activation requirements, reach luck one. Quirk, misfortune, curse anyone with misfortune. Last 24 hours, one person at a time, can't take back the curse once you've cast it. Next to each title was a selection choice. Izuku supposed this was where he could choose a title and its accompanying quirk before he choose a save file to go back to. The lover was definitely out of the questions. Making people fall in love with him wouldn't help him in this situation. The protagonist also wasn't a valid option. Being immortal may help him survive the ice cream truck accident, but that also meant he would never die. And if he never die, then he couldn't go back and fix his mistakes. And that was a huge no-no. Less miserables, whatever that meant, wouldn't work either. He was already unfortunate. Making others unlucky wasn't going to make him lucky. Maybe he'd choose a title in the future when he had more to choose from. But for now, Izuku was skipping this page. The next screen showed the list of save files that had been created or auto-generated after quests and achievements. The newest one was created automatically right after he completed the failure to stop quest where he got his phone. Selecting the most recent save file, Izuku faced an alert. Are you sure you want to choose the selected save file? Izuku chose yes. The screen vanished along with Gola. The darkness that surrounded him started having smatters of colors sprinkled here and there. The colors danced around him, connecting and mixing with each other until they gradually began to form the view of the carnival game booths and the giant ferris wheel nearby. Sound of people chattering. Birds screeching, wind breezing by, and roller coaster thundering across the tracks began to fill in the background, making the world more real. When the painting process was complete, a quest alert popped up. Quest alert. Description. Stay alive for 2 hours starting now. Time limit. 1 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Reward. 20,000 EXP, 1 attribute points. Failure. Try again during your next revive. Izuku accepted the quest and pulled up the quirk selection screen, choosing teleportation. Izuku. Izuku. Huh. Wa. What? Who's talking? Izuku jumped, quickly turning to the source of the voice. Me, of course. Who do you think? Itoshi grumbled, crossing his arms and nudging his lips at something to his right. You might want to take that before he changed his mind. To his right was the owner of the shooting booth holding Izuku's prized phone with a strained smile. It was the type of smile Kakin loved to wear before he punched Izuku in the face. It reminded Izuku strongly of the face the ice cream vendor had before he ran him over with the truck. He quickly took the phone and apologized. You okay? Itoshi asked him in concern as they made their way over to the others in the next booth. Yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry. Izuku flashed a smile hoping to reassure him. Just remembered something I forgot to do. Well, whatever that is can wait. We're at MAP now so let's enjoy it while we can. Yeah, Izuku whispered. While we can. Izuku tried acting normal as they met up with Water Girl, Yuuga, and Manami. He forced a smile onto his face as he listened to his friends chatter on their way towards the stage for the stunt show. He wanted to believe that everything was going to be fine. After all, he had a quirk now. He wouldn't die like last time. He shouldn't worry about it. But even so, his smile was slipping as anxiety wrecked his mind. Fear engulfed his conscience, knocking all other thoughts aside. What if he failed again? What if he died? What if? What if? Just like last time, his group was led to the left side of the stage by the security personnel. In front of them was a thick wall of people. Even Hitoshi, who tiptoed and jumped, couldn't see past it. It's hot, Yuuga said. Izuku merely nodded. Yeah, he had too many things on his mind to engage in a conversation right now. When more people sandwiched them from behind, Izuku managed to stay in the crowd in midst of all the pushing and shoving. He ended up right next to Hitoshi who grabbed onto Izuku when he saw him struggling. The show's starting. Itoshi nudged him when an actor jumped onto the stage. Even though Izuku had been waiting for this show for ages, the fear of death lurked in the back of his mind as All Might fought villains after villains in order to protect Princess Bubblegum. Izuku just couldn't bring himself to focus on the show and enjoy it. 
Last time he could feel the heated passion drifting amongst the crowd before the show even began. This time, all he felt was a disconnection from the rest of the crowd, like he was in his own little world and no matter how bright All Might's grin was, the brilliance wouldn't reach him. Despite being prepared for it, Izuku still jumped when the first explosion hit the Ferris wheel. All Might had stopped in the middle of his fight against the blonde villain in surprise, but the villain didn't. He continued attacking All Might as if he was so engaged in the show he didn't even notice the explosion. The crowd was silent for a second before panic broke out. Water Girl reacted immediately, gathering everyone together and making sure they were okay. It was only then when they realized, where's Yuuga Kun? Gathering on the side of the road to avoid being trampled were only Izuku, Hitoshi, Minami, and Water Girl. Yuuga was nowhere to be seen. He said he's going to buy some ice cream. Minami murmured, trailing off as Izuku's face paled. Why didn't he ask me? Izuku cried, horrified. He said you looked like something's bothering you, and he didn't want to interrupt your thought process. Just then, the ground shook as if an earthquake had hit. Everyone watched in terror as the Ferris wheel dislodged from its stand and rolled down the road. No, it rolled past them. No no no, heading straight for the ice cream truck. No, with a cry, Izuku darted towards the street, ignoring Water Girl's frantic yell as he activated his quirk. Your luck has changed to three due to a decision you've just made. In the blink of an eye, his surroundings shifted and Izuku dropped onto the middle of the street. He stumbled a few steps then continued running. The Ferris wheel had already hit the construction zone. The walls were destroyed and multiple buildings collapsed. His heart was beating so fast he could practically hear it echoing above all the chaos. Running towards the path he had gone last time, Izuku felt his heart skip a beat when he saw the dreaded scene. Yuuga was running away as the ice cream truck charged straight towards him. Yuuga, Izuku activated teleportation again, appearing right by his friend and grabbing onto him. Your luck has changed to two due to a decision you've just made. Move out of my fucking way. Izuku activated teleportation again while maintaining a firm grasp on his petrified friend. But, your luck has changed to one due to a decision you've just made. The surroundings didn't change. Why? Crunch. Bah. Phantom pain flared up from his abdomen where the truck had run over. Izuku keeled over and wrapped his arms around his midsection, squeezing his eyes shut and gritting his teeth as he waited for the pain to pass. A second later, his body relaxed and he finally remembered to breathe again. Izuku waved an arm through his body. Yup, definitely dead. A feeling of bile rose to his throat as he looked around at the crime scene. His body had been severed in half from the waist down after the truck had run over it. The grey concrete was decorated with his bloody innards like a 3D ground art on Halloween. Yuuga was lying not so far away in a similar state. Izuku had failed yet again to save someone precious to him. Game over. Just like last time, the world around him exploded into thousands of broken shards that sprinkled down on him like a shower of sparkles. Words blasted in a splash of blood in the darkness surrounding him. You have chosen the path, hero. Here are your ratings according to this path. Emotional support for Tabaita, plus 100 points. Menami, plus 100 points. Itoshi, plus 100 points. Defeating all for one, plus 10,000 points. People you've helped, plus 1,000 points. Precious people lost, 20,000 points. Total, minus 87 O points. Izuku wanted to cry. He tried to fix things, but all he did was make things worse. Why did this happen? What had he done wrong? Izuku clicked through the screen, skipping the titles, achievements page and selecting the most recent save file. But when the alert popped up, he hesitated. Are you sure you want to choose the selected save file? His finger hovered above the yes option as uncertainty clouded his mind. What if he failed again? What if he continued to make things worse? Who would die this time? Itoshi. Minami. The water girl. Izuku didn't want to die again. He was terrified of the pain. The feeling of his head cracking and cold air seeping into his brain. The pain of being crushed into a pile of mangled flesh. The horror of seeing his severed lower body next to him as he died. No, Izuku refused to go through that again, so he chose yes. Immediately after the world had been re-imaged, Izuku accepted the survival quest and selected the quirk, Bubble. Bubble. Encase yourself in a protective bubble that shields you from all corporeal and abstract outside forces. Anyone in touch with you will also be enveloped in the bubble. This way, he could protect his friends from all outside forces. No one would die again. Izuku finally let out a relaxed smile. This could work. Uku. Izuku. Yes. Izuku jumped, quickly turning to the source of the voice. You might want to take that before he changed his mind. Hitoshi grumbled and nudged his lips at something to his right. Just like last time, the owner of the shooting booth was holding Izuku's prized phone with a strained smile. The type of smile Kakan loved to wear before he punched Izuku in the face. Izuku quickly accepted his phone with a meek smile. Some things never changed. When they reached the thick wall of people, Yuuga said, It's hot. I know right. I really want some ice cream. Do you have some in your magic backpack? Of course. Izuku responded with more enthusiasm than necessary. 
He swung his backpack off of one shoulder and unzipped it. Which type do you like? I have green tea machai, pino, vanilla coolish, sakura hajin daz, gari gari kun, mo, watermelon bar, coffee jelly, tofu swirl. I'll take the pino, mercy. Yuuga took out 100 yen and gave it to Izuku. No 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 it's fine. Izuku pushed his hand back. Today is a special day so you're getting it for free. If you say so. Izuku felt his eyes water as he watched Yuuga peel open the box and place a piece of chocolate covered ice cream into his mouth, humming happily. Just moments ago his friend was lying on the ground, bloodied and messed up, and now he was all alive and happy and enjoying his life. Yuuga didn't deserve what happened to him, and Izuku would do his very best to prevent that from happening again. Yuuga, grab onto me, K. Yuuga nodded, a bit confused, as he grabbed Izuku's hand. The group from behind showed up exactly when Izuku expected it, but this time, he stayed close to Yuuga. Their hands clasped together tightly. Immediately after they settled down, Izuku searched for his other teammates. Hitoshi was to their left, a little to the side of the crowd. Minami and Water Girl were in the front, slightly to the left. No one was missing. Izuku smiled softly. No one was going to die. No, give it back. All Might cried as his quirk left his body and was captured in the capsule floating in the sky. Steam rose around him, obscuring him from the audience. When the smoke cleared, there was a skinny blonde man kneeling on the ground with his hand outstretched towards the capsule that slowly flew into the villain's palm. You're not the hero you once were no more. Now, you're just a weak, powerless old man. The blonde villain barked a laugh as he popped open the capsule and inhaled the ball of power. He closed his eyes, expression relaxed as he moaned. So this is the power you've been hiding from me, my dear brother. No wonder you refuse to tell me. If I had such amazing power, he slammed his fists together, the resistance from the air in between bringing a loud whoosh sound, I would also keep it all to myself. D don't. All Might coughed, his skeleton-like body quivering with each cough as if they couldn't handle the strain. You don't know what you're dealing with. Oh really? His brother barked out a laugh, spreading his arm and flaunting his muscles as if trying to show how rugged he was comparing to the current All Might. I may be the younger brother but I'm not weak, he spat, a venomous look on his face. If you can handle it, then I can handle it. No, you don't understand. All Might pushed himself up, his arms quivering with effort. Without the quirk, he was so weak he could barely stand. That quirk, it eats away your energy. Eventually, you'll... Oh, shut your trap. The blonde villain interrupted, turning his back to the brother who was desperate to save him from making the same mistake. And watch me become a better hero than you'll ever be. Oh, and I'll be taking your hero name as well. All Might, how fitting of my form. He cackled as he walked off of the other side of the stage. The lights dimmed until All Might was the only one in the spotlight. Energy left his legs and he collapsed onto the ground, suddenly looking so small and fragile as if a mere push could hospitalize him. I, I have to stop him, before the power kills him. All Might murmured as the spotlight casting over him shrunk until all that left was complete darkness on the stage, giving the stage crew the chance to change settings. To be quite honest, Izuku was a bit surprised with how the show turned out. Every year the script changed, but even so, the formula always remained the same. All Might met a girl he liked. The villain captured the girl. All Might defeated the villain and lived with the girl happily ever after. Like everyone else, Izuku enjoyed watching All Might beat up villains and win in the end. But after seeing similar plots year after year, he began to lose interest in the show. This year's plot, however, surprised him. Of course, All Might still had to save a girl, who was, as always, acted out by Princess Bubblegum. But this time, the villain was his brother and the main focus was on All Might's quirk. Two brothers grew up quirkless and one of them received a mysterious quirk that granted him overwhelming strength, immense speed, extreme durability, and boundless stamina at the cost of his own spirit. He became the number one hero in society, earned fame, wealth, love, while his younger brother was left in the background with nothing. Jealous, the younger brother teamed up with all the villains who bore hatred of the hero and kidnapped Princess Bubblegum in an attempt to lure out All Might and steal his quirk. Nobody probably ever considered stripping All Might of his quirk and see where the story would go from there, since people came here to watch All Might, not some skinny old actor wearing a wig to make him look like All Might. But this year someone tried it, and the result was spectacular. As darkness enveloped the stage where faint silhouettes were shuffling around. Izuku was then reminded that he wasn't here to just enjoy the show, but to also protect his friends' lives. He quickly looked to the side, breathing out a sigh of relief when he saw Yuuga right next to him chewing away a dollop of pino. He then looked ahead and saw Water Girl giving Minami a bottle of water. Good, they were safe, too. He then looked to the left, and his heart leapt to his throat. Itoshi was missing. Toshi, Izuku whispered in horror, whipping around and grabbing Yuuga by the shoulders tightly, startling him into dropping the pino. Yuuga, have you seen Toshi? Isn't he over there? Yuuga paused when he saw the place where Hitoshi occupied was now empty. Ah, where did he go? No no no, this can't be. I'm going to look for him, you stay here. 
Izuku added for emphasis. And please don't go anywhere. Pushing his way through the throng, Izuku unclipped his YHP badge from his shirt and turned the dial so it connected to Hitoshi's badge. Hello, hello, Toshi, can you hear me? He yelled when he heard static from the other side. The hissing noise started to clear out as children's laughter and balloons popping noise rose above it. Izuku, Toshi, where are you? I'm, at the carnival area. Listen, no, get out of there. Quick, Izuku shouted as he stumbled out of the crowd. The people he had shoved past were throwing nasty glances at him. If this was any other day he would have bowed and apologized for being so disrespectful, but this wasn't the case today. Izuku glanced at his watch. They have about five minutes before the first explosion hit. Images of his past deaths flashed before his eyes, his body shuddering as it remembered the pain it had gone through. Izuku clenched his stomach as he ran towards the carnival area, gritting his teeth and eyes more determined than ever. He would not let another one of his friends die. Is activated. Remaining seconds 5. Point 4. Point 3. Plus 1. His body suddenly felt 10 times lighter, and the pressure on his lungs lifted, allowing him to breathe evenly and dash across the street at a faster pace, footsteps pounding on the ground in a rhythmic beat. Izuku rounded the bent in the path and ran even faster when he saw the colorful booths ahead of him. Five seconds passed and the familiar pull of gravity returned to his body. Izuku continued sprinting. Is activated. Remaining seconds 5.4.3 plus one. His surroundings blurred as he darted his eyes across the area frantically, searching for that familiar mop of wild purple hair. Plus one, plus one, plus one. Purple skirt, purple backpack, purple fur, purple balloon, purple hair. There, Toshi. Hitoshi swirled around at the sound of his name. He was crouched behind the edge shot booth, hiding in the shadow of an artificial rainbow-colored willow tree. Oh, hey, Izuku. What were you thinking? Izuku clenched his shirt and got into his face, dilated green eyes meeting confused purple ones. Why did you leave by yourself? Do you know how worried I was when I saw that you were gone? Sorry. Itoshi scratched his hair, eyes downcast as he gestured at something he was holding onto. I saw this wandering around and I just couldn't help but follow it. A cat was curling against his chest, nesting in his hold and meowing softly. A cat. Yeah, you know I like cats. I just can't help it whenever I see one. There's like this magical power pulling me towards it and a voice telling me to go, go get him. Izuku loosened his hold on Hitoshi's collar and took a trembling step back, wiping a hand across his face. I can't believe you. I'm sorry. I should have told you but I saw that you were really enjoying the show and I didn't want to interrupt you. I mean, I know how much you like All Might. No, no it's fine. At least you're safe. Izuku let out a wary grin. Let's just get you out of. His words were caught in his throat as a deafening blast of explosion threw him off guard. It's happening. The motor in the ferris wheel exploded as fire skirted around it, lighting up the gondolas and the passengers within. Oh my god. Hitoshi tightened his hold on the cat. Fear etched into his face as he stumbled back. All at once, people began screaming and running away from the carnival zone. It's happening. Run. Izuku didn't know whether Hitoshi pulled him first or it was the other way around. But both of them scrambled away from the willow tree, clumsy hands grabbing a hold of each other's arm in an attempt to feel safe. Your luck has changed to three due to a decision you've just made. A lit-up gondola fell from the ferris wheel and crashed into a booth behind them. The unfortunate ones who were nearby were instantly squashed into a bloody, meaty pulp. The others who had dodged the gondola couldn't escape quick enough before they caught on fire and became a human torch. Their screams were nothing Izuku had ever heard of, agonizing and shrill to a point of almost impossibility. People began to fall off of their gondolas, raining down the sky like a hail of human beings. One of them managed to shroud herself in an iceberg before hitting the ground. Her shield of ice shattering upon impact but it managed to protect her from the plummet. Izuku, what's going on? Hitoshi exclaimed as he ran as fast as he could, one hand grabbing Izuku's sleeves and the other barely holding onto the cat. I don't know but I think you should drop the cat. I can't do that. It's slowing you down. Do you want to die? Of course not. But saving a cat isn't going to kill me. Izuku pulled his hair, hard. No, you don't understand. You, I mean, you all are going to die today. I don't know why but something's causing you guys to die. If there's a way to increase our chance of survival then we need to take it. What are you even talking about? Itoshi cried. Izuku, you're not like yourself today. He was right. Normally, Izuku would never tell someone to drop a cat in the middle of a scurrying crowd where it could get trampled or killed by the fire. But today, he had had enough of himself dying and seeing his friends die and people dying in general he just wanted to live for once. If sacrificing a cat meant he and Hitoshi could survive, then so be it. In the end, it all comes down to whether you believe their death would be beneficial or meaningless. The cat wasn't a villain, but the same concept still applied. In this case, its death would definitely be beneficial to Izuku and Hitoshi. With the additional weight of the cat, Hitoshi was slowing down and since he was grabbing onto Izuku, Izuku was slowing down as well. 
seeing people after people rush past them, and even a kid near their age had managed to outrun them, Izuku was at his limit. He grabbed the cat by its neck and tossed it onto the ground, ignoring its shrieks as he pulled a stunned Itoshi out of his oblivion. What the hell was that, Midoriya? Itoshi yelled, his face reddening with anger. He shoved Izuku roughly, almost sending him staggering to the ground. What's wrong with you? It could have died. Do you know how painful that would have been? I know. Okay. Izuku slapped his hands away when Hitoshi moved to shove him again. I know it hurts to die. I freaking know that. That's why I don't want us to die. Why don't you understand? Why don't I understand? No. Why don't you understand? I thought you're better than this. What the hell happened to you? Why are you so cruel and inhumane? Those purple eyes were filled with anger, fear, and disgust, like its owner was staring at something revolting, something that would ruin their appetite with just one glance. His gaze was sharp, intense, and penetrating, shooting daggers through Izuku and hurting him from the inside. Izuku never knew words could hurt this much. Before he could retort, a loud crash came from the side when a gondola tumbled down the street and smashed into a vending machine right next to them, causing it to fall forward onto the duo. Acting purely on instincts, Izuku pushed Hitoshi down and activated Bubble. A pink sphere formed around them, protecting them from the heavy machine. Your luck has changed to due to a decision you've just made. Crouched above Hitoshi with his hands on either side of his head, Izuku gritted his teeth when the weight of the machine became too much to handle. The strain from the bubble had a direct connection to his body, his head throbbing in pain and his back aching the more pressure the bubble received. The bubble began to bend out of shape as an immense force pushed down on Izuku's back, immobilizing him. Itoshi was so shocked he just lay there with his mouth agape and eyes widened. Izuku smiled tiredly. Cruel, inhumane. It doesn't matter what you call me. I'm still going to save you. The bubble finally cracked under pressure. Run. Your luck has changed to one due to a decision you've just made. Itoshi scrambled out of the bubble just in time before it shattered into tiny fragments. Without the support, the vending machine slammed onto Izuku, crushing his small body against the sandy ground. Izuku felt the familiar sensation of all his bones shattering. And he smiled. At least I managed to save my friend this time around. Title has been unlocked. More information can be found on the titles. Achievements page. Game over. You have chosen the path, hero. Here are your ratings according to this path. Emotional support for. Tabaita, plus 100 points. Nanami, plus 100 points. Itoshi, plus 100 points. Defeating all for one, plus 10,000 points. People you've helped, plus 1,000 points. Precious people saved, plus 10,000 points. Precious people lost, 10,000 points. Total, 11,400 points. Would you like to exchange 11,000 points for 11 chances to spin the Wheel of Fate? Yes. While the wheel spun, Izuku cupped his cheeks, frowning. As he pulled his legs up into a sitting position, his ghost-like body swaying slightly in the air. Compared to his last revive, he definitely did better this time. None of his friends died, and he wasn't killed by the ice cream truck. But now a new problem had arisen. How to stop Hitoshi from running off and getting himself in harm's way. And what to do after he figured out how to save Hitoshi without dying. This time he saved Yuuga, and Hitoshi almost died. So what if he saved Hitoshi and someone else died? Like Minami, or Water Girl. How would he know? Was there any way to predict who would die next? Try again next time. Try again next time. Try again next time. Congratulation, you have received X1. Collect 7 to make a wish. Try again next time. Try again next time. Congratulation, you have received. Whose poop is it? That remains a mystery. Try again next time. Try again next time. Try again next time. Congratulation, you have received plus 1. Walk 4111 steps to hatch it and feed it candies for it to evolve. At level 4 it will turn into and at level 10, Butterfree, Butterfly, something clicked in his mind and he remembered what Gola had said before he died the first time. Silla V, you never know what will happen. Tiny changes can make big differences. Have you heard of the butterfly effect? No, what's that? In simpler terms, it basically means a simple movement like a butterfly flapping its wings can give rise to a tornado somewhere else. You never know how killing an ant when you're 5 might lead to someone holding a grudge and trying to murder you 30 years later. That makes no sense at all. Tiny changes can make big differences. Izuku murmured. He felt like he was catching onto something. Tiny changes. He jumped up, slapping a fist through his other hand. It's the changes I make. I just need to stop making changes. It's so easy. Why haven't I thought of it earlier? Yuuga went to buy ice cream himself instead of asking Izuku, like he did the first time, because Izuku looked like something was bothering him and Yuuga didn't want to interrupt his thought process. The next time around, Hitoshi was left alone because Izuku decided to stick together with Yuuga, leaving him near the side of the crowd where he was lured away by the cat. All he needed to do was to stop making changes and stick as close to the original timeline as possible. That way, he would know what would happen. 
and there wouldn't be any big differences. It would work. Save files gave him knowledge of the future. What an idiot he was to not use that to his advantage. Revitalized with hope, Izuku tapped the collect all option with more force than necessary, his fingers slipping through the screen easily. In a flash, the screen changed to his inventory and the three items he won had now been stored in it. The dragon ball had an icon of an orange ball with a single red star. The pile of poop had the icon of a cartoonish pile of poop drawn on it. And the Pokemon. Caterpie egg was a cream white egg with pale green spots. Izuku tapped the dragon ball. An ultra rare item that will cost an insane amount of rep points to buy. Currently locked in the bazaar because you have not reached the prerequisites. Collect seven of this and you can make a wish. Any wish, and it will come true. To say Izuku was excited would be a great understatement. No one could refuse the temptation of a wish come true. But like the description said, it would cost an insane amount of rep points to purchase it. Not to mention he didn't even know the prerequisites to unlock it yet. Now wasn't the time to drool over the possibilities this could bring. Seeing the Dragon Ball, though, gave him confidence. If he could win an ultra-rare item out of hundreds, thousands of items, that must meant he was pretty lucky, right? He skipped the pile of poop and went straight to the Pokémon. What was he going to do with a pile of poop anyway? Pokemon, short for pocket monsters, are creatures that can become your pet, companion, and bodyguard. Hatch them, play with them, train them, and they'll evolve to become stronger so they can protect you. Caterpie will hatch once you've walked 4111 steps. It will evolve into Metapod at level 4 and Butterfree at level 10. Like many other boys his age, Izuku had played games where you had loyal animal companions, also known as mounts, to fight for you. The idea of getting an actual mount in real life was both exciting and unnerving. For one, it was a caterpillar. Izuku had had pets before, like a rabbit and some fish, but never a bug. He was terrified of bugs. He couldn't even touch them, let alone keep them as pets. For two, how would a caterpillar fight? And lastly, what exactly were Pokémons? So are Pokémons regular animals or are they magical creatures? Golar responded flatly, they're Pokémons. Silence. So they're magical creatures. They're Pokémons. Raising both his hands, Izuku surrendered, a grumpy look crossing his face as he groaned in annoyance. Fine, I knew you wouldn't give me a straight answer. He would find out sooner or later. That was, if he could survive today. Closing out the inventory screen, Izuku moved on to the titles, Achievements screen. The Lifesaver, Activation Requirement, Save Someone's Life, Quirk, Final Destination, Can See the Death of Anyone You Touch With All Five Fingers, More Death, Definitely Not An Option, Izuku Was Sick Of The Word Death, Are You Sure You Want To Choose The Selected Save File? Before making a choice, Izuku took advantage of the silent environment and focused on remembering everything that had happened during his first life. You have learned. Plus one. Oh, good for you. Must be nice to have a phone when most of your friends don't, Hitoshi said sourly. Plus one. Sorry for the wait. Izuku scratched his cheeks with a sheepish smile. But I finally got what I wanted. Plus one. Secret. Yuuga placed a finger against his lips and said with a mysterious smile. Plus one. I do. But why don't you try the ones from that ice cream truck over there? They have all kinds of flavors. All right, let's do this. Izuku tapped the save file automatically generated right after the failure to stop quest and took a deep breath as he waited for the world to finish re-imaging. He clenched his fist and relaxed them repeatedly feeling of death returning to his body and he couldn't stop thinking of the worst-case scenario. This was the only method he could think of that might help him survive. If this didn't work, he really didn't know what else he could do. He felt a pull in his feet, his vision blurring and in the next second, he was back in his original body, the steel grip of the gun clenched tightly in his clammy hands. He let out a sigh and his grip slackened as the crowd surrounding him erupted into cheers. Wow, you did it, Hitoshi observed, clapping along with everyone else. But how much did you spend? The owner of the booth handed him the phone and Izuku accepted it immediately. Every second counted. Maybe even a slight hesitation could be considered as a tiny change. He turned around and presented it to Hitoshi, putting a bright smile onto his face. The newest Android phone currently on the market. The market price is 100,000 yen, and I got it for 20,000 yen. Oh, good for you. Must be nice to have a phone when most of your friends don't, Hitoshi said sourly. Hey I didn't mean to. Relax, I'm just joking. Hitoshi bumped him on the shoulders, chuckling. Come on, let's see how the others are faring. Izuku accepted the survival quest and chose the third quirk, Metal Control. As they made their way towards the edge shot booth where Water Girl was watching a couple kids throw ninja stars at balloons while Yuuga and Minami were having what seemed to be a serious conversation beside her. And this is when I said, sorry for the wait. Izuku scratched his cheeks with a sheepish smile. But I finally got what I wanted. Water Girl turned towards Izuku and gasped at the phone he was holding. You actually got it. Her expression suddenly turned into that of a stern mother. How much did you spend, though? Not too much. Izuku quickly shook his head and waved his hands around. 
only about 20,000 yen. And considering this phone costs 100,000 yen, it's a win for me. Water Girl placed a hand on her forehead as she shook her head. I'm not even going to ask where you got your 20,000 yen. Izuku let out a shaky breath as Yuuga and Manami went to them. So far, so good. What were you two talking about? Izuku asked as he walked side by side with Yuuga and Hitoshi towards the stage. Secret. Yuuga placed a finger against his lips and said with a mysterious smile. Secret. Huh. Hitoshi wiggled his eyebrows as if hinting at something. Everything had happened exactly the same way so far, and that was a very good sign. If Izuku could keep this up, he would be able to survive the ice cream truck attack and protect everyone. It's hot, Yuuga declared with a strained smile when they had gathered at the left side of the stage. Must be the passion. Izuku grinned as he wiped a drop of sweat off of his forehead. Everyone's heated excitement is leaking out and affecting the others. It's contagious. I can literally feel it drifting all around me. He almost forgot to wave his arms around, feeling the air, but he managed to do so before Yuuga said, I think I'm infected as well. Right. But still, it's hot. I really want some ice cream. Do you have some in your magic backpack? Izuku tightened his jaw. Here we go. I do. But why don't you try the ones from that ice cream truck over there? They have all kinds of flavors. Yuuga squinted at the direction Izuku was pointing. I don't see anything. Izuku glanced at his All Might watch. We have a few minutes before the show starts. We can make it. He grabbed Yuuga's hand just in time for more people to sandwich them from behind. Amidst the shoving and pushing, Izuku let go of Yuuga's hand on purpose and pressed his body against the crowd, taking every available gaps in between the heated bodies to force his way through. When he finally stumbled out of the other side, he was so sweaty steam was practically rising from his head. As he made his way towards the ice cream truck, he couldn't shake off the feeling that he had forgotten something. He thought back to his life and everything he had done and said, and realized with a hitch of breath that he didn't yell out I'll be back soon to his friends before he leave the crowd. A wave of coldness washed over his body. Izuku shuddered and fastened his pace, suppressing the feeling to the best of his ability. He was fine. It was only one line. He was already more than halfway there. He couldn't start doubting himself now. He just had to hold on to the hope that this tiny change wasn't enough to cause a big difference, and that things were still going as he predicted. As the ice cream truck came into sight, Izuku slowed his pace so he had time to observe the phone. Plus one. Name, Sharp L2 Android. Owner, Midoriya Izuku. Durability, 20 over 20. Worth, 100,000 yen. Description, the newest release of the Sharp Android series. It's fully functional underwater up to 500 meters and its shock resistance is 20 meters. After this should be, an integratable object has been detected. Would you like to integrate this? <laughs> Izuku merely slid the screen to his side so as to not block his vision. He didn't make a choice the first time, so he couldn't make one now. It would have to wait. Standing in front of the ice cream truck, Izuku roamed his eyes over the colorful menu while counting seconds in his head, replicating the time it took him to decide on a flavor. As he made his orders, the old man inside the truck smiled sweetly at him. It disgusted Izuku how a smile so compassionate was merely a facade that hit a creature so merciless he was willing to run over a child just so he could get away from the ferris wheel. But on a second thought, wasn't Izuku just the same? He made Hitoshi drop the cat in the middle of a rushing crowd so both of them could live. He was willing to sacrifice a cat, while the old man was willing to sacrifice a child. A life was a life regardless of whoever it belonged to. He only felt like this because he was on the receiving end of the treatment. In the end, he wasn't all that different from the old man. No, Izuku cut off that train of thoughts sharply. I'm not like him. I'm nothing like him. He ran over me to save himself. He's selfish, and I'm not. I did it to save both Toshi and me. It's different. The twisted contortion of the old man's features before his death flashed across his mind. I would never kill someone for my own sake. The promise remained on his mind as he held out his hand with the change over to his murder, pausing deliberately when the notification regarding his decrease in luck popped up and only handing it over when the old man groused. Do you want to buy it or not? Uh, ah, yes, I'm sorry. Quickly dropping the coins into his hand, Izuku moved over to the right side of the truck, sitting on a bench as he waited for his order to be ready. Hey kid, out of the corners of his eyes, he could see the old man gesturing wildly while holding onto his ice cream, trying to get his attention. But Izuku ignored him. He waited, and waited, and only when the ice cream had dripped onto the old man's gloved hands did he scuttle over and apologize frantically as he accepted his melted ice cream. Your luck has changed to to do to a decision you've just made. Gola, Izuku yelled and dropped the ice cream on purpose. Please tell me what's going on. And, I suppose you'd want me to go along with this. Okay then, master, I told you, it's just, please. Izuku clenched his hands into fists, digging his nails painfully into his palm. I don't want to die. Death is a part of life, master. You can't escape death. I don't want to hear that right now. 
The explosions occurred right after he said this, just as Izuku had predicted. Silence swept over the area, lasting only for a minute before people started screaming and scampering around with no particular destination in mind. You can always use the four-leaf clover you friend gave you. Gola seemed to remember its lines very well. Izuku took a trembling step back. No, I won't use it, because I'm not going to die. He took another step, and another, and then he was full-on sprinting away from the ferris wheel. But this time, he ran towards the opposite direction. Last time he picked the direction of the House of Doom, and ended up getting run over by the old man who happened to pick the same direction he did. So this time, he chose to run towards the stage directly across from the House of Doom, away from the old man, away from his death. The ferris wheel had yet to hit the construction zone, which meant he still had about half a minute or so before the time of his death. Your luck has changed to one due to a decision you've just made. Move out of my fucking way. No, Izuku glanced back. The lethal ice cream truck was charging straight towards him. No 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 this can't be happening. Izuku swerved sharply to the right, and the truck also veered towards the right. It must be that tiny change I made when I forgot that line. Damn it. Izuku forced himself into a stop, faced the truck, and pushed out his palms, activating his quirk. Smooth, coldness brushed over his fingertips, spreading across his palms and running up his arms. He pressed his palms against the texture, taking a step back as he put as much weight as he could into his arms and pushing back against the truck. Come on, move, biting his lips so hard he could taste blood. Izuku took another step back, his red shoes digging into the dirt. Veins were making themselves visible on his neck, looking extremely out of place on a child's body. Izuku's face was turning red from how much he was struggling and his arms trembled like a tower of cards before its collapse. His quirk wasn't working, and Izuku knew exactly why it wasn't. When people receive their quirk for the first time, they didn't instantly become powerful and proficient with it. It took time to get used to the quirk, train their body to grow accustomed to it, and practice until they had a better grasp of it. When Kakin's quirk first manifested, he was only able to produce small, exploding sparkles in his palms. But after four years of practice, he could now dent the wall with his explosions. Izuku could teleport himself just fine, but his quirk failed him when he tried to teleport himself and Yuga at the same time. That was because he wasn't powerful enough to teleport multiple people. The bubble did its job protecting him and Hitoshi. But due to lack of practice, it couldn't handle the weight of the vending machine and ended up cracking down under pressure. Izuku had hoped that metal control would be different, that he would immediately be able to move all metal objects despite their size and weight, but that turned out to be a fool's dream. What an idiot he was to wish for the impossibles. His hands slowly began to drop to his sides. The truck was mere feet away from him. I guess I failed again. My eyes a UKU. A broken cry reached his ears. Mana dot 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 my. Don't die. Your luck has changed to seven due to a decision you've just made. All of a sudden, an unknown surge of power forced its way into his body, from the crown of his head to his hands to the tip of his toes. It ran in his bloodstream, jumping from cell to cell and stimulating each one with a tiny zap. Those that were inside it sped throughout his body in a speed Izuku could practically feel from the way he no longer needed to step back against the pressure and could now push it back, easily. The air between him and the truck exploded, blasting the vehicle backward to the middle of the street. Izuku caught a terrified look on the driver's face in a fleeting moment before the ferris wheel smashed into the truck, killing him instantly. The truck served as an obstacle in its path, off-balancing the ferris wheel and causing it to turn slightly towards the left. It ended up crashing into the construction walls and tipping over, landing on the corner of the walls and sending a wave of tremor in the ground. Izuku, Manami raced towards him, her face ashen and her fingers cold when she pulled him into a hug. Tears dripped onto his shirt as she cried. I I I thought you were G going to die. Izuku patted her back, his motion a little jerky considering how he still couldn't believe what had just happened. How did you know? I was here. Yuga told me. Before he could hug her back, Manami dropped her hands and jumped back, holding her hands awkwardly in front of her chest as a faint blush crept up her neck. I am so sorry for hugging you like that and ruining your shirt with my tears. I, I was just so worried. H hey, it's fine. Izuku clasped her shoulders and said softly, it's no big deal. It's just a shirt. I have dozens of shirts just like this one. Why you're not mad at me? Manami asked, wiping her eyes. You don't hate me. Of course I don't. What? How did that thought even cross your mind? Manami's eyes widened as she registered what he had just said. She then smiled and giggled and laughed. I guess it's just a misunderstanding then. What are you talking about? Before Manami could reply, Water Girl raced up to them and enveloped the both of them in a bear hug. Tears flew everywhere as she told them how her heart literally stopped when she witnessed Izuku almost getting killed, and how her mother instincts kicked in forcing her to rush towards them as fast as her legs allowed her. Yuga and Hitoshi ran up after her and jumped into the group hug. It ended up as a massive tear fest. 
but even as they cried, everyone had a relieved smile on their face, because they were all alive at the end of the day. And that was what mattered. While Izuku was enjoying his time with his team and breathing in the air of living, Tenko was not having such a good time. Lying on the ground with debris all around him, he screamed in agony of having his legs crushed under the colossal ferris wheel. But nobody came. No one ever came for him. All Might knew something was off about the blonde villain. Ever since he shook hands with him, the buff man had been eyeing him strangely while bearing a suspicious, knowing smile. Years of experience of dealing with villains allowed All Might to see all types of smiles. And this type was usually from people who were hiding something and couldn't help but feel giddy and superior for knowing something no one else knew. And that something, more often than not, was a devious plan. Nothing out of the ordinary happened during the rehearsal. The blonde villain, muscular, acted out his part perfectly. His acting was so on point he could have convinced an ignorant bystander that he was a villain and they would have believed him and called the police. Even though it was his first time performing in front of a live audience, Muscular didn't appear nervous at all. He acted just as well as he did during the rehearsal, almost as if he wasn't acting, but was just being himself. Then came the scene with him fighting All Might while using the quirk he stole. Muscular's quirk, muscle augmentation, was perfect for the story. All Might's younger brother stole and absorbed the quirk. But it was too powerful for his body it literally gave him so much muscles they couldn't be contained by his skin. The final fight went just like they rehearsed. They had practiced beforehand what percentage of All Might's power could be used on Muscular without injuring him while giving the audience the impression that they were. All until the explosions on the Ferris wheel. Like everyone else, All Might paused to stare at the attraction in shock, but he didn't expect Muscular to continue attacking him as if nothing happened. H. Hey, what are you doing? All Might blocked the attacks that suddenly seemed much more powerful than they were before. Stop. Something's going on. I think it's a villain attack. Now isn't the time to continue acting. Acting. That smile again. Muscular licked his lips. Throwing another heavy punch at All Might. I was never acting. The series of explosions that followed sent all the audience screaming and scattering. Security guards were trying their best to maintain order and direct the terrified guests to a safe zone. Children were crying and getting lost. People were tripping and trampling over each other's. From the corner of his eyes, All Might could see the carnival zone going up a flame as gondolas crashed into the area one after another. People were dying and they needed All Might. I need to. He was stopped once again by another punch that was thrown at his face. All Might dodged. The unexpected gust of wind that resulted from the force threw him off guard. All Might, All Might, All Mighty All Might. Muscular sing-songed as he jumped, and in a second he was in front of All Might kicking down at his head. All Might leapt off the stage to gain some distance, eyes widening as the fragile stage he was just standing on was smashed into smithereen. The entire structure, curtains, floorboards, decorations and all crashed down like an unstable Jenga tower. Respect your opponent. Have you never been taught that? The replacement, the smile, the acting, the power. It all made sense now. Muscular was a real villain. And he was working with the bomber, distracting me so I can't save those in need of help. How despicable. Respect is earned, not given. All Might growled as he blocked a kick with one hand and punched Muscular in the stomach with his other. If you want my respect then you shouldn't have picked a fight with me when people are suffering and need my help. I can see what you're trying to do. Distracting me so your accomplice can cause chaos. You're wrong, All Might. That hideous excuse of a human is no accomplice of mine. I merely worked with him so I can get the chance to kill you myself. Jumping back to avoid a punch that formed a crater on the concrete. All Might threw his hand back, power gathering around his fist as he smashed into the layers of muscles. Detroit smash. Wide-eyed. All Might gawked when the force only pushed the villain back a few feet. The muscles retracted, revealing Muscular's taunting grin. No matter how strong a punch is, nothing can ever get past my ultimate defense. Muscular boasted as he headbutted All Might, causing the hero to stumble back in surprise. All Might blinked, quickly refocusing and countering Muscular's attacks with his own. They traded blows for at least 10 minutes. All of All Might's smashes were deflected by the layers of muscles, while Muscular's punches all met skin. They were almost as powerful as All Might's own attacks, making the hero grit his teeth in pain. I have to find an opening and get inside his defense. A bitter taste formed in his mouth when he caught sight of the flaming attraction crashing into the construction zone. At first, all he could think of was how he had failed to evacuate the construction workers and how they might be injured, but then a scene surfaced in his mind. Tenko drawing at the corner of the walls and ignoring him when he called out to him before the rehearsal. Don't tell me. All Might froze, alarm ringing in his ears. What are you stopping for, hero? Give me your all. All Might leaned back just in time to avoid the fist that narrowly grazed his nose and swiped Muscular's feet from under him, causing him to land on his back with a heavy thud. The hero darted forward, taking the chance to aim a Texas smash at the stomach. 
What he did not expect was the visible layers of muscles unfurling and snaking around his fist, locking it in tightly within the muscle fibers. Tenko's face flashed across his mind, a mixed look of sadness, disappointment, and rage. All Might crouched slightly. The muscles on the arm that was stuck bulged as power gathered in it. No one can stop me from saving my son. Muscular cried out in surprise when All Might lifted him off of the ground with the arm that was stuck and punched in the direction of the side of the road. The muscle fibers clenched tightly around his fist but gave in in the end and slackened, causing Muscular to fly off into an empty area. Not giving him a chance to react and put up his defense mechanism, All Might launched himself forward. The villain only had the time to guard his face with his bare arms before a United States of Smash broke down his weak defense, causing them to flop limply to his sides. How long had it been? Tenko didn't know. All he knew was that it had been so long he couldn't even feel his legs anymore, let alone move them. An embarrassing whimper escaped his lips. Tenko shifted slightly, crying out when white-hot searing pain dulled his senses. He managed to touch the heavy metal that was crushing his legs with all five fingers and disintegrate the structure before the pain overwhelmed him, revealing the mutilated mess that once was his legs. Blood, chunks of flesh, and pieces of bones were everywhere. Tenko quickly averted his eyes, bile rising to his throat and he let them out. Puke leaked out of his mouth and onto the ground, staining his neck, shirt and giving off an awful odor that made his stomach churn in disgust. Tears of pain dripped down his cheeks, mixing with some puke that leaked out of his nose in the form of snots. Without the ability to move, Tenko couldn't even move his head from the vomit that was inches away. His vision swam. The sun suddenly seemed so bright, forming spots in his vision. There was a black dot in the distance, moving in and out of the spots. Tears blurred the details, but it looked vaguely like All Might, young Shimura. The figure dropped down in front of him and cradled his face, lifting it off of the puke. Hands stained with vomit but the hero didn't seem to care. He placed a finger under Tenko's nose. Relief filled his mind upon seeing his rescuer, but it was soon overtaken by rage that burned in the pit of his stomach. Why couldn't All Might come sooner? Why didn't he protect him? Why wasn't he there? The world had been tilting for the past few minutes and Tenko's consciousness was ebbing away, darkness clawing at the edge of his vision. He blinked when he saw wet spots form on the ground, as if it was raining. Using the last bit of his energy, he cranked his neck up, almost forgetting how to breathe when he saw glistening drops of tears and that foreign expression on the face. All Might was, crying, Tenko blacked out after that. He found himself in a dream state, except he could see and hear what was going on around him but couldn't wake up and talk. Dot 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 bone marrow messed up. Ligaments torn and completely separated from the bones. A doctor wearing a laboratory coat was talking to All Might in a white room. Severe muscle necrosis. Bones broken into thousands of splinters. Some even crushed into tiny particles. Dot 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 like an egg beaten to an unrecoverable state. T there's no other way. All Might's voice sounded so weak and hopeless. Dot 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 we had no other choice but to amputate his legs. When Tenko woke up, he was in the same white room, lying on the hospital bed with All Might slumped on the chair next to him. His nose twitched when the distinctive smell of iodoform assaulted his senses. The clothes he had been wearing were gone and replaced with a fresh hospital gown. The clean smell of laundry filled his nostrils but still wasn't enough to get rid of the chemical stench. His throat was dry, his tongue feeling too big and thick for his mouth. He started coughing as soon as he inhaled through his mouth, spurring All Might into grabbing a cup of water from the nightstand and carefully placing the straw between his lips. Tenko drank greedily. Water had never tasted so good before. He wasn't especially keen on drinking water, as shown in his always dry lips. But after this sensation, he might start to drink a little bit more every day. The liquid alleviated the dryness. His throat finally didn't feel as though someone had grinded a ton of sand with it. The moment he dropped the straw and moved his body to make himself comfortable, All Might sprung out of the chair and began fussing all over him. Are you okay? How are you feeling? How are your legs? I mean, do you feel any pain? Are you hungry? I I have some peanuts. He pulled out a Ziploc bag from his pocket, his hand halting in midair when he saw the crushed peanuts inside. Tenko ignored him and shifted up so his back was leaning against the pillow, of which All Might quickly adjusted the position when he realized what the boy was trying to do. Pulling the thin cover off of his body, Tenko froze as he stared at the two wrapped up stumps that used to be his legs, his blood turning cold. The All Might looked every bit as uncomfortable as he was. I was going to tell you this. Tenko reached down and touched the stump tentatively. There was no pain, or maybe it was just the anesthetic still in his system. He cupped the stump in his small hand, feeling the shape and squeezing the soft flesh. His legs really were gone. Reality hit him all at once. He lost his legs. He had to get prosthetic. He was now disabled. He had to sit in a special seat for the special people and bear all those curious and pitied looks thrown at him. Everywhere he walked, people would stare and jeer at him. Everywhere he went, he would be treated differently. He couldn't run and play like a normal kid anymore. He couldn't make friends like a normal kid anymore. 
because he wasn't normal. His lips trembled, the first sign of his breakdown, covering his mouth with his pinky lifted. Tenko stifled a sob as tears welled up in his eyes. He tried holding them back by looking up at the perfectly measured square tiles on the ceiling, but the blinding fluorescent light from the ceiling only served to sting his eyes, causing more and more tears to gather and eventually stream down his face. His entire body shook, his shoulders heaving as he took a deep, trembling breath. Out of habit, he pulled his legs towards him to hide his face, only to fall forward without them to support him, causing even more pain in his chest. The walls he built up to protect himself finally crumbled pieces by pieces, his defense washed away by those salty tears. Tired of the front he had to put up, Tenko allowed himself to curl into All Might's chest as the hero wrapped his arms around him and kept murmuring I'm sorry, I'm sorry over and over again. His cries muffled by the fabric. Tenko clenched the hero uniform tightly with four fingers as he hid his face from view, the strong, rhythmic beating of All Might's heart soothing his rapidly fast one. He wanted to push the hero away. He wanted to yell at him, punch him, blame him for being late to save him once again. But he couldn't gather the strength to do so. All Might's crying face stood out in his mind vividly. The fact that the number one hero, the toughest man Tenko had ever known, broke down crying in front of him because of him, a mere orphan, stirred something within him. All Might may not always be on time. He may not be the best dad, but he cared. He really did care about Tenko. After a while, the crying stopped. Tenko broke away from the hug and wiped his eyes, sniffling. All Might quickly passed him a tissue from the nightstand and he blew his nose, loudly. The sound especially loud in the empty room, kind of like blowing a trumpet, Tenko mused. I am really sorry. Young Shimura. All Might began, his eyes reddening as he gripped the edge of the bed so hard the metal was bending. His voice was so weak, void of his usual optimistic drive. Without meeting Tenko's eyes, the hero continued. I've failed you again. I should have defeated the villain sooner. No, I should have stayed with you. It was a terrible idea to leave you alone. I'm sorry. This trip was supposed to be fun and enjoyable for you, and to improve our relationship. I should have focused on you and spent more time with you. Maybe. Maybe it was a terrible idea to bring you here today. No, it's not. Tenko refuted, his voice cracking. He stared dead at those haunting blue eyes as he continued. An attack like this could have happened anywhere and you'd have no way of knowing beforehand. At least AMAP was fun. I especially like the magical marker, so I don't regret coming here. Why you don't blame me? I do blame you. At this, the hero's face paled even more if possible. Because you weren't there to protect me, I could have died. But, what mattered is that you showed up to save me in the end, unlike last time. Even though you were late, at least you made it. You remembered me and came to my help when there's a lot more people waiting for your help at the time. You, you cared about me. Thanks, Dad. Wah, what did you just call me? All Might stuttered, flabbergasted, his mouth opening and closing like a stupid fish. Dad, Tenko repeated, taking pride in being able to render the symbol of peace speechless. Thanks for saving me, Dad. Why why young she am Mura? Call me Tenko. T Tenko. All Might stared at him for a moment and then suddenly stood up, the tiny chair clattering onto the ground. Tenko jerked back in surprise. Ah, your hand. The hand. Your father's hand. I just remembered. It got crushed along with your legs and they took it. Tenko rubbed his abused ears, frowning. This was something he'd have to start getting used to. It's fine. I don't need it anymore. He grabbed All Might's big, calloused hand and held it with his pinky lifted. My father's hand is right here. Izuku still couldn't believe he was alive. Everything that happened after the group hug went by in a blur. He vaguely remembered heading over to the House of Doom, a safe zone for everyone in the area, and meeting up with the rest of the YHP students. A family stood out in the background, a mother with white hair pulling back her two sons, a white head and a red head, by the back of their collars. Mom, we have to find Yumi Ni and Shouto. What if they're hurt? Or worse, killed? The boy with white hair yelled as he struggled against his mother's grip in vain. You told us to grow up and protect our sister, so why don't you let us do it now? The other boy yelled. Their mother bonked them both on the foreheads. Yes, I did tell you to protect your sister, but I didn't tell you to put yourself in unnecessary danger while doing so. You don't even know where they are. How are you going to find them when villains could be anywhere? I don't want you both to hurt yourself. Please, let's just wait here. I believe they'll make it back. Your sister and Shadow are both very strong-willed. They will make it. The boys gave in afterwards and the family went to sit by a sign next to the front door of the mansion. All the YHP students were sitting together on the grass in front of the house, supervised by a few anxious chaperones. The pro heroes like the Waterhose couple had left right after making sure everyone was present, heading towards the carnival zone to help with the fire. About 15 minutes later, everyone in the area cheered when a streak of red, blue, and yellow zipped past them, also heading towards the disaster. All Might was here. There was nothing to worry about now. Izuku could finally relax and sort out the situation. 
materializing a notebook onto his hand. He began writing down everything that had happened today. The scorching heat that engulfed the left side of his body forced him wake. Shadow's first instinct was to scream, but his control slipped out of his grasp when he remembered what had caused him to faint in the first place. The slime villain had taken control of his body and caused fire to spread all around the ferris wheel. He remembered seeing the gondola they were reciting and snap off of its support, falling, and a slimy tentacle wrapping around the metal structure of the ferris wheel to save his body from falling to its death. But unfortunately, his sister had fallen with the gondola, crashing onto the ground. The horror of witnessing her presumed death together with the slime clogging his trachea and depriving him of oxygen forced his brain to shut down on its own. The scene he woke up upon was something straight out of a disaster on television. The closest thing he could think of was the video of All Might's debut, where he carried more than a dozen people on his shoulders to safety and saved over a hundred people within ten minutes. The sky had turned a grayish red due to all the smoke and flames polluting the air. Pain groans and the crackling of fire went on and on. Burning buildings and charred corpses laid down the path where he stood. Shadow tried looking away from the bodies, but he couldn't even control his gaze let alone turn his head. His body felt stuffed, like he was filled to his throat with slime. The familiar smell of burning fabric and wood overwhelmed his mind, but that wasn't the worst of it. The smell that truly traumatized him was the smell of burning flesh, which was exactly the same as the aroma of grilled pork, and Shadow absolutely hated himself for the way his stomach growled when he inhaled the scent. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. His mouth moved. It took him a second to recognize the deep, raspy voice as his own. Ah, you're awake. I must thank you for lending me your body. It hosts the perfect quirk to cause damage. His left hand raised by itself. Muscular should be done by now. About time for me to show up. Who dot 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 who dot 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 who dot 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 the hero would never expect me to use a kid's body. Fire poured out of his left side at a constant rate. Continue burning his surroundings until they turn to ash. When the villain looked down, Shadow could see his exposed skin turning red from overheating. All of this was caused by father's fire. No, my fire. It came from me. I'm the one who used it. My fire had caused. All this disbelief filled his mind which soon turned into cold terror when a body lying on the side of the road twitched. The man couldn't move, his legs stuck under a billboard sign. Upon seeing Shadow, he stretched out a hand and murmured, Help. No, don't. The villain didn't listen. A stream of fire later the man had been cremated, his ashen remains dispersing with the wind, and a live human being was gone. Just like that. My fire killed people. I killed people. Look how powerful it is, the villain was saying, and Shadow tried his best to block out the sound. Imagine me taking over Endeavor's body. I'd become invincible. Father. A hero. Someone. Help. What have you done to the boy? Shouts came from the distance. The villain looked up. A mass of people dressed like pro heroes were charging towards him. Two heroes dressed similarly began shooting water at the fire, trying to suppress it. A woodman shot out his wooden arms and wrapped around two victims who were barely alive after a muscled hero lifted the debris off of them. The others tried to capture him with their respective quirks, nets, hands and fists, ropes, cloth, and an array of equipment, but none worked. A wave of his arms sent a surge of fire burning everything to ash and blocking their path. We need someone with a water quirk. Water hose. Get rid of this fire. There must be a way to capture him. Make sure the boy stays unharmed. Shadow fought for control, but the slime villain stayed within his body, refusing to come out. As long as it was inside, he couldn't do anything about the villain's actions. He could only watch with dread and horror as his quirk caused so much pain and trouble for the heroes who were trying to save him. No, more like trying to stop him. Because all of this was his fault. The damage, death, disaster were all caused by his quirk. If only he didn't have such a quirk. If only he was like Fayumi who was born with only his mother's ice quirk. Yumi Li Chan. The memory of her falling onto the ground from hundreds of feet high resurfaced in his mind. I need you, Ni Chan, Shadow. The ring of fire encircling them vanished as a familiar figure charged through, leaving a trail of ice behind her. White hair with red streaks, glasses, blood dripping down her forehead and arms, staining her white blouse and blue jeans. Yumi Ni Chan. A wave of relief washed away all other negative thoughts when Shadow saw his sister coming to his rescue. He wanted to tell her how relieved he was to see her, how terrified he was, and how much he missed everyone. He wanted to smile and cry and hug her. But all he did was increase the temperature and send a torrent of the fire that killed so many innocent people towards his very own sister. Araru. Shadow had never been so desperate to talk. He thrashed wildly, causing some slime to leak out of his mouth. A second of control was all he needed to shout out, run. Ni Chan. But she didn't stop. Slime filled his airway yet again, cutting off his words. Thanks, Shouto. But I'm not running away this time. Fayumi wiped off the blood that was leaking into her eyes, knocking her glasses askew. I've been running away my entire life and I'm tired of it. It's time for me to fulfill my duty. She swiped her arm in front of her. 
The path connecting her to Shouto instantly turned into ice, crawling up his foot and immobilizing him. Did you forget what quirk your brother has? The villain mocked as his left leg burned with fire, melting the ice coating his feet. His fire may eventually be stronger than mine, but don't forget. More ice spiked up around him, entangling around his feet, legs, running up his torso and arms. He's just a child, and right now, my ice is stronger than his fire. Shouto could tell the villain was struggling from the way his left side burned like never before. But even when the fire pouring out had gone well over the peak temperature his current body could handle, the ice restraining him refused to melt. The villain roared in anger when more ice climbed up his body, adding another layer to the ice straitjacket. He was glaring at Fayumi with such intensity for a second Shouto was convinced that his left eye would start shooting out fire. Everything below his neck was completely frozen. Shouto felt his lips curl into a scowl as ice ran up his neck and up his face. I'm sorry, Shouto. This is the only thing I can do right now. This was the last thing he heard and saw before ice covered his head, layers on top of layers. Outside noises dimmed and his own eyes stared back at him. The villain didn't give up, continued forcing fire out of his body to no avail. There was no space between his skin and the ice for fire to exist. The moment a flicker appeared, it'd get vanquished by ice. Eventually the villain gave up, stepping back and returning control over to Shouto. The feeling of ice on his overheated left side felt so comfortable Shouto closed his eyes and allowed his mind to drift off into a blissful sleep. All Might showed up not long after she trapped her brother and the villain in ice. Per his request, she melted her ice using her fireside and he quickly grabbed onto Shouto, punching the air past him and blowing the villain out of his body. You're like a hero, Shouto told her when he was finally free as he hugged her with all his might, burying his ice-cold face into her warm body. Heroes immediately circled around them, guiding them towards the House of Doom where Rei, Natsuo, and Taoya bombarded them with questions and concern upon seeing the team of pro heroes flanking them. Fayumi explained the situation to them as quickly as possible while the medical personnel checked over Shouto, making sure he was okay. Thankfully, he ended up with only a minor fever and light burning on his left side which could be healed rather quickly with a few days of rest and some burn treatment ointment that they had stocked up inside their house. Shouto didn't talk much on the way home. He merely clung onto Fayumi's arm as if his life depended on it and curled next to her in the backseat, the seatbelt being the only thing separating them. Natsuo and Taoya, for once, kept quiet and gave him some space. The silence lasted until they arrived home and opened the front door, revealing Endeavor's large, burly body blocking the entrance. Who told you you can go to amusement parks with them? The question was directed towards Shouto. Her brother tightened his grip on her sleeves and cowered behind her, fearful eyes avoiding their father's furious ones. You think I wouldn't know? It's all over the internet. Your embarrassing defeat against that weak villain, who all might defeat it in a single punch. A mere villain was able to use my power better than you can, which just shows how much training you're lacking. And yet, you thought it was a good idea to go off with these. These failures and play instead of train. You should feel ashamed. Shouto flinched with every toxic criticism. His small body continued shrinking behind her legs until only the white half of his bi-colored hair was visible. Fayumi gritted her teeth and took the extra step needed to completely shield him from the view. Stop it, father. Endeavor turned his burning gaze to her, and Fayumi fought so hard not to flinch. This was the second time her father stared at her right in the eyes ever since she was born. How long had she been hoping he would direct his attention away from Shouto and onto the rest of his siblings? To look them right in the eyes because they were his children and they existed, too. But this wasn't what she wanted. The rage and disappointment in his eyes weren't what she wished for. Move. He shoved past her and yanked Shouto, thankfully, by his right arm. We're going to train. Now, to make up for all the training you missed today. Your loss against the villain showed just how weak you are. And how you need to train much more than before. If you can't even defeat a weak villain, you'll never be able to defeat All Might. No. Father, stop. Shouto gripped her sleeves with as much strength as he could muster as Endeavor dragged him into the house. His entire body was shaking. Tears flowing freely down his cheeks as he screamed his throat raw. The fear in his eyes were much, much worse than when he was taken over by the villain. Natsuo and Talia stood there, probably too afraid to do anything. They'd most likely never seen Endeavor like this before. Rei stepped forward trying to stop Endeavor, but Fayumi beat her to it. Warmth covered her from head to toe as thousands of images raced in her mind. From the villain attacking Shouto, to her falling down the ferris wheel, to her crawling out of the iceberg with fresh cuts all over her body, to the burned corpses and fallen buildings surrounding Shouto. All of this was her fault. Be thankful of your parents that you didn't get your father's quirk, because otherwise, I would have to take over your body. If only she had made it known what her quirk was. If only she had stopped hiding a long time ago. This wouldn't have happened. Shouto wouldn't have suffered for so long in her stead. Fire suddenly burst out of her body, shocking everyone present. Shouto had to see his own power become the cause of so much death and destruction. 
He had to watch the villain commit murder using his quirk while not being able to do anything to stop it. Fayumi herself almost puked upon seeing the charred corpses and smelling the burning flesh. She could only imagine how much worse Shadow had had it. That hopelessness and trauma must have still remained within him. And yet, Endeavor wanted him to train his fireside after everything that had happened, to remind him of what his quirk was capable of. Unforgivable. In the next instant, Endeavor was forced to let go of Shadow's arm as a torrent of blue and orange flame engulfed him. Fayumi quickly pulled Shadow behind her, her gray eyes darkening when she saw the bruise in the shape of a hand on his arm. Endeavor appeared unfazed after he covered the fire with his own. Getting over his initial shock, he snarled, You think this can harm me? Before cuts appeared all over his body, blood staining his clothes. How? Ignoring him, Fayumi turned to Shadow. Chu chan I'm sorry you had to suffer because your sister was a coward. You don't have to be afraid anymore, because I will be taking back my own burden. How did you do that? You're not supposed to have fire. But I do, Fayumi calmly stated, turning to Endeavor. I've had fire ever since my quirk first manifested when I was four. You weren't there to see it, because you assumed my quirk would be ice due to my hair color. After that, I wasn't important to you anymore because I was a failure, which is why you ignored me and didn't notice the red streaks that appeared in my hair after I received my quirk. Endeavor didn't say anything, merely listening to her with surprise evident in his heated gaze. Mom told me to keep quiet about my real quirk because she knew what you were looking for. A child with both fire and ice to keep both sides balanced. And she knew what you'd do to that child once they were born. Endeavor glanced at Ray with betrayal. His lips pulled down into his signature frown. Taoya was safe, so was Natsuo, but not Shouto. It was too obvious what his quirk would be and there was no way to hide it. And so, Shouto became your masterpiece and was subjected to the harsh training no child should ever go through. If only I had revealed what my quirk truly was. Fayumi's eyes stung but she held back the tears. Then he wouldn't have had to suffer so much. It's all my fault. Every night I hear his screams. The guilt in me would increase by tenfold. If only I took responsibility of my quirk and revealed it sooner, Shouto wouldn't have had to go though what happened today. Yumi Ni Chan. Shouto poked his head out from behind her, but Fayumi simply pushed his head back, away from their father's conflicted gaze. As you can see, both my fire and ice are currently stronger than Shouto's. Eventually, his fire might surpass mine, but his ice never will. Even so, my experience and time and training would make up for that. All my life I've been training my quirk in preparation for this reveal. My technique in using fire and ice is far advanced than Shouto's at the moment as shown in the fact that I know how to hide ice spikes in my fire without melting them. When he finally catches up to me, I'd already have obtained my hero license and started working as a pro hero. Fayumi, but you wanted to be a teacher. Fayumi turned around and smiled at her concerned mother and her shocked siblings before turning back to Endeavor with eyes hard as steel. Father, leave Shadow alone and let me be your masterpiece. What ended up happening was Endeavor didn't agree, neither did he deny. Instead, he made a bargain. If she could get accepted into UA, he would allow her to take Shouto's spot. Fayumi was already 14. In less than half a year, she would graduate middle school and become a high school student. She wasn't given much time to prepare. But fortunately, with her good grades, she only needed to work on her quirk and physique in preparation for the UA entrance exam and the tough training that followed. Getting a recommendation letter from one of her teachers would also help. All of them were shocked at first to see the diligent student who expressed no interest in becoming a hero suddenly changing her top high school choice on her future career form to UA High School, Hero Department, but they quickly accepted her change in mindset, probably comparing her to Endeavor in their minds and thinking how the daughter was merely following her father's footsteps. While she was working on her UA application, Endeavor had agreed to leave Shouto alone for the time being. Seeing him going to the therapist and coming back with a smile every week, Fayumi felt like everything was worth it. Hero was a dangerous job. Injury and death were everyday occurrences. But if her sacrificing her dream and becoming a hero could make her youngest brother smile, then she would do it. No matter what awaited her in the path ahead, she would grit her teeth and walk it heads on. Police and ambulance arrived shortly after All Might dashed towards the disaster site. Since pro heroes had to deal with the aftermath, Genji Sensei and the rest of the civilian chaperones brought everyone back to the bus while water hose and a few others with hero licenses stayed back. As an apology for the incident, all the guests were given the option to choose a mystery present on their way out, despite not having completed the scavenger hunt. The options were Pussycat's Kitty Paws, All Might's Cape, Gang Orca's Whale Plushie, and Edshot's Ninja Stars. As expected, Hitoshi chose the Kitty Paws. He wore it the moment he received it, waving it around and snarling like a wild cat. Yuuga picked All Might's cape and couldn't stop making poses as they walked towards the bus. Manami couldn't decide between the kitty paws and the plushie, so Izuku chose the kitty paws and gave it to her so she could have both. Due to the interruption, Izuku wasn't able to finish the scavenger quest. 
but since it had no time limit, he could just finish it next time he visited AMAP. On the bus ride home, everyone except Izuku fell asleep, exhausted from the event. The rattling of the bus whenever it hit a bump in the road and the soft snoring filled the small, humid interior of the vehicle. Serenity was hard to come by in YHP where dozens of boisterous children participate. Instances like this should be well taken advantage of. Shifting slightly into a more comfortable position, Izuku pulled up his profile page to check the stats. He currently had 21,400 EXP, which came from the AMAP survival quests, missing cat quest, failure to stop quest, and the daily quests he completed for this week. Talking about daily quests, he had totally forgotten about it today. After everything that had happened, he supposed he deserved a break. Izuku couldn't help but chuckle giddily when he saw metal control next to the word quirk. He was finally one step closer to his dream. He continued scrolling down. Two attribute points, his luck was 7. And he had 4751 rep points including a Gola, what's a negative rep point? Izuku pondered when he saw plus one negative rep point in parentheses. Gola popped into existence as soon as his thought was registered. Chewing away a slice of juicy bacon, it explained, right, you haven't learned about that yet. So basically, negative numbers are numbers that are smaller than zero. So it goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and then negative 1, negative 2, etc. A mental picture formed in Izuku's mind. A straight line with 0 in the middle, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right, and minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5 to the left. Izuku scratched his head, but it has the same sign as subtractions. Does that mean a negative rep point takes away a positive rep point? No, it doesn't. But why not? It's a subtraction sign, isn't it? So how come I don't lose anything? Gola's features scrunched up together as if it was constipated. Izuku wondered briefly where all that bacon went after entering its mouth. Did it even digest? You know what? Let's forget about the negatives. All you need to know is that a negative rep point is earned from nega, I mean, bad reputation. Bad reputation isn't any less than good reputation. Reputation isn't on a scale of for example 1 to 10. Gaining a negative rep point doesn't decrease anything. It's on two different scales, good and bad. And when you become more and more famous, or infamous, your number on either scale will rise. All the rep points you've earned so far are by helping people, which brings you a good reputation. What you did today, accidentally causing that bus driver to die, made him hate you in his last moment, which granted you a bad reputation point from him. To die, right, he died because of me. Izuku clenched his trousers, biting his lips as he trembled in. Fear. No, disbelief. Sort of. Or was it maybe regret? No, it was definitely not regret. That old man killed Izuku twice and almost the third time if not for his quirk. He had to die in order for Izuku to live. Yes, he may be a nice ice cream vendor, but Izuku had seen how dark this old man could be. He had died over and over again trying to protect his friends and survive. All because this old geezer wanted to run him over with that goddamn truck. Like All Might had said, no one deserved to be killed, but sometimes death was inevitable. In the end, it all came down to whether he believed their death would be beneficial or meaningless. All Might killed all for one because otherwise the villain would have killed him and caused more chaos. The old man had to die because otherwise he would have killed Izuku. It made perfect sense. Izuku did nothing wrong. Swiping that memory to the back of his head, Izuku turned his attention back to Gola. So does this mean that helping people isn't the only way to earn rep points? And you've said before that there are many more digitalizations out there, in other worlds. Has it ever happened before where a villain got their hands on digitalization and earned negative rep points by doing bad things? Gola took a while to answer. Yes, it has happened before, many times. Game of Life is a neutral system that chooses its master on random. Anyone could have gotten it. All Might, all for one, your friend Hitoshi, or even that ice cream vendor. You have chosen the path of hero, but others may not have. It's possible to walk the path of villainy with bad reputation and use those negative rep points they've earned to become even more powerful. B but that's bad. What if they earned enough rep points to buy things like, like cataclysm that destroys the entire planet? Go aside. Then the villain will either die and restart, or decide that they've had enough fun for the lifetime and die once and for all. In that case, I'll fly off to the next world to look for my next master. For a minute, Izuku just sat there staring at the metal cyclops with a dopey look, letting the information sink in. As the bus hit a particular bump in the road, Hitoshi, who was asleep next to him, slumped forward and would have hit his head against the seat in front of him if Izuku didn't pull him back so he could lean against his shoulders, absent-mindedly playing with Hitoshi's purple locks. Izuku rested his head against the head cushion as he thought about Gola's words. He knew how dangerous the items in the bazaar could be and how terrifying it would be if it landed in the wrong hands, hence why he took extra precautions to ensure no one discovered his secret. 
But not once did he think about the possibility of digitalization going to someone else initially. It had been two years since his life had been turned into a game. He had long since gotten used to this and felt like digitalization was an unparalleled part of his life, like it was his friend. To think that it could have easily become a villain's felt. Like a betrayal. What about you? You're not going to stop them. Goler rolled its eye. No, nah, my sole purpose is assisting my master in utilizing the game of life system. I am not allowed to interfere with their personal life. That would be against the rules. And too troublesome. Gola disappeared after saying this, as if it was tired of the infinite questions Izuku asked. After checking his stats, Izuku pulled up his inventory, which contained his security alarm, bike, notebooks, pencil box, four-leaf clover, flash bomb one, flash bomb two, complete set of 100 eating utensils, dragon ball, pile of poop, caterpie egg, and phone. The caterpie egg was only at 423 4111 steps. At this rate, it would hatch tomorrow at the earliest. And finally, he pulled up the integrating notification for his phone and accepted it. Immediately, a phone icon appeared in the corner of his vision, almost invisible if he didn't pay attention to it. Izuku tapped it, opening up a transparent screen identical to his Android screen. He tried a few icons, including some built-in game apps. They all worked. The only downside was that if others saw him, they'd think he was out of his mind for tapping and swiping at air. This can be controlled with your mind as well, Gola informed him conveniently. Nice. Izuku then spent the rest of the bus ride getting used to the controls. Restart, lower volume, zoom in, exit, increase brightness, switch apps, split screen, etc. At some point, Hitoshi woke up and groggily asked him why he was poking air. Izuku was then forced to use his phone to control the transparent screen, which also worked. The only app he couldn't use at the moment was the browser due to lack of Wi-Fi connection or cellular network. He would have to wait until he registered his phone and purchased a phone plan. Gola also informed him that once he reached level 20, digitalization would upgrade to level 2, which would unlock many more capabilities, including the ability to connect to any cellular network within the vicinity and orbiting satellites at the cost of reputation points. Everyone were barely awake when the bus arrived at YHP. They trudged through the gates like zombies, their movement lethargic and their eyes barely opened. Many parents were already waiting at the entrance, including Hitoshi's parents in their fancy car. When they caught sight of their son, they immediately ran over and embraced him, having heard the news of the AMAP attack. Kaioken continued murmuring I'm sorry over and over again, whether it was due to granting him the permission to visit AMAP, where he was put in danger and feeling guilty about it or something else, Izuku didn't know. But if he had to guess, it was probably the former, as encoded the same when she picked him up. Izu-chan. She cried as she hugged him. I'm sorry for letting you go on this trip. I didn't know the villains were going to attack. Are you okay? You're not hurt, are you? Seeing the fear and guilt in her eyes, Izuku just couldn't bring himself to tell her the truth. She would definitely blame herself for signing the permission slip which consequently led to his suffering in the time loops. Don't worry, mom. I'm not hurt. Izuku broke away from the hug and put a big, reassuring smile on his face as he jumped up and down. See, I'm fine. And guess what? I also won a phone and got my quirk today. Look. He pulled out his phone and made it fly around in the air. That only caused Inko to break into a teary smile as she almost crushed him with her bare hug. The teachers apologized profusely to the angry parents before they left. This wasn't the first time the YHP kids were put in danger, and the parents demanded an explanation. Inko was disappointed as well, but Izuku managed to reassure her that the teachers were doing their best, that no one could have foreseen something like this would happen, and usher her away from the other angry parents. Izuku excitedly showed her his quirk the moment they arrived home. He explained how he thought for a week and finally decided upon metal control. It was the most versatile and best for both offense and defense. After testing out a bit, he found out that at his level, he could only move small metal objects like silverware, scissors, keys, and kitchen knives. He could almost move a pot, but his control slipped and it would have broken if not for Inko's pulling it towards her at the last minute. Now that he realized how much training he was lacking, it really dawned on him how stupid he was for attempting to stop that truck with a quirk he had just received. To celebrate his receiving his quirk, Inko decided to take him out for dinner. On their way to the buffet, they stopped by a service provider and bought him a phone plan. Izuku wanted to chose the cheapest plan since he was just a kid who didn't really have anyone to call, except Minami, the only one who had a phone out of all his friends. And if he needed to use the internet he could just use Inko's computer. But Inko decided against it and bought a family plan, saying how they lived in the information age where a phone would be useful regardless of his age. After that, they went to the buffet which costed 6,000 yen for adults and 4,000 for age 12 and under. It was ridiculously expensive, but Inko didn't even bat an eye as she swiped her credit card, saying how he deserved it and what else should she do with her money. Leave it in the bank to rot. 
That got Izuku laughing as they each picked up a plate and began piling food onto it. Dinner was spent stuffing their mouths with food and brainstorming ideas for Izuku's hero costume and signature moves. He had created tons of ideas growing up, but now that he had a quirk, he would have to tweak them to fit it. Izuku also declared that he wanted to apply for UA High School when the time came. He had talked about it many times before, but this time he was serious. And with a quirk, he felt like his goal wasn't out of his range. Inko merely smiled as she voiced her encouragement. She even offered to sew him his desired hero costume if he made it in, as an incentive. That night, Izuku went to sleep with a content smile on his face and a bright future in his mind. Your luck has changed to one due to a decision you've just made. Vraru um, move out of my fucking way. Prun, ahhh. His bedroom door burst open, light filtering into his room and piercing through the darkness. Tangled in his comforter, Izuku writhed and gasped as phantom pain knocked all other thoughts aside. Tingling sensation spread all over his body. His midsection felt as if flame had licked over it and his head felt as though something was crawling inside it. The ghostly touches caused goosebumps to erupt all over his skin as the old man's sickening voice echoed in his head, non-stop. Izu-chan, are you okay? A warm hand touched his forehead then pulled his small body out of the comforter and into a warm chest. Izuku opened his eyes when he felt hair prickling his cheeks. Pressed tightly against his mother, he started to weep. Inko patted his back while whispering soothing words to his ears, even though she herself was trembling with unease. He stopped crying when the cold, cruel voice quieted down. But he didn't break out of the hug. He needed his mother's warmth right now. Izuku, do you want to talk about it? Izuku hid his face into the crook of her neck, grasping her shirt tightly. It would be nice to have someone to talk to after everything he had gone through, but he didn't want to worry her or make her feel guilty. Worst of all, he didn't want her to think YHP was a dangerous program and make him quit. He loved his friends and he wanted to stay with them. None of them went to his school so YHP was the only place he could meet them at. He did have their contact information, but hanging out after school and on the weekends was different from being heroes together. What he had just experienced was just a simple nightmare, nothing more. Izuku had plenty of nightmares before, and they all went away after a few days. Inko was well aware of that. There should be nothing to worry about this time. I'm fine, mom. Izuku sighed as he pulled away from the hug wiping away the remnant tears and forcing a smile onto his face. I just had a nightmare about what happened today, but I'm sure it's fine. It'll go away very quickly. Inko wanted to press on, but Izuku reassured her that everything was fine and he was too strong to be defeated by a simple nightmare. In the end, she didn't ask any more questions but she did make him sleep with her for the rest of the night. The next morning, Izuku woke up a little sleep-deprived. The nightmare didn't haunt him after he went back to sleep again. But he still couldn't shake off the strange tingling sensation and the old man's words continued ringing in his head, hoping a little heroic work would make him forget about the AMAP incident, albeit temporarily. And Ko took him on a daily quest hunt early in the morning. Izuku missed the one yesterday, so he worked extra hard today. They spent three hours hunting and only stopped when lunchtime hit and both of their stomachs were grumbling in protest. Three hours of walking around town had earned him more than enough steps for the egg to hatch. On the Pokemon icon in his inventory was the timer 5. Izuku sat on the couch in the living room tentatively while his mom prepared lunch. Arararararidining. Izuku jumped, scouring around the living room looking for the source of the noise only to find nothing. He only came to realization when Inko didn't react to the noise and noticed the phone icon in the corner of his vision had turned red for the first time. It was almost transparent which was why he had overlooked it many times. He tapped the phone icon and selected answer call on the alert that popped up. Hello, Izuku. It's me, Minami. Minami-chan. How did you get my number? Your mom gave it to me. Anyway, I need to ask you something. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, she continued in a hurry. So I just came back from my monthly check at the doctor and they said that extra joint in my toe is gone. According to them, that means my quirk must have already manifested but I don't know when. The doctor asked me if I experienced anything strange in the past 30 days but I don't remember anything like that. Izuku, have you noticed anything weird about me? I haven't but... Izuku suddenly remembered the strange power that coursed through his body when he attempted to use metal control for the first time. He never understood why his power suddenly increased. He just assumed it was because he was in a pinch and he experienced what many called the adrenaline rush. Something weird happened to me yesterday. My quirk actually manifested when that truck was charging towards me. It's metal control, and I tried to move that truck with it, but I couldn't. It was too heavy for me at the moment. And then suddenly, after you yelled out my name, I feel a foreign power enter my body and then I can move the truck. You saw what happened. The air between me and the truck just exploded. I'm not sure if this would help but I hope it would. Maybe your quirk has something to do with your voice. Hmm, I dunno, but I'll ask the doctor about it. Thanks Izuku. And she hang up. 
Alert! Your will hatch in less than 30 seconds. Please make sure you've taken out the item before the countdown reaches zero. 30, 29, 28. Slamming down the receiver none too gently, Izuku flopped down onto the carpet and materialized the egg into his hand, almost dropping it in surprise. The egg was larger than he imagined, oval-shaped and around the size of a volleyball. It had pale green spots scattered over the shell and felt slightly warm in his hand. And if he wasn't mistaken, he could feel something move under the surface. This was supposed to be a caterpillar, right? So why was its egg so abnormally big? How big would the caterpillar be? Izuku could already see a giant green slimy caterpillar crawling out of the egg like a scene from some R-rated horror movie trailer. Suppressing a shudder, he gently placed the egg onto the carpet and added a sheet of paper towel underneath it as an afterthought. 5. 4. 3. Izuku hitched his breath, eyes wide and unblinking, his palms sweating against his trousers. 2. 1. A crack formed on its shell, branching out into spiderwebs and covering the entire egg. Crack. A piece chipped off. Gel-like liquid oozed out of the hole. Squelch. A flash of green in the sea of darkness. Crack. 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 Two red antennae wiggled out, followed by two bulging black eyes around the size of an 100 yen coin. Its body, green and shaped like a string of beads, squirmed out of the gap. Yellow rings rimmed its bland eyes and decorated each respective segment of its form. Looking closely, Izuku could see tiny furs covering its skin, slick with the fluid that filled the egg. With a quiet plop, the caterpie tipped over the egg and landed on the paper towel, soaking it slightly. Thankfully, the paper towel was thick enough to absorb the fluid so it wouldn't touch the precious carpet underneath. Caterpie blinked dazedly, then looked around as if it were confused with its surroundings. After a moment, it looked up at Izuku, large watery eyes glinting with curiosity. Pulse racing with excitement, Izuku bent down at eye level with the bug and goggled at it in all directions. He was surprised to find himself not afraid or disgusted by this giant caterpillar. Izuku was always squeamish when it came to bugs, especially soft-bodied bugs. He was okay with beetles and the like since they looked cool, with those hard shells and whatnot. They were like armored warriors, but soft, wiggling bugs like worms, maggots, caterpillars. Yuck. He thought having a giant caterpillar as a pet would creep him out, but he was wrong. Staring at the foot-long green and yellow caterpie that continued to blink cutely at him, Izuku only had one thought in mind. He wanted to cherish it. A strange, foreign feeling bloomed in his chest. Something akin to his love for his mother and his fondness for his friend, but also slightly different. He felt like he had known it for years, like it was his siblings, his family, like it was blood-related to him. He wanted to protect it, and anyone who messed with it would be messing with him. He wanted to smooch and cuddle with it so tightly they would be together forever and ever and nothing would come between them. Almost without thinking, Izuku reached out his hand and caressed Caterpie's head, squealing out loud when the soft, smooth texture melted his heart. Caterpie squeezed one eye shut as it whined softly, more like a child's whimper than anything Izuku had ever heard of coming from a bug. Hi, Izuku said as he continued stroking its head gently, I'm Izuku, and you'll be catty. Instantly, Caterpie's eyes narrowed. A foul, spoiled cheese odor permeated the air as pink wisps of smoke dispersed from its glowing antennae and loops. It wasn't until many hours later after Izuku and his angry mom had done what they could to rid the smell and calm down Caterpie enough so it would begrudgingly stop puffing out smoke did he cast an observe over the butt. Oh, it was a male. Turned out that fondness he felt for Caterpie, who he now named Pie, was due to the master-pet relationship tying them together. All pets that he hatched would be tied to him like those blood bonds in games. He couldn't sell them, trade them, or give them away. They were like his children and they saw him as their parent. Pai still seemed angry hours later during dinner. It barely touched the leaf Izuku placed in front of it, taking only a few bites in contrast to what its description entailed. Caterpie has a big appetite and can eat up to 100 leaves a day. And when Izuku tried to pet it, it avoided the hand with a sulky look in its eyes and dashed up the wall, clinging onto the ceiling using those suction cups on its feet. Inko thought it was cute and couldn't stop taking pictures of it, but Izuku could only sigh and stare at the inadequate stats. Name, Pai. Title, Caterpie. Species, Worm Pokemon. Level, 1. Affection level, 0. Fullness points, 0. Enjoyment points, 0. Feeding gained fullness points. Cutting gained enjoyment points. Collect points to level up affection. The higher the affection level, the more love Caterpie held towards him. And when affection reached level 2, he could start feeding it candies to level up so it could become stronger and evolve. But first, he needed to figure out how to get it off the ceiling. After dinner, he helped Inko clean the dishes. By the time he was done, Pai had gotten down the ceiling and the leaf was gone. When Izuku moved to wipe away the bit of leaf hanging out of its mouth, Pai turned its head away with a soft HMPH. Come on, let's get you washed up. Izuku picked it up gently and cradled it like a baby. Its skin was still sticky after hatching and there was no way Izuku would let it roam around the house getting slime everywhere. 
As he made his way towards the bathroom, he petted Pi while carefully avoiding its antennae. Pi's large black eyes were barely open, its whole body relaxing and practically melting in his arms. Izuku smiled fondly. Hey, don't fall asleep yet. Just ten more minutes, K. Okay. Pai mewled and nuzzled into Izuku's chest, its eyes almost completely shut. Reaching the door, Izuku nudged it open with his foot and placed Pai into the bathtub. He climbed onto the edge of the tub, holding the wall for balance as he pulled the shower head off of its holder. A heavy steam of water splattered onto the ceramic tiles as he turned the dial. The bottom of the tub quavered, causing Pai to jerk awake and curl into itself. Izuku quickly pressed the diverter, turning the dial on the shower head to the misting spray selection. He washed away the sludge coating Pai's body as fast as he could after realizing it was afraid of the sound. Pai was already sound asleep when Izuku dried it with a towel and proceeded to carry it onto his bed. At that moment, Inko poked her head into his room. How's it doing? She said as she came up to him, kneeling next to the bed and staring dotingly at the caterpillar, who was fast asleep on the red, blue, and yellow colored comforter. I don't think it likes me yet, but I'm working on it. Izuku glanced at its stats. So far, I only earned one fullness point, which leveled its affection up to level 1. It may not be much, but at least it's eating and not starving itself. That makes me happy. Inko ruffled his hair. You're doing a great job taking care of it so far. Keep it up. It may be a bug, but it's still a part of our family. Be nice to it. Of course, Izuku blinked when two hands came up to his face and pinched his cheeks, stretching them slightly so as to not hurt him. But before taking care of others, first you need to take care of yourself. Inko let go of his cheeks and placed her hand on his back, gently nudging him towards the door and chuckling. Go take a shower. Yurik. Mom. Izuku whined but did as he was told. That night, he cuddled Pai as he slept. In the darkness, the smooth, squishy body of the caterpillar was his only comfort. Izuku held it against his chest but not too tight so he wouldn't cause it any discomfort. The hug was heavenly, warm and cozy, like the feeling of home and love and sunshine. Even as flashes of death tore his mind apart and pain flickered all over his body, the warmth seeping through his skin was enough to shove all that sensations away. The nightmares may continue to haunt him, but as long as he had pie, everything would be okay. Together, there was nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, because together, they were the strongest. Sunlight pierced through the opened window, providing the students with another source of vexation on top of staying in one spot and listening to their teacher's wearisome voice for an hour. Izuku lay his head on his folded arms, adjusting his position so the student to the left of him would block the incoming sun rays, making sure Yama-sensei had his back turned towards the student as he wrote three English sentences on the board. Izuku pulled up his inventory and made a piece of dippin' dots appear right inside his mouth. The ice cream dot melted as soon as it touched his tongue, mouth hidden behind his arms. Izuku kept his face passive as he swirled his tongue around his mouth before swallowing. He felt the coolness immediately, sliding down his throat and spreading throughout his body. He let out a content sigh. Yama-sensei continued droning in the front of the classroom, not noticing a thing. Kakin continued glaring at him from a distance away, hopefully not noticing a thing. And Gamu kicked his chair lightly from behind. Psst. P.S.S.S. Izuku. He kicked the chair again. Hey. What? Izuku hissed, barely moving his lips and keeping his eyes trained on the teacher. Give me some dip in dots too. It's hot. Izuku felt a finger poke his back. He reached out discreetly and accepted the 100 yen placed on his palm. He closed his hand around it, and when he opened his hand, the coin was gone and was replaced by a bag of frozen dipping dots. Nice. His friend grabbed the bag as swiftly as a cat would steal away its food. Moments later, Izuku could hear quiet munching noises from the seat behind him and he smiled. Gamu was one of the classmates who befriended him after he started his part-time job as a sweet vendor. Perhaps it was due to his being the son of Princess Bubblegum. He had a pink, puffy, bob hairstyle and loved gum as much as Izuku loved pie. He chewed gum during class every single day, no matter how many times he got caught and his hero mother was called into the school to be notified of his actions, he continued his belligerent behavior. Eventually, the teachers stopped calling him out, whether because they were tired of having their class sessions interrupted every day and knew the boy would never change, or because Gamu's skills in discreet chewing had gotten higher, Izuku didn't know. But he did know that selling gum to Gamu would earn him money, even if those gum often ended up exploding and sticking to the back of his head. As the person who could make all types of gum appear in his hand magically, without a doubt he became Gamu's best friend. The boy stuck to him like a piece of gum, following him everywhere he went, even to the restroom. It became a little annoying as time flew past, especially recently when he had stuff to do during break. Swallowing another piece of dip and dots, Izuku glanced at the inventory and winced when he saw the caterpie icon quiver violently. Three days had passed since Pi had hatched. 
In these three days, Izuku had managed to earn 12 points including the one feeding point he earned on Sunday night. On Monday morning, Inko took him to see the doctor and confirm his quirk. He fed Pai before they left, only to find the house shrouded in foul, pink fog when they returned. Pai didn't like being left alone in the house, but they had no other choice. So when Izuku went to school, he would store it in his inventory and release it during breaks. Pai was still grumpy, as shown in the way its icon quivered like it was having a seizure, but it was starting to accept its new lifestyle and only quivered when break was near. As predicted, the bell rang minutes later, signaling the end of class and the beginning of lunch. Yama-sensei let out a long sigh and trudged his way out of the door, grumbling about getting some coffee and painkillers. Izuku grabbed his box lunch and made his way towards the door, intending to find an isolated spot to release Pai, only to halt when a figure skidded to a stop before him. I saw it. The boy yelled, gold eyes flashing with amusement. He wiped away a strand of black hair that fell into his eyes from the speed of his movement and pointed his finger at Izuku, then at Gamu. You gave him ice cream during class. Izuku stared at him for a while longer to remember his name. Black hair, gold eyes, electricity, Raiden. He remembered. That was the boy's name. Gamu's other best friend, local troublemaker, can shoot out tiny bolts of electricity from his fingertips, loves to zap people for fun. He was more Gamu's friend than Izuku's, but Izuku still maintained a healthy relationship with him. If you don't want me to tell Yama-sensei, then give me some for free, Raiden quipped, a smirk playing on his lips. Same to you, Izuku replied. Raiden blinked confusedly. The principal's still looking for the culprit who killed his fish. I remember seeing a certain someone sneak into his office when he was away and messing with his fish tank. Ah shut up shut up shut up. Raiden waved his hands around frantically. His face instantly turning ashen. W what are you talking about? Aha dot 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 h a h i. I have no idea what you're talking about. Ooh, I have to go? Yeah, I gotta go. Izuku and Gamu laughed as Raiden bolted away, brushing past Kakin on his way out of the classroom. Even though Izuku didn't interact with the boy much, every interaction they did have always ended in a mirthful manner. Their laughter was cut short when Kakin stormed up to Izuku with his hands stuffed in his pockets, scowling and slouching like a delinquent. Deku, yes, Izuku responded, his body straightening up almost in reflex. Kakin had been a little nicer to him ever since he started selling sweets and became the center of attention in his class. And after Izuku revealed his quirk to the class after his clinic visit on Monday, Kakin talked to him even less, only glaring at him from afar. I heard about last Saturday. Oh oh, oh, Kakin paused for a minute at least, his features scrunched up like he was having an inner conflict. So you finally got a quirk, eh? Metal control. Lame. Not flashy at all. With a quirk like that, you're still weaker than me, Deku. Out of the corner of his eyes, Izuku caught Gamu clenching his fist and lips curling in fury. How did you get your quirk, I wonder? What exactly happened to you at Kakin? Izuku grimaced. I don't want to talk about that right now. If you're just here to insult me, then can we do it later? I'm busy. I'm not here to. Izuku tuned him out, standing up and walking past Bakugo, leaving the classroom. After making sure Gamu wasn't following him, Izuku stopped by the side of the school building where many bushes resided. He glanced around just to be extra cautious then dived into the bushes, releasing Pi. PFF it released a small wisp of pink smoke as soon as it got out, already expecting this act of rebellion. Izuku held his breath and jumped back, waiting for the odor to clear. Few seconds later, he exhaled heavily and picked up Pi, who squirmed slightly in protest. I know, I know. Sorry, you know I can't leave you at home or let you roam around by yourself. It's too dangerous. What if someone finds out? Izuku soothed in a soft voice as he petted its head. Pi nuzzled against his hand, eyes closing in bliss. I can't have you get hurt. You're important to me, Pi. So please just endure this. I promise I'll feed you your favorite vermilion flower sometimes, maybe this weekend. I'll get you as many as you want, but in return, you'll have to stay still during my school hours. Deal? Two. Plus one enjoyment point. Seeing that cute smile always warmed his heart. Izuku brought it closer to a bush with large leaves and set it on the ground. Here you go. There's your lunch. Eat as many as you want. Make sure you're full. As Pai dug its head into the leaves and started chewing away, Izuku sat down next to the bush and opened up his own box lunch. Lunch was quiet and peaceful, just the way Izuku liked it. He missed his friend's chatters at YHP, but eating by himself sometimes wasn't so bad. The side of the school was shaded by the building that blocked the sun. Cool breeze ruffled his hair, sneaking into his shirt and puffing it up slightly. Izuku closed his eyes and embraced the wind that whistled past his ears. He took a deep breath that smelled like trees and nature and freedom, and let it out slowly. All his stress seemed to exit through his mouth along with the air. It was instances like this that made Izuku wish he had a quirk that could freeze time. 
Maybe he could get one in the future. Maybe. Glancing at his watch, Izuku began packing away the lunchbox at a moderate pace. He had 10 minutes before the end of lunch. He could make it. Pai. Piyu. It's time to go. A few seconds later, Pai wiggled out of the bush, small pieces of leaves hanging out of its mouth. Izuku chuckled as he helped wipe them away. Plus one fullness point. Come on, let's go. Izuku held out his hand, but Pai shook its head, staring hard at the ground with eyes that seemed to be tearing up. Izuku tried again. Come on, we made a deal, remember? I'd buy you vermilion flour if you behaved. We only have a few hours left. I'll try to release you during break between the classes. So come on, time to go into the inventory. Still hesitant, Pai shuffled forward begrudgingly. It almost touched Izuku's hand before a yell came out of nowhere, causing it to jerk back. Holy shit, what the hell is that monstrous thing? Izuku immediately recognized the voice. How could he not? After all these years of hearing insult after insult from that voice, he could feel his heartbeat picking up as he turned and yelled, No, Kaken. It was too late. Get away from that monster, Deku. Izuku didn't expect the intensity of the explosion that was thrown at him. Kaken had tried to intimidate him with explosions before, but those were all small blasts and sparks. Something like this. Izuku could feel the rush of heat assaulting his skin before it even hit him, was done with killer intent behind it. Izuku rolled out of his way in reflex, only realizing after he had dodged that the explosion wasn't aimed at him. Kaken didn't like him, but he would never kill Izuku. There could only be one target. Alarm ringing in his ears, Izuku sprung onto his feet, breath hitching as the smoke cleared, revealing the charred ground before him. His body turned cold, limbs stiffened, noises muffled, and his gut churned as the metallic smell of blood reached his nose. Chunks of green and red decorated the scorched ground like some kind of sick, Christmas joke. By his feet lay a segment of Pai's separated body, staining the grass. Its eyes, wide with the fear of its final moments, bore unseeingly into Izuku, as if questioning him, Why didn't you save me? Why did you leave me here? Izuku's hand shook. He almost touched Pai. He could have saved it, but he didn't. He only cared about himself and didn't bother bringing Pai with him when he dodged. Crack. Something inside him broke. The sound of glass shattering echoed in the dark corner of his mind. His vision turned red, like blood. The grass, the sky, the remains, all stained with blood. Pai's blood. But in a second, everything turned back to normal. And then, again, for a second, his world was stained with blood and continued switching back and forth like a glitch in the game. A notification popped up and Izuku dismissed it without even reading what it said. His gaze trailed from the blood on the ground to the culprit behind it all. Something roared inside of him like a raging beast, thrashing against the chains that kept it contained, hungry for destruction. Anger boiled in his system, as hot as lava, causing blood to rush to his head and building up a heavy pressure between his pounding eardrums. His feet turned cold, his hands twitching violently like a lunatic itching to wrap his fingers around that pale, fragile neck and squeeze it until his anger ran out. Izuku didn't know how many minutes he had spent just standing still, staring at the murderer with ashen blonde hair, a gleeful smirk on his face, and taunting red eyes, burning it all to his memory and not leaving out a single detail. His vision continued to flash in shortening intervals, faster and faster. And soon, the world was completely red. More notifications popped up and Izuku dismissed them as well and instead focused on suppressing his anger. He was fully aware of the dozens of dark thoughts whispering in his mind and the repercussions of him acting upon those voices. He could end up saying things he didn't mean or doing stuff he had been fantasizing for years. It would feel good, but surely he would regret it later on. What are you looking at, idiot? Akugo's bitter voice jerked him out of focus. The raging waves of anger came rushing back at full force. I just saved your life. Do you know what would have happened if a bug that big bites you? It was so close to your hand. You should have been more careful, Deku. Like I said, even if you have a quirk now, you're still weaker than me. How would you defeat that with metal control, huh? Pull down an airplane from the sky and smash into it. Don't make me laugh. Back you go. Izuku whispered, his body trembling like never before. He clenched his hands into tight fists, not even feeling the pain as his nails broke skin. The red darkened, morality and heroic qualities thrown out of the window. Only one thought remained on his mind. He wanted this person to feel pain. Eat shit, asshole. The F. Beck Hugo began but was silenced as a pile of poop landed right into his mouth. Ignoring the retching sound from his currently most hated person in the entire universe, Izuku took out the security alarm from the inventory, the first birthday gift Beck Hugo had ever given him, and threw it at Beck Hugo with as much force as he could muster before running back to the school, stepping into the classroom at the same time the bell rang. Beck Hugo didn't come back to the classroom. Yama-sensei asked if anyone knew where he was but no one spoke up. Gamu nudged Izuku with his foot, saying how he was pretty sure Bakugo followed him out of the classroom, but Izuku merely shook his head because he didn't trust his voice at the moment. 
He was trying his hardest to hold back his sobs. And if he were to speak right now, tears would probably flow out along with his words. He kept his head down as class began. The ringing in his ears was gone and his vision stopped flashing red. The anger dissipated and only then did he feel the pain when his nails broke skin. Not wanting to cause a scene, he merely licked the wounds and bandaged them with a few band-aids from the bazaar. The blood tasted like metal and reminded Izuku of that times when he had to get his teeth pulled at the dentist. He swallowed thickly and washed down the taste with a few mouthful of water, but the saltiness still remained. Izuku pulled up the notifications he dismissed earlier and glanced at one of them, trying to read what it said but somehow the words couldn't reach his brain. By the time he had read the same sentence three times, he gave up and folded his arms on the desk, hiding his face behind them. Thousands of emotions ran through him, but the one that stood out was disappointment. Ever since he first met Bakugo, Izuku thought the blonde, daring kid was cool and amazing and strong like a hero. He could do so many things little Izuku never dared to do, like standing up for himself when confronted by a group of older kids. Bakugo was strong and he always won, just like All Might. When Izuku thought of victory, he thought of All Might's signature grin and Bakugo's confident smirk. Izuku wanted to be just as strong as Bakugo. He looked up to him, befriended and followed him around, hoping that one day he would become just like Bakugo and be one step closer to reaching All Might. Bakugo was as strong as a hero, but he was no hero, and Izuku was disappointed at him for not inheriting heroic qualities. He was also disappointed at himself for choosing the wrong role model. Halfway through the lesson, Bakugo barged through the door with enough force to topple a bull. His head was tilted down but his furious, red eyes were glowering straight ahead with so much hatred and fury behind them, scowling at the class and settling down on Izuku. Bakugo gritted his teeth as smoke seeped out of the hand that was clenched onto the door frame. He was seething as if he were about to start a fight with Izuku right in the middle of class before turning to Yama-sensei as if he just realized the teacher was here. Bakugo-kun, please go back to your seat. You're already late. Don't interrupt the class and get yourself in more trouble, said Yama-sensei in his usual, dull voice. He didn't seem to like Bakugo very much. Bakugo glared at the teacher for a few seconds before slamming the door shut and marching back to his seat. As he stormed past Izuku, Izuku could smell the distinct odor of feces in the air and he had to suppress a giggle. Revenge was sweet. The class session continued in this tense atmosphere. Everyone was visibly rigid and afraid to even move a muscle, as if the tiniest little sound would tick off Bakugo. When class ended, Yama-sensei collected his stuff and told Bakugo to meet him in the staff's room before exiting the classroom. The moment the door slid shut, Bakugo jumped out of his seat before anyone could make a move and charge towards Izuku, grabbing his collar and lifting him off of the ground before he could make an escape. Deku, what the fuck's your problem? Bakugo screamed in his face, their noses inches apart. The foul smell of feces was even more obvious. Izuku held his breath so he wouldn't inhale Bakugo's breath, but that turned out to be the wrong move. Bakugo noticed, and his face darkened even more if possible. His eyes narrowed into slits, his lips curling into a twisted sneer. You dare to hold your breath, huh? Whose fault is this? I tried to save you and you. Back off. Bakugo was suddenly pushed off of him by no other than Gamu. Pink eyes glaring straight at red eyes defiantly. Gamu stood his ground in front of Izuku like a bodyguard, as sturdy as a statue, while chewing a piece of gum. Take your disgusting hands off of him, Bakugo. Gamu spit the name as if it tasted awful in his mouth. By the way, has anyone ever told you that your breath reeks? You little shit. Bakugo glowered, a cruel smile climbing onto his face as he pulled back his right arm. Watch out. Izuku cried in surprise before the explosion slammed into Gamu's face, the force shattering the window behind them but, to his surprise, Gamu stood unmoving. Guarding his face was a pink net made of bubblegum, which had taken the full blow of the attack. It'd take more than that to harm me. Gamu taunted as he chewed the gum a few times before blowing a big, pink bubble and merging it into the net, adding onto its elasticity and strength. Move out of my fucking way. This is between me and Deku. More and more explosions hit the net but none could penetrate it. Some even got deflected back to Bakugo and the rest of the class, turning the classroom into a war zone. Students screamed and ducked beneath their desks. Some cowered in the corners and some ran out to call the teacher. Being shielded by Gamu, Izuku didn't need to hide. His current spot was the safest location in this classroom. It didn't take long for the teachers to arrive and stop the fight. It didn't take a genius to figure out that Bakugo was the perpetrator and Gamu was only defending himself. Thus he was only asked a few questions as Yama-sensei tried to figure out the situation before he was let off hook. Bakugo, on the other hand, was yelled at harshly by the usually calm and collected Yama-sensei and the principal and was then jostled, as he writhed in the hold, into the staff room for further reprimanding. After he left, classmates crowded around Izuku eager to find out the reason behind this pandemonium. 
The moment the words he killed my pet left his mouth, tears started streaming down his cheeks like a waterfall, hitting the desk with enough force to topple it over. At first he clamped his mouth shut, but soon a sob escaped his tightly sealed lips. Then another, and before he realized, he was bawling his eyes out in front of all his classmates. He rushed to his cheeks in embarrassment. There was a dull thudding in the back of his head, as if a hammer was slamming against his skull. His vision swayed, toppling him off balance. He was caught by Gamu who rushed to his side, followed by the rest of his classmates. Multiple voices surrounded him, trying to comfort him and make him feel better. Some even suggested to beat the living sunlight out of Bakugo for committing murder. Feeling a little claustrophobic being surrounded by so many people, although he felt warm inside hearing all those comforting words, Izuku excused himself and left the classroom, hoping to collect himself in the infirmary. The nurse ended up excusing him for the day. Izuku rode his bike home and ran up to his room, jumping onto his bed and muffling his sobs with his pillow. Inko was at work so the house was empty, allowing him to wail as loud as he want. He cried and cried until he couldn't produce any more tears and slowly fell asleep with saltiness in his mouth. School was over. Teachers and most of the students have left the school, but one class remained seated in their respective seat. All the students had a livid expression, barely suppressing their wrath. In the front of the classroom stood a boy with a pink, puffy, bob hairstyle and pink eyes. He scanned his eyes across the faces of every individual classmates, save for one Izuku and Bakugo. Closing his eyes, Gamu took in a deep breath before declaring, We're going to make Bakugo pay. Rain splashed onto his cheeks, seeping down his neck and disappearing into his dirtied uniform. Dirty blonde hair whipped around with the wind. Katsuki stood on the outer edge of the railing, unfocused eyes staring past his toes at the hard cement so, so far away. He clenched onto the wet railing tightly, fingers going numb and teeth clattering in the cold. He wasn't afraid of height, but on a stormy day like this where he couldn't produce any sweat to fuel his explosions, a slip of foot could end his short, unsatisfying life. Trembling hands fumbling with the grip as he turned so he was facing the railing. Katsuki closed his eyes and took in a deep shaky breath to mentally prepare himself. As the rain continued beating down on his back like some kind of lashing, he opened his eyes and let go. Katsuki didn't hate Deku. Many people seemed to think the opposite, including his two sidekicks. He met Deku when he was three. Their mothers were great friends and they went to the same preschool. So as a result, they met and became friends. It was fun at first. Deku agreed with everything he said which did wonders to his ego. Deku also sucked at everything Katsuki could do, which made him feel even better about himself. Then they turned four and Katsuki got his quirk. It was an amazing, powerful quirk perfect for a hero, everyone said so. He was destined to become a strong hero and no one could deny that. Deku, however, never received a quirk. He still followed Katsuki around and remained as an ego booster, but slowly his presence started to annoy Katsuki. Katsuki had no intention of hanging out with a quirkless loser. He wanted to become strong. How could he do that when he let a weakling tag along everywhere he went? He couldn't become stronger by hanging out with weaklings. They would only drag him down as deadweight. It was the nature of survival. He started ignoring Deku, hoping to get his point across without having to outright say it. When Deku still followed him around with that stupid, hopeful smile like a loyal puppy dog, Katsuki started vocalizing his thoughts. He taunted Deku insulted, and intimidated him, hoping this would end this meaningless friendship. But no matter what he did, he couldn't get Deku off his tail. Then something happened. Something obviously happened to Deku. Because all of a sudden, he sat up straighter, talked with his head held high, and wasn't afraid to voice his opinions during classroom discussions. On top of that, he could do magic tricks. The useless Deku that he knew of would never be able to learn magic tricks and develop that charisma which he used to bewitch everyone in the class to becoming his friend. This social butterfly couldn't be Deku. Katsuki felt betrayed. Deku was supposed to be his loyal puppy dog, yet now he wouldn't follow him anymore. That nerd didn't even have to move or speak to make people flock around him like flies begging to see more magic tricks and buy sweets from him. Deku wasn't a follower now, people followed him. On top of that, what truly pissed him off was the fact that his two psychics also joined in this absurdity and no longer listened to what he had to say. When he tried insulting Deku like normal, they would stand on the side and look away, and sometimes they even dared to step in and tell him to stop. Whatever that happened to Deku had turned his whole class against him. Katsuki was frustrated and wanted answers. Since then, he would constantly watch Deku, trying to figure him out. He knew if he outright asked the nerd, he wouldn't get any answers. Or rather, honest answers, so he would observe from the back and wait for Deku to slip up. But before that could happen, he heard from Mitsuki that Deku was at a MAP when it got attacked. Katsuki had watched it on the news and could tell the severity of the attack without having to be there physically. Even now, he couldn't get the terrified cries of the burning humans out of his mind. He could only imagine what it'd be like for timid little Deku. 
On Monday, Deku wasn't at school in the morning and Katsuki instantly began panicking. What if a villain got him and he was severely injured? He may think Deku was an annoying loser, but he still grew up with that nerd and, no matter how much he tried to deny it, would definitely be affected if something did happen to him. And then Deku showed up during lunch waving around a quirk diagnosis paper and yelling about how he had a quirk now. When he turned and beamed at Katsuki as if saying I have a quirk now, sucker, all concern Katsuki had ever felt for him vanished without a trace. He felt like an idiot for worrying about Deku when all this time Deku was laughing and celebrating his quirk manifestation. He should have known the nerd would be fine. A loser like him would run away at the first sign of danger. Him being severely injured was just absurd. But despite his denial, a small part of him that saw Deku as more than a mere loser still held onto that string of concern, and that led him to noticing the tight-lipped smile when his classmates asked Deku about the incident, and the averted gaze when he was encouraged to share his story behind his quirk. Something definitely happened to the nerd at that amusement park, something that led to him developing a quirk. But what was it? What happened to Deku on Sari? Why was Deku hesitant to explain the situation that led to his quirk manifesting? And what exactly happened to Deku that caused him to change so drastically? Katsuki was desperate for answers. So desperate to the point where he thought about asking Deku directly, even if the answer may not be genuine. He just wanted to get something out of the nerd, but he didn't have a chance. Whenever break hit, Deku would either be flocked by his classmates eager to see his quirk, or he would have ran off somewhere by himself. So Katsuki waited, and waited. Wednesday hit and everyone's curiosity finally died down, and he finally found his opportunity. It was lunchtime and Deku was talking to Gold Eyes and Pinkhead. No one else. Perfect timing. Katsuki stormed his way over when Gold Eyes ran away yelling about fish or some bullshit. Deku. He yelled and Deku instantly responded like a well-trained soldier. I heard about last Seri. The whoa. Deku looked down and began fidgeting with his hands. He was nervous. Katsuki paused deliberately, thinking his questions over in his mind. If he asked too directly Deku might not answer, so he had to be discreet and roundabout. He finally decided on his usual insults, to let down Deku's guards first. So you finally got a quirk, eh? Metal control. Lame. Not flashy at all. With a quirk like that, you're still weaker than me, Deku. Deku showed no visible response, so Katsuki continued probing in his condescending tone. How did you get your quirk, I wonder? What exactly happened to you at Kaken? Izuku grimaced. I don't want to talk about that right now. If you're just here to insult me, then can we do it later? I'm busy. As he expected, Deku avoided the subject. Damn it, was that still too direct? I'm not here to. He tried explaining and getting Deku back out of his shell, but the nerd just stood up and walked out of the classroom, not even sparing him a glance. The nerve of him. Kasuki immediately ran after him but was stopped by a hand on his arm. What do you want with him? Katsuki glared at Pinkhead and shrugged off the hand, snarling, mind your own business, loser. The loser glared back as if that would stop Katsuki from chasing after Deku. Katsuki then spent the entire lunch period searching for Deku. He went to all the usual spots but the nerd was nowhere in sight. His stomach grumbled in hunger but he didn't stop for a lunch break. Concern and curiosity gnawed his mind more than his need for food. Katsuki hated not knowing things. Not knowing meant he couldn't be prepared. And he was the type to prepare meticulously before each event so he wouldn't risk not knowing something he was supposed to know or not bringing something he was supposed to bring. If there was one thing Katsuki couldn't stand, it'd be humiliation. He needed to know what the hell happened to the nerd for the small part of him deep down that still held onto a fragment of friendship throughout these years. And for the sake of his curiosity, Katsuki was never good with questions. If he didn't know something, he would figure the fuck out. Bottling up his curiosity was just not his thing. Only a coward would be satisfied with not knowing because he was too afraid to ask. He found the nerd ten minutes before lunch would end. Deku was hiding next to the side of the building where many bushes resided. Katsuki's first instinct was to mock him for failing to escape from him, and then his eyes fell on the monster. That thing had to be at least a foot long. Standing up, it could reach Deku's fucking knees. It was a giant, flaccid, squirmy green caterpillar. When it moved Katsuki could clearly see the way each segment of its body shifted against each other like a perfect cogwheel interlacement. He shivered, goosebumps erupting all over his skin in disgust. His body turned cold with horror when that monster inched towards Deku's outstretched hand. Instincts took over him and Katsuki moved before he even realized what he was doing. Holy shit. What the hell is that monstrous thing? Deku yelled something but the explosion had already left his hands. It hit the monster head on. And Katsuki let out a victorious grin when he saw its body blowing into pieces. Anyone who messes with Deku is messing with me. Only I can mess with him. A huge explosion had taken a toll on him. Katsuki had never tried an explosion to this degree and his hands shook from the lasting effect it had on him. 
He could feel the sharp sting immediately after the explosion left his hands. Numbness spread from his palms up to his elbows, kind of like how he sat on the toilet for too long and his legs went all numb. And then add a colony of fire ants to that. This was a thousand times worse than when he and Deku went out exploring the forest and accidentally stepped on a fire ant hill. Ah, uh, good times. Gritting his teeth in pain, Katsuki dropped his arms to his sides and turned his attention to Deku. The nerd was staring at the ground in total loss like he was betrayed by the world. Yeah right, as if he would know what betrayal felt like. He then stood up, hunched back and swaying slightly, and shifted his gaze onto Katsuki. And Katsuki had to force himself not to flinch. He had never seen Deku show even a tiny bit of hatred towards anyone. Not even when some dumbass middle schoolers mugged him of his precious hero collection cards back when they were four. Yet, in those eyes that were burning through his flesh, the hatred and raw anger were so strong and terrifying if he didn't know Deku he would have believed they belonged to a vindictive serial killer. When Deku didn't speak but continued drilling into his souls, Katsuki finally found his voice and broke the silence. What are you looking at, idiot? Deku blinked. I just saved your life. Do you know what would have happened if a bug that big bites you? It was so close to your hand. You should have been more careful, Deku. Like I said, even if you have a quirk now, you're still weaker than me. How would you defeat that with metal control? Huh. Pull down an airplane from the sky and smash into it. Don't make me laugh. Back you go. Deku whispered, his whole body trembling like a druggie's addiction kicking in. Katsuki waited. He wasn't expecting a thank you, considering the way Deku had just looked at him for the past minutes. But of all things he didn't expect Deku to burst out in profanities. Eat shit, asshole. That naive, cowardly, weak little Deku just fucking cursed. The F. Katsuki began but was silenced as something landed right into his mouth. The foul smell hit him immediately and Katsuki doubled over, spitting out the shit along with everything in his stomach. What the fuck? What the actual fuck? Tears glazed over his eyes as he vomited until he could taste stomach acid in his abused throat. He then fell back and backpedaled from the disgusting pile of grossness. He breathed through his mouth heavily. The taste of shit remained, making him want to kill himself right there and then. Disgusting. Utterly disgusting. Katsuki fucking hated the smell of shit. He didn't know what the fuck Deku did but he was so fucking dead. Katsuki wanted answers. And he wanted them now. Powered by rage and an urge for revenge, Katsuki picked up the thing Deku threw at him without identifying it and sprinted into the school, noting how the hallways were empty as he locked himself in a restroom. The bell must have rang a while ago when he was retching. Fucking Deku. It was all his fault. And now Katsuki had a mar on his perfect attendance record. Fuck. He rinsed out his mouth using some hand wash, gargled, spat out, and repeated the process. Thirty minutes later he finally deemed his mouth clean enough and ran back into the classroom. The entire class paused to stare at him. He glanced around until his eyes landed on Deku. The nerd was back to that innocent and ignorant look, wide-eyed and feared expression and all. The toxic hatred from earlier was gone from his clear, emerald eyes. Now, he looked like a poor lamb waiting to be slaughtered by Big Bad Katsuki. Katsuki wanted nothing more than to beat the shit out of the nerd at this moment but his violent urges were halted by the presence of their homeroom teacher. Begrudgingly, he went to his seat and proceeded to glare at the back of Deku's head for the remainder of the class. Time went by excruciatingly slow. Katsuki found himself glancing back and forth from Deku's head, to the clock, to Baldi Sensei's bald spot, to the blackboard, and back to Deku's head. Finally, after he couldn't help but accidentally singe the edges of his textbook due to the heavy grip he had on it, the bell rang signaling the end of this torture session. The moment Baldi Sensei left after telling him to head towards the staff room, that fucker, Katsuki sprang out of his seat and appeared in front of Izuku, grabbing onto his collar and screamed, Deku, what the fuck's your problem? Then that fucking nerd dared to puff out his cheeks holding his breath, how fucking dare he? And Katsuki felt all the emotions he had been holding back blow up in his mind, his face burning up in embarrassment and a sneer marring his face. He tried making Deku see reasons but then that pinkhead just had to interrupt him. What the fuck ever was his problem? Always stopping Katsuki from getting his way. What was his name again? Gum, the loser who always followed around Deku and loved to interrupt the class with his annoying chewing. By the way, has anyone ever told you that your breath reeks? Katsuki's face reddened even more if possible. How dare he? Embarrass me like this, you little shit. Bakugo growled and pulled back his right arm, ready to punch his face in and then we'll see who's boss. Heh. To his surprise that pink bastard turned his bubblegum into some kind of net and shielded himself from the explosion. That only made Katsuki even more furious as he released explosions after explosions, completely forgotten about the fact that he was still at school. None of his attacks could penetrate that blasted net and instead rebounded back towards him. He dodged, letting most hit the classroom while some inevitably hit him, scorching some of his clothes and skin. Panicked cries of his classmates reached his ears but Katsuki couldn't care less at the moment. He just wanted to wipe that annoying. 
Hani smirk off of that pinkhead's face and get him out of the way so he could speak with Deku. Katsuki wasn't surprised to find himself restrained by two teachers few moments later. He had expected it but didn't think they would come so soon. Having his arms held behind his back by an obviously struggling baldy sensei, Katsuki thrashed and growled as he was forced into the staff room. He knew this incident would ruin his perfect school record, but his perfect attendance record was already broken which meant his chance of being accepted into UA had just dwindled significantly. So why not just go all out and destroy everything? Katsuki was tired of constantly bottling up his emotions and dealing with all those losers he couldn't give two shits about. It was about time he lashed out and showed them who's boss. To hell with his record, he would find another way to get into UA. The teachers yelled at him for who knew how long and then jostled him into the principal's office so he could receive even more yelling while they waited for his parents to arrive. Katsuki ignored them the entire time and instead found the dead fish floating in the fish tank rather entertaining to watch. About half an hour later, his parents barged through the door, frantic eyes quickly landing on him. Katsuki didn't know what to expect. The only other time he got in trouble and his parents were called into the school was back when he was in kindergarten and accidentally set Deku's hair on fire. His parents didn't seem very mad at him. Only a slight scolding and an apology to Deku and his mother, then he was let off the hook. As he pays it, it shouldn't be much different this time. He would just tell them how Dek, Izuku made him eat shit and he was just getting revenge, and that Pink had refused to move out of his way. His parents should defend him. He had faith in them. Katsuki remained in his spot, sitting on the fancy couches in the principal's office, as he watched his parents make their way over to him. It should be about now that his mom slapped him in the head for causing a scene and then started defending him while rubbing the spot she just hit. We're so sorry. What? Katsuki widened his eyes. The expected slap didn't come. Mitsuki and Masaru bowed low and apologized towards the principal, who began blabbering about how Katsuki was the worst student he had ever seen, how he had caused trouble for his class, how he would not accept this kind of behavior no longer, and how his parents they needed to educate him better. That fucking bastard. Who the fuck did he think he was? Educate him. That shitty excuse of a principal was in no place to tell his parents how to educate their son. That's not what happened. He ended up yelling and interrupting the rant. Katsuki jumped out of the couch and tried explaining to his parents. I didn't attack my classmates on purpose. It's all to Izuku. It's all his fault. He made me eat. Katsuki, came Masaru's stern voice. The serious look his dad threw him ate all his unspoken words. Katsuki froze in his spot. He had never seen his gentle and forgiving dad look so grim before, and to be honest, it scared him. Katsuki kept his mouth shut for the rest of the conversation. He merely watched with tightly clenched fists as the principal continued badmouthing him and his parents apologized and took the insults to their faces. He didn't like seeing his parents act so cowardly and bow like they were peasants and this principal was their king or some shit. It annoyed him to no end, but he knew now wasn't the time for him to argue. Not when his mom had thick, dark circles under her tired eyes looking as if she would keel over any second. Or when his dad was clenching his trousers so hard his knuckles turned white as he endured the shameful insults. Katsuki was quiet the entire way home. They got off the car in silence. He and Mitsuki entered house first while Masaru went to park the car. Mom, Katsuki said once the door clicked shut. He looked up at his mother. Her haunted, ghastly eyes stared back at him. He wanted to explain to her what happened today. But first thing first, he needed to know what happened. Mom, is everything Oka? Slap. The force behind the slap caused his head to snap sharply to the right. Katsuki gasped as he staggered, using the wall for balance in order to stay on his feet. His cheeks stung and he gingerly touched it, the skin flaming hot under his fingertips. You stupid brat. You just had to pick today, don't you? Mitsuki screamed, her features contorting into a face that reminded him strongly of a cartoon villain who used to give him nightmares when he was really, really small. Her lips was pulled down into a deep frown, wrinkles gathering around her mouth making her age and stress even more apparent. Without waiting for his reply, she raced upstairs and locked herself in her room, slamming the door close. Few moments later, Masaru entered the house. He saw Katsuki holding his cheeks standing still by the doorway and he sighed. You okay, son? He asked softly, ruffling Katsuki's fuzzy blonde hair. Katsuki snapped out of his daze and nodded silently. Let me see. His dad pulled his hand away gently and observed his swollen cheek. He sighed again and gestured for Katsuki to follow him into the living room. Sitting down on the couch, Katsuki waited for his dad to come back with an ice pack. Idly swinging his legs, he kept his eyes trained on the photographs framed on the wall directly across him. That was taken about a year ago when Deku came over for his birthday party. He had brought a giant marshmallow castle and tripped over a bump in the carpet, falling onto Katsuki and causing hundreds of marshmallow to land on them. After a messy clutter of limbs, Katsuki managed to stand up only to step on a squishy marshmallow and fall on top of Deku in return. 
that got everyone laughing and Mitsuki snapped a picture in midst of the mayhem. Things were so much fun back then, so what exactly had changed? Why was Deku avoiding him and keeping secrets when he used to follow him around wherever he went? Why was his mom hitting him, like actually hitting him, and being so pissed off at him when he was the one who wanted to cry for having shit in his mouth? Why couldn't things stay the same? Katsuki used to find Deku's constant following to be infuriating. Now, he yearned to go back to that time, for Deku to follow him and smile at him again. He didn't want to see anger and hatred in those clear, emerald eyes. He wanted the admiration and compassion to return. At some point, Masaru returned with a pack of ice and a towel and told him to hold it against his cheek. The swollen had lessened hours later, but the stinging pain still remained. His dad had explained to him the reason behind Mitsuki's behavior. It was this morning when they received news that his aunt, Mitsuki's younger sister, had died in a car crash. Katsuki had only seen this aunt once when she visited them from America, so he didn't know her enough to feel any sorrow regarding her death. But this wasn't the case for Mitsuki. She grew up with her younger sister and she was her only living family member after her parents passed away. Losing her probably shattered her world. Katsuki was still a little mad at Mitsuki for hitting him, but he could understand where she was coming from. To receive a phone call about her son causing trouble in school not long after hearing about her younger sister's death probably didn't clash well with her current mentality. That explained why she would lash out and hit him, actually hurting him, for the first time in his life. By the time dinner rolled around, the swelling had almost disappeared completely. The ice pack he held against his cheek was now warm and completely melted. Katsuki returned it to the freezer and made his way to the dinner table where Masaru had cooked a feast for them. Mitsuki refused to leave her room so they could only eat by themselves and then save her portion for when she regained her appetite. Masaru was a great cook. Perhaps he hoped some good food could lift up everyone's spirit. He prepared a table full of Katsuki and Mitsuki's favorite dish. But even as a plate full of his favorite level 8 spicy curry was placed in front of him, Katsuki felt no different from before. The curry was tasteless, the spiciness barely affecting him, if not at all. He couldn't stop his brain from thinking and worrying so he could actually enjoy his food. But seeing Masaru's hopeful eyes glinting at him, he still swallowed a mouthful and praised, Not bad, Dad. After that, he took a shower and did his homework, stopping by his parents' bedroom before going to sleep. His hand raised to knock the door. Katsuki paused when he heard voices and sobbing from inside. He stood there for a long time, listening to Mitsuki's sobbing and Masaru's soothing whispers before lowering his hand and returning to his room. Katsuki had intended to apologize, but he realized that a mere apology probably wouldn't make Mitsuki feel any better. It was times like this that action meant more than words. What his mom needed right now wasn't an effortless apology, but solitary time to herself so she could get over her younger sister's death. The best way to apologize to her was act as a better son and stop causing trouble. Lying on his bed, Katsuki thought about everything that happened today and closed his eyes. He didn't know what would happen tomorrow, but no matter what, he would grit his teeth and endure it. For the first time in his life, Katsuki was willing to become a coward and give in to whatever that came his way. Because his mom was already stressed enough, she didn't need him to add more aggravation to her day. Mitsuki still wasn't talking to him when he woke up the next morning. Usually she'd already be up and either cooking or eating breakfast. But when Katsuki left his room this morning, her bedroom door was still tightly closed and the aroma of fish coming from downstairs told him that it was his dad who cooked breakfast this morning, since he loved traditional Japanese breakfast while Mitsuki loved the western kind. Breakfast was quiet. Masaru asked him what happened yesterday. Katsuki told him everything, including the possibility of Deku using his magic trick to dump shit in his mouth. His dad stayed quiet as he listened, only speaking up after Katsuki was done talking. Izuku's mother called me early this morning. She told me what happened in Izuku's perspective. I understand you wanting to protect Izuku, but your rash tendency caused you to act without thinking. Indeed Izuku shouldn't have done that to you, but you're also at fault. Katsuki fumed. Katsuki, when you get the chance, make sure you apologize. Why should I apologize first? Because someone has to start. Inko told me that Izuku isn't feeling so well and he won't be going to school today. His pet just died, Katsuki. That's not so easy to get over with. It's just a freaking caterpillar. To you it may be just a caterpillar. But to Izuku it's different. Masaru sighed and placed a hand on Katsuki's folded arms across the table. Katsuki, please, don't make this too hard on us. Katsuki shook his head. He was the one who was attacked. Why the hell did he have to apologize first? If someone had to, it should be Deku. A few minutes later, after realizing Katsuki wasn't about to relent, Masaru withdrew his hand and palmed his forehead. We'll talk about this after school. Just, go to school now. Katsuki grunted in response. He finished the rest of his breakfast in a hurry and then grabbed his bag. Before he left, he asked, just out of curiosity, are you going to work today? No, there's a lot of things we have to take care of today, like funeral for Aunt Misaki. 
Your mom hasn't gotten out of her shock yet so I need to stay with her. Make sure you don't get in any trouble today, okay? It won't be pretty for all of us. Katsuki grumbled, I know. I won't get in trouble. Good. Masaru smiled and ruffled his hair. For once, Katsuki didn't dodge. His dad may not act like it, but he was probably also affected by this whole situation. Katsuki had heard the quote many times, you hurt when your loved ones are hurt. He thought it was bullshit, but his dad believed in it and he was probably hurting right now. If messing up his already tousled hair could make his dad feel better, then Katsuki was willing to sacrifice his hair. After bidding goodbye to his dad, Katsuki took out the new bicycle he received for his birthday last year and rode it to school. The early morning tranquility cleared his mind a little, but all that vanished as soon as he arrived at school. Katsuki glanced around cautiously. He had a feeling someone was watching him. The feeling didn't disappear even after he locked his bike to the bike rack and entered the school building. As a part of his daily routine, he went to his shoe locker to change into his indoor shoes. To his surprise, his shoes weren't in the locker. Frowning, Katsuki thought back to yesterday. After the principal let them go, he had followed his parents out of the school after stopping by the locker to switch to his outdoor shoes. The last time he saw his shoes was right here, so where had he gone? Realization downed on him when he caught sight of two students. They looked kind of familiar. Classmates, maybe. Snickering at his expense, someone took his shoes. Hey. He slammed his locker close and chased after them, but he was forced to stop when they entered the indoor shoes only area. He'd rather not get in trouble again so early in the morning. Flaring at the two assholes sneering at him from afar, Katsuki returned to his locker and, after a moment of decision, went to Deku's locker and grabbed his shoes. They were a size too small but they would do for now. When he turned around, the two assholes were gone. Smirking in victory, Katsuki made his way towards the classroom. Whatever they were trying to pull wasn't going to work on Bakugo Katsuki. Once he entered the classroom, everyone stopped talking and turned to stare at him. The stares felt familiar. He was correct. Indeed it was his classmates who were staring at him and messing with him. Clicking his tongue, Katsuki slammed the door shut and yelled, What are you looking at? Everyone looked away. But when he went to his desk, everyone turned to look again. The reason was evident when he neared his desk. Cruel, hideous words were drawn onto the wood using permanent marker. Go kill yourself. Bakugo is dead. Eat shit haha. XD. Nobody likes you. Poop eater Bakugo. I'm Bakugo and I like to eat poop. You're not welcomed here. Poop emoji. Trash. Take a shower you smell like shit. Please die pretty please. Just to name a few. The more he read the more he trembled in rage and humiliation. Katsuki dumped his backpack onto his desk to hide the painful words and dragged his chair out. His face darkening even more when he found gum covering the entirety of his seat. He swirled around to glare at the culprit, but the pink head only winked at him and turned away. Who did this? Katsuki yelled. There was no way Pinkhead was the only one involved. There had to be more. Who ruined my desk? Everyone turned away from his outburst. If nothing, being ignored pissed him off even more. Baldi Sensei picked this precise moment to enter. Seeing the annoyed look on his teacher's face, Bakugo grumbled under his breath as he took out a notebook inside his desk. Noting how the pages were slashed into shreds and ripped out the only intact page, he covered the gums with the page and sat on it, the bumpy feeling especially strange under his butt. During the entire class Katsuki remained stiff as a statue, attentive to his surroundings. He knew those assholes wouldn't just write some stupid things on his desk and decorate his seat with gum and call it a day. Oh and stealing his shoes and ripping his notebooks. Not that those mattered much to him. He had a spare pair back home and a bunch more extra notebooks stacked somewhere in his drawers. If he were to bully someone, he wouldn't stop until he was satisfied. There had to be more those shitty classmates of his had in store for him. Katsuki was so watchful of his classmates he didn't notice the teacher calling his name until the third time. Yes, he drawled, standing up lazily. Baldi sensei frowned at his blithe behavior. Bakugo, read the next paragraph please. Shit. Katsuki clicked his tongue. The teacher knew he wasn't paying attention and did this on purpose. PSS. The kid sitting next to him gestured to his textbook and whispered helpfully. Page 34 first paragraph. Katsuki glanced at his open textbook. It was indeed open to page 34, which had a diagram in the middle and a paragraph above and below it respectively. Back you go. He narrowed his eyes, throwing the kid a suspicious look. When the kid only smiled innocently, Katsuki turned to his own textbook and began reading the second paragraph. Baldi sensei didn't say anything and instead told him to sit down after he was finished. Seeing he didn't fall for the trick, the kid turned away with a pout while Katsuki smirked, as if saying, is that all you got? The rest of the classes went by fairly peacefully. He remained in his seat during break so no one could do anything to his stuff when he was gone. Soon, it was time for P.E. Dressed in gym clothes, Katsuki stood among his peers on the basketball court while waiting for their P.E. teacher to arrive with the equipment. Today, they were playing dodgeball. 
I'm sure everyone here has played dodgeball before. The teacher, a tall, slender woman whose name Katsuki didn't bother to remember, began and looked around, checking for anyone who shook their head. No one did. The rules are the same. If you're hit, you're out. If you want to get back in, you will have to run a lap around the court. The winning team is the team with the most people on the court by the time class ends. Target area is below the neck. If you catch the ball, the thrower is out. If you get hit and someone else catches the ball, you're still in while the thrower is out. If the ball bounces on the ground and then hit you, neither you nor the thrower is out. No quirk usage is allowed. If I see any, you're out immediately. Am I clear? Everyone nodded their heads. Katsuki had a feeling that last part was directed to him. The teacher proceeded to separate them into two groups. Katsuki was on team A. The atmosphere in the gym was a little heavy and Katsuki had a feeling something was about to happen. At the sound of the whistle, a dozen dodgeballs flew towards Katsuki. What the? He should have expected this. Katsuki thought as nearly half of them struck his body, knocking the wind out of him. They gave up on messing with him during class. So obviously the next opportunity would be during PE. But even if he had foreseen this, dodging this many dodgeballs was too difficult even for Katsuki. If only he was allowed to use his quirk. Back you go, out. Fuck. Katsuki cursed under his breath as he raced around the court as fast as possible so he could get back into the game and get his revenge. You're not gonna get me this time, he swore when he stepped back into bound. This time, he was extra careful. He used his teammates as body shields when too many balls were thrown at him, and caught the easy ones, sending them back where they came from and knocking many opponents out of bound using this tactics. Soon, the other team noticed that this wasn't going to work. Gradually, his teammates began to lessen. Those who were out were practically dragging their feet around the court, slower than a snail. All of them made sure to throw the dodgeball before they were out, causing the opposing team to have all the balls while Katsuki and a few other that were left on his team had none. Even an idiot would have realized what was going on. Soon, Katsuki was the only one from his team remaining on the court. All his other teammates were taking their sweet-ass time running their lap. The teacher noticed and yelled at them to hurry up, but that didn't work. She wasn't a horseman. She couldn't just whip them into running faster, no matter how much Katsuki wished she could. The opponent team exchanged a glance and got in the stance simultaneously. Katsuki lowered his center of gravity, readying himself. Just like last time, everyone targeted him, except this time it was a lot worse. Last time the opposing team only had half the number of balls since his team also had some, while this time his team had none. All 30 balls were in the other half of the court. Katsuki swallowed thickly. His eyes glued onto the other team. You can do it Katsuki. He told himself, they're just some fucking shitty balls. There's nothing to be afraid of. His eyes were starting to sting from staying trained for so long, so he blinked, opening his eyes to dozens of rubber balls soaring towards him. Katsuki immediately located the one thrown first and caught it, using it to deflect the ones that came a bit too close. He ducked, caught, dived, even rolled on the ground to avoid the others. Being so focused on his surroundings and making sure he didn't trip over the dozens of balls lying around. Katsuki failed to notice gold eyes tampering with a ball before throwing it. The moment that ball came in contact with the one he was holding on to, an electric shock struck his hands, rushing up his arms and down his body. His body went rigid, his vision darkening even though his eyes were still opened. Why can't I see? A hard thud brought pain to the back of his head. He knew he had fallen but why didn't he hear the impact? Why can't I hear anything? Electricity continued charging through his body like thousands of hot needles pricking through his skin, flesh, and deep into his bones. His muscles tensed up involuntarily, hardening like rocks and out of his control. He tried flexing his fingers to release the source of the pain, but they seemed to be glued to the ball like magnets, ignoring his commands. He couldn't even move his jaws to grit his teeth. Why can't I move? How long had it been? Minutes? Hours? When is it over? He kept thinking this was going to stop any second, but it just kept going. But that wasn't the worst. The pain was unbearable and Katsuki felt like any second now he was going to break, both physically and mentally. But true terror began when he lost control of his bladder. No 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 no. No matter how much he thrashed and screamed in his head, his bladder still betrayed him in the end. All of a sudden, the pain vanished and his body went limp, melting against the ground. Katsuki lay face up on the ground, details of the ceiling filling his vision. The vast interior of the gym was dead silent except his rapid panting and the steady sound of urine leaving his body. His hands were still a little numb with the residue of the prickly sensation. But now that he had full control over them, he allowed them to slacken, the rubber ball slipping out of his grasp and rolling away. Only then did his brain start to function again. A roar of laughter erupted from a distance, causing Katsuki to flush red like a tomato. He quickly sat up. Body quivering not in residual pain but in humiliation as he kept his head down and eyes trained at the disgusting puddle of piss he was sitting on. If there was one thing Katsuki couldn't stand, it'd be humiliation. 
A strangled noise escaped his lips. Wouldn't it be nice to just strangle himself right there and then? Before he scrambled onto his feet and ran out of the gym, the harsh, taunting laughter of his tormentors resounding next to his ears even after he closed the heavy metal door. It took everything in his power to not cry. Standing under the shower head letting cold water seep into his wet clothes, Katsuki leaned his head against the wall and pulled his hair so hard they nearly tore off of his scalp. Ah, uh, he let out a frustrated yell as he slammed his head against the wall. Freezing cold water beat down his back but it was nowhere near the bone-chilling feeling when he got shocked. That fucking gold-eyed bastard. Rage and embarrassment flickered in his dilated red eyes. Katsuki breathed in heavily and staggered back, bringing up a trembling hand to caress the lump on his forehead and sliding down to cover his eyes. Katsuki could handle the pain. He could handle anything except humiliation. What just happened wouldn't even happen in his worst nightmare. And for the first time since he was an infant, Katsuki felt the urge to cry. He never cried. Not when he got his ass handed to him when he tried to get back Deku's hero collection cards from those fucking teenagers. Not when he fell off a bridge more than three times his height into the shallow river below, hitting his head and receiving a concussion. Not even when a neighbor's dog bit his leg and nearly tore off a chunk of flesh. And he wasn't about to cry now. The liquid flowing down his cheeks was shower water, nothing else. Letting out a shaky breath, Katsuki removed his hand from his eyes and clenched them into tight fists. As soon as the pain vanished everything was back to normal. He experienced no after effects and felt like he was able to deliver a Texas smash if he could. But the mental scar would forever remain in his mind. He would never forget the seemingly eternal torture that his body was forced to go through, all because of that goddamn son of Abich. He's so fucking dead. The chilling water was starting to get to him. Turning the hot water on, Katsuki began to strip. The wet clothes clinging to his bare skin was getting uncomfortable, especially knowing that his pants was soaked with his piss. Click. Just as he stripped off his underwear, he heard a familiar clicking sound, like that of a camera. Who's there? Katsuki spun around too fast he almost slipped on the wet floor. He caught a flash of gold before he had to steady himself with the water hose attached to the shower head. When he regained his balance, however, the other person had already escaped. Damn it, he groaned. After he scrubbed his skin raw and washed his gym clothes, he put on his school uniform, placed his wet clothes in a bag, and left the boys' locker room. He sneaked to the gym and peeked through a gap in the door. The puddle of piss was gone and his classmates were playing dodgeball happily as if that was how things should be, as if Katsuki didn't belong in this class in the first place. Ignoring the pain that struck him upon witnessing this scene, Katsuki turned heels and ran to the classroom where he sat drowned in his own thoughts until gym class ended and his classmates trickled in getting ready for the next period. Gold Eyes didn't react any differently from the rest of his classmates as if he wasn't the one who freaking shocked Katsuki. He merely plopped down on his seat and gazed at Katsuki in mock concern as he questioned, Hey, are you okay? What happened back there? You just suddenly fell down and started convulsing like you were having a seizure. Katsuki snapped, What happened? You know what fucking happened. You're the one who freaking shocked me. Don't act like you're innocent. Me. Shock. I would never. Gold eyes gasped, eyes widening unconvincingly. He waved his hands around as he claimed, I didn't do anything to you. Everyone saw it. Right. All those traitorous classmates nodded, staring at Katsuki like he was the one who lied. See, everyone can testify for me. The way that son of Abich looked, phony and full of contempt and spite, pissed Katsuki off. Testify your fucking ass. Katsuki shot out of his seat, kicking aside the desks blocking his path and stopping a foot before gold eyes. You know what you did. Don't lie to me, and you'll fucking pay. He pointed at the rest of the class. I'll make all of you. What? He was once again interrupted by the goddamn bald teacher. The old man leaned against the door frame with a wary look. You'll make them do what, Beck Hugo? He questioned, more like interrogated, his usually calm and collected gaze now burning with a sense of protectiveness. Of the class, Katsuki told himself, of this goddamn class excluding of me. Are you going to make your classmates cry once again? Are you going to kill their pet, insult their friends, and destroy half the classroom putting innocent classmates in danger? That's not what I. Staff room, after class, was all his homeroom teacher said before the bell rang and class began. Throughout class all Katsuki could think of was the tired look on Mitsuki's face and her strained posture when she got called in yesterday. He had promised to not get in trouble again so he could lift some weights off of her shoulders, but the way Baldi kept glaring at him told him he had failed. He was going to get in trouble for doing nothing this time and his parents would be called and his mom would be sad and would cry and hit him and his once happy family would stay broken. Katsuki should have kept his anger in control. He should have known that this bald asshole hated him and wouldn't play fair and would do anything to get him in trouble. He should have waited until after school to get back at gold eyes, maybe sneak up to him on his way home and cover him with a bag and beat him up or something. He should have kept his head down especially in a class where no one liked him and everyone was conspired to torment him. 
He couldn't take back the words he already said or wipe the memory of him saying those words off of Baldi Sensei's mind. The only thing he could do right now was mitigate the consequences. When class ended, Katsuki packed up his things quietly and made his way towards the staff room, the burning gazes of his classmates following him as he walked. One of them whispered, Do you smell something? When he shuffled past, another covered his mouth, looking a bit green. Oh my god I think I'm going to be sick. Someone call the ambulance. Katsuki merely kept his head down and exited the classroom. Baldi Sensei was waiting for him by the door and was in full view of the situation. He could have given Katsuki detention for simply glaring at those two assholes for all he knew, given his tendency to be unreasonably partial to Katsuki. Once both of them were in the staff room, Baldi slid the door close and sat down before his desk, gesturing for Katsuki to sit in the adjacent chair. There were three other teachers in the room, who only cast them a knowing look before turning back to their respective tasks. Back you go. The old man's groggy voice brought Katsuki's attention back to him. You may think I'm picking on you. Hell yeah you are, but I'm doing this for your sake. You're not stupid, I can see that from your test scores. So why are you doing stupid things? You said you want to be a hero, so why kill your classmate's pet? Why make Midori a cry knowing that would put you in a bad spot? Why insult your classmates and look down on them? That's not how you make friends. Like hell I want to be friends with those assholes. The more you act like you're better than them, the more distance you're putting between you and them. Why ostracize yourself? Do you want to be the outcast? I'm not trying to be. Then don't be. Be nicer to your classmates. Treat them as equals. What would have happened if I wasn't here today? Would you destroy half the classroom just like last time when you attacked Gamu and ended up getting even the principal involved? Baldi sighed as he picked up the receiver. I hope this is the last time I'll have to call your parents. Consumed with dread, Katsuki shot out his arms and stopped the hand that was about to dial his house's number. Wait, stop. Baldi stared at him with a surprised and guarded look. But Katsuki didn't back off. Don't call them. Please, Pai, I won't. I'll be nicer so. Don't call them. Baldi didn't seem to believe him. Back you go, this isn't the first time. How do you expect me to? And this will be the last time. Katsuki hoped Baldi could hear the desperation in his voice. He hated having to do this. Back you go, Katsuki did not beg, or plead, or pray. Only cowards did that. And he wasn't a coward. But at this time and place, faced with one of the only authority figures aside from his parents, Katsuki only had one option. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. So, please, don't call my parents. Baldi Sensei's eyebrows raised so high they almost disappeared in his non-existent hairline. He probably thought the end of the world would come sooner than Katsuki apologizing. The teacher tugged his arm slightly trying to see if Katsuki would loosen his steel grip. Katsuki didn't. All right. Baldi set down the receiver at last and Katsuki let go. Seeing the area he held onto starting to turn red made him feel giddy. Serves him right for always picking on me. I won't call your parents this time, but you have to promise me. Promise you what? Promise me you will behave at school from now on. Okay, I promise. Sure, he would behave at school, but after school. Oh, he would have so much fun getting revenge. After Baldi dismissed him, Katsuki returned to class, smirking at those classmates who were hoping he would get in trouble and now harboring a disappointed look. The rest of the day went by smoothly. Katsuki held back his anger and bared with everything that were thrown at him, compared to being publicly humiliated this morning. Having gum spit in his hair by that fucking pink head like his head was some kind of dartboard was nothing. After school, he packed up his things swiftly and dashed out of class, making the impression that he was leaving early when in reality he was hiding in the restroom waiting for Gold Eyes to leave. Gold Eyes left the classroom not long afterwards. Katsuki watched from a distance as he waved at Pink Head and went on his way home. Hiding behind trash cans and light poles, Katsuki followed discreetly as Gold Eyes entered a manga net cafe, coincidentally directly in front of the bookstore where Deku's mother worked at. He waited there for at least 10 minutes with no sign of his target leaving the cafe. How long is he gonna stay here? Does he not have a home to go back to? At some point, Deku's mother got off work and came over upon seeing him. Hello Katsuki-kun, what are you doing here? She greeted him cheerfully as if he wasn't the one who made Deku cry and leave school early the day before. Um, I... Uh, I'm on my way home. Oh, let's walk back together. Katsuki could only nod as he fell in step with Midoriya and Ko, who began chatting animatedly about something he wasn't paying attention to. As he walked, he glanced back at the net cafe and just happened to stare directly into that familiar pair of gold eyes. The air around him suddenly dropped by at least 10 degrees as if the presence of sun was gone. Katsuki flinched, quickly looking away. Those gold eyes were cold like the winter gale and sharp as knives. The rage they contained wasn't like Deku's after the caterpillar incident, borderline exploding like a ticking bomb. They were controlled, suppressed, and focused. Those eyes were indifferent and calculating. They knew what they wanted and they were going to get it no matter how high the price or who had to pay the price. But beneath that, 
There was fear. Katsuki almost thought his eyes were playing tricks on him, because that hyperactive gold eyes had never shown fear towards anything. He was a stupid, bold loser who would charge head first into a brick wall. What was he afraid of? And what was that just now? Those eyes. It was as if he was a whole different person. That evening, when Masaru asked about his day, Katsuki simply shrugged, acting casually so his dad wouldn't find out how much of an embarrassment his son was. Mitsuki had apologized to him when they ate dinner. She told him how she wasn't thinking straight yesterday so she just acted upon her feelings, which she was incredibly sorry for. Katsuki forgave her. Well, he didn't like being slapped but hey, that was his mother and she had a special place in his heart. He couldn't stay mad at her forever. He just couldn't. With their issues settled, the rest of the evening was full of light-hearted conversations and contagious laughter. Katsuki pointedly avoided talking about his school day. He didn't want to tell his parents that his classmates were in some kind of conspiracy to make his life hell in fear of sounding like a weak little crybaby. He didn't like being called the victim. It made him feel weak. He also didn't want them to encourage him to kick their asses or worse, physically making an appearance in school and talking to the principal about this matter. They may laugh and act like nothing was bothering them during dinner, but Katsuki knew they still had a lot of stuff on their mind. Those issues wouldn't just go away when you laugh and have fun. They were always there, hiding somewhere and waiting to reappear. His parents were busy these days and his mom was emotionally troubled. He didn't want them to take time out of their busy day to deal with his shit. Katsuki could deal with his classmates himself. The next morning, Katsuki woke up rejuvenated and ready to kick ass. He ate breakfast with his parents and was about to grab his bike when he remembered he had left it at school yesterday when he spied on gold eyes. He couldn't bring it with him because it was too big to hide. Sighing, he began his long walk to school. When he walked past the bookstore and co-worked at, she greeted him and told him she would get off work early today to visit the pet store with Deku. He was still feeling down and she hoped buying him a new pet would help. After a moment of thoughts, Katsuki told her to leave it to him. He had thought long and hard about his situation with Deku. Sure it was just a freaking caterpillar, but there were people who married dogs and considered cockroaches their pets. Weird people with weird hobbies were everywhere. Maybe Deku was one of those weirdos who felt love towards a freaking caterpillar. Katsuki couldn't understand it, but he admit he shouldn't have straight out killed that monster. He should have burned just a part of it instead of the whole thing. So he decided to apologize first like Masaru told him to, because he was nice like that. When he arrived at school, he instantly realized something was vastly wrong. Yesterday only the losers from his class stared at him. Today, more than half the school were staring at him as he entered the campus. The fuck are they looking at? Katsuki glared back but they only snickered while some shook their head in pity. Who are they pitying? The answer became apparent when he neared the glass doors of the building. Pictures of him stripping off his underwear and exposing his bare bottom were plastered all over the door. And there was more on the walls of the school and slipped inside random shoe lockers, waiting for its owner to open up their locker and find the surprise. The teachers were frantically running around taking off the pictures and yelling at students not to stare at them. But of course, no one listened. Katsuki froze at the entrance, his body turning cold and his eyes starting to sting. All of a sudden, the noises around him magnified as if someone just turned up the volume. Voices, whispers, snickers, sound of shoe lockers opening and slamming close, feet stomping the ground, doors sliding open, teachers yelling. Everything became so loud and intense and overwhelming. Katsuki slapped his hands over his ears, muffling the noises. His quickened breathing echoed in his ears. No 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 this can't be true. The teacher with a bald and triangular head rushed up to him, staring at him with concern and saying something. Are you okay? Stop. Katsuki backed up fearfully, shaking his head rapidly and trying to get away from those reaching hands. Stop staring at me. His head felt like it was about to burst with the amount of blood that rushed to it. His face must be flushed red right now. He was so embarrassed he wanted to die. That was the last thought he had before hitting the ground in a dead faint. Katsuki woke up in the infirmary. His face had cooled down considerably and the noises had dimmed, but his heart was still racing as he remembered the reason why he wasn't in class but was instead on an unfamiliar bed looking at the worried face of the school nurse. What just happened was a thousand times worse than the incident yesterday. Today, the whole school saw his, his, burying his face in his hands. Katsuki tried to shake off the memory of being the target of those piercing, judgmental stares. What should he do now? How would he face his classmates now? How would he even go to school now? Katsuki was by no means a coward, but this was his first time dealing with such a situation. He just didn't know what to do. For a few minutes he just sat on the bed, ignoring the school nurse's questions about his breakdown until the door to the infirmary slid open, revealing Baldi's triangular head. Katsuki immediately lay back down and covered his face with the sheets. He didn't want to his teacher to see how vulnerable he was at this moment. Vakugo, how are you feeling? I know what just happened is very traumatizing, but I assure you everything will be fine. 
We teachers are working together to track down the culprit behind this. The culprit, isn't it obvious? It's your own goddamn class including that son of Abich gold eyes. Ew, don't look like you want to talk to me at this moment. That's fine. I know listening to an old man talk can be annoying. I find my own voice annoying sometimes too, haha. <laughs> I'll leave you be for now. If you feel like skipping school today, feel free to do so. I won't give you any trouble. Just tell Kana-sensei right here and she'll write you an excuse note. Katsuki supposed this Kana-sensei was the nurse. Don't worry about homework. Knowing you, you won't have a hard time catching up when you're ready. Well, I have to leave for class. I hope you'll feel better. There was a pause. And then Baldi spoke again. Back you go. I'm sorry for the way I treated you before. I'm just frustrated that a student with so much potential and a bright future ahead has such a shitty personality. There was a gasp of horror. Whether it came from the nurse or Katsuki himself, he couldn't tell. Excuse my language, but I suppose that's the best way to make you understand. Baldi chuckled. There was some shuffling, chairs scraping the floor, and footsteps leaving the bed. Be better soon, Bakugo. The door slid close. Katsuki ended up staying in the infirmary for the rest of the day. His parents would definitely find out about this if he were to leave school early, and since he didn't want them to, he ended up staying in the infirmary organizing his hero collection cards with Kana-sensei as his only company. She didn't talk much, which was good because Katsuki preferred some alone time right now. Baldi, Yama-sensei's talk had changed his mind of him. The old man wasn't that bad of a person, but that didn't mean Katsuki liked him. Yet, as he shuffled his cards, he thought about everything he had endured these past two days. The more he thought about it, the more distaste he nurtured towards Gold Eyes. Everything was Gold Eyes' fault. He was sure that Pinkhead was involved, too, including the rest of his class, but the one who embarrassed him the most was Gold Eyes. He first shocked Katsuki and made him piss himself like a fucking baby. And then he snapped a picture of him showering and posted it all over the school, making him the laughing stock. This grudge wasn't going to be easy to get over, and Katsuki had no intention of ever forgetting this incident or forgiving Gold Eyes. That fucker is gonna pay. He hadn't thought of what he was going to do yet, but he would think of something eventually. When school was over, Yama-sensei came over personally to deliver him homework and notes for the lessons he missed. That gesture warmed his heart a little. After making sure all the students had left the school, Katsuki bid goodbye to Yama-sensei and the nurse before leaving. He didn't bring his bike with him because walking was good for clearing one's mind. He made his way towards the Manga Net Cafe, and as he expected, Gold Eyes was sitting on the second floor table right by the window with a glass of coke next to him and holding a volume of manga. Katsuki waited there for about an hour and decided to leave when the sky was getting dark and less and less people remained on the street. He would have to figure out a way to lure Gold Eyes away to an isolated spot before he entered the Manga Net Cafe. One thing that boggled him, though, was the fact that Gold Eyes had been reading the exact same manga for the entire hour. Katsuki wondered why. He was a block away from home when it happened, the incident that made everything that had happened to him so far seem like a child's play. Like always, the night streets of Japan were filled with drunkards who either passed out on the side of the road or decided to make life miserable for others in one way or another. Katsuki was one of the very unfortunates who met the latter. Hey you kid. One of the drunkard on the street slurred as he stumbled his way over. Katsuki did the smart thing and ignored the older man. Do you don't hick 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 no or me? The old man tripped over his feet and collapsed onto Katsuki, pinning him from the back. Get off me. Katsuki growled, struggling against the heavy weight but his kid's strength was no use against a big, fat, and burly drunk who decided to latch himself onto Katsuki like some kind of fat-ass parasite. The drunk pulled out his phone and, as Katsuki watched in confusion, unlocked it after four wrong password attempts. He tapped the gallery app and scrolled down, and then selected a picture. Katsuki had to swallow a scream. It was the picture of him stripping. WWY to you. This is you, Amariaite. The drunk whispered right next to his ear, his foul breath making Katsuki want to throw up. I say how it. Online. You know, I never tea told my EWW wife. But dot 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 hick dot 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 I like kids. I lew of kids. Katsuki shivered, his eyes darting around in hope of seeing someone who could help him. There was no one around. You're really sexy. How the heck? You know. Goosebumps erupted all over his skin when a hand sneaked inside his shirt, the feeling of calluses sliding across his soft skin incredibly uncomfortable and disgusting. He started panicking when the other hand dropped the phone and started unbuttoning his trouser. And no, Katsuki whimpered. What to do? What to do? He was scared. He was so scared. What was happening? Could he use his quirk? Would he get in trouble if he did? He wanted to get away. He wanted the drunk to stop touching him. It was disgusting and made his stomach churn. What did the drunk want with him? Why was he touching him so weirdly? Tears fell from his eyes, blurring his vision. Stop crying. Katsuki tried to tell himself. Stop being a crybaby. Only cowards cried. Katsuki couldn't cry. He couldn't be a coward. 
But the tears didn't stop falling, neither did the embarrassing sound that came out of his lips. No one could help him. Katsuki had no one. It was now when he finally realized that he was alone. He was always alone. In midst of his struggling, he felt something in his pocket. It's, without hesitating, Katsuki grabbed the security alarm Deku threw at him and pulled off the strap. The shrill screeching cry made the drunk stop with his advances, and Katsuki took the opportunity to slip out of his grasp and run towards his house. Even after he had reached his house, locked himself in his room, and hid under his bed while hugging his All Might plushie, he still couldn't stop himself from crying. I'm such a loser. The truck was getting closer. Izuku glanced away to focus on the dark path before him. All around him were contorted, eerie-looking trees with branches that reached towards him like claws. Ahead of him was infinite darkness with no signs of an end. He didn't know where he was running towards, but he had to keep moving. One of the branches turned into a withered arm and wrapped around his legs. Izuku fell, and the next second, he was pinned down by the ice cream vendor in a choke hold. You murderer. Why did you kill me? The old man asked him again and again, his voice becoming louder and more distorted each time. His head swelled up like a human balloon, his eyeballs bulging out like that of a fish, his mouth slitting into a wide, gaping grin. It was like a black hole with no teeth no tongue no nothing and from it spilled out dozens of crimson-colored ice cream's cones, burying Izuku underneath them and suffocating him. Some melted ice cream seeped into his mouth, tastes like blood. Somewhere nearby a girl's voice yelled out his name. And then he was on the ground, crouching above Yuuga and strangling him with his own intestines. It hurts. Izuku. Izuku woke up screaming and writhing on his bed. His comforter was lying on the ground, kicked off when he was asleep. His bedroom door slammed against the wall hard enough to chip off a layer of paint as Inko barged through, rushing next to his side. Izu-chan. You're safe. You're safe now. She hugged him tightly as if she would lose him if he didn't. She continued whispering next to his ear and gradually he calmed down. I am fine now, mom. Izuku pushed her away gently and wiped his eyes, feeling the tear tracks on his face. Are you sure? Are you still bothered by the AMAP incident? I'm sorry I really shouldn't have let you go that day. If only I didn't sign the permission slip, you wouldn't have to witness the attack. That's not it. Don't worry. I'm already feeling better. I'll be fine. If you say so. Inko lifted up his bangs and placed a hand on his forehead. I'm going to cook dinner. I'll call you when it's ready. Thanks, mom. Izuku smiled at her as she left her room. The moment the door closed, he collapsed against his pillow, feeling drained. He hadn't had a nightmare ever since he had Pi. Cuddling with Pi every night was his remedy, but now that Pi was dead, Izuku tightened his jaws as images of Pi's death flashed across his mind. It's all Bakugo's fault. I hope he's happy now that everyone in class has seen my ugly crying face. Thinking of Bakugo made him angry. Izuku didn't like the feeling of boiling anger pumping in his veins, urging him to go break something. He felt unlike himself, and that was a scary thing. Looking for a distraction, Izuku pulled up the notification screens he had ignored earlier at school and noticed a new, recent one on the very top. You have had PTSD-related nightmares twice in less than a week, earning you the status effect. Since this is your first status effect, you have received X1. This round removes all status effects when hit. PTSD, Gola explained in his mind. It means you're traumatized from the AMAP incident. Izuku pulled up the profile page and next to his name. There was indeed a frowny face icon that said PTSD when tapped and held. He then opened his inventory and took out the newest object, the remover round, that was sitting quietly in a slot. A golden round appeared on his palm. It was slightly shorter than his pinky and as wide as his thumb. The light blue bullet took up about one-third of the entire length. The tip of the bullet was round and smooth and felt quite nice to the touch. But, how do I use this? Izuku examined the round, baffled. What uses rounds? A gun? And this is a 9mm round which is used by pistols. Are you saying I need to buy a gun? I'm not saying it, I'm connoting it. There was indeed a pistol available for sale in the bazaar. It cost 5,000 reputation points, which was about 200 more than his current amount. If I had known I need this much, I would have bought less candies. But, it's illegal to own a gun in Japan. I'd get in big trouble if I'm caught. You can hide it in your inventory. But still, master, do you want to have nightmares like this for the rest of your life? This is your chance to forget about the incident and go back to the way you were before. Izuku thought long and hard. Nightmares were terrifying. And it'd be nice to not be bothered by his multiple traumatic deaths anymore. But a gun. Like any normal kid, he related guns to crimes and murder and criminals. Guns killed people. Bad guys used guns. Japan's gun laws were extremely strict and nobody was allowed to own a gun. If he was caught with one, the results wouldn't be pretty. But this was the only way. He had no other choice. If he had to break a law and own a gun illegally in order for him to escape the nightmares, then so be it. He would just have to be extra cautious to ensure it stayed in his inventory. 
He currently had 4798 rep points, including one negative rep point. He needed 202 more points to afford a Beretta M9 pistol. Today was Wednesday. Usually he earned about 20 rep points on a school day, and doubled that amount on the weekend. Izuku wanted the nightmares gone as soon as possible, and there was only one way to do that. Mom, sitting at the dining table, Izuku slouched slightly and put on a worrisome face. Can I not go to school tomorrow? And Ko looked like she was debating with herself. So Izuku made a few tears drop as he told her everything that had happened today and how much it pained him to see Bakugo kill Pai. When he got to that part, the tears that fell were genuine. He also included the part where he made Bakugo eat poop because he didn't want to lie to her. And Ko looked like she didn't know whether she should scold him till the end of the world for committing such a heinous act or praise him for standing up for himself and Pai. Finally, she nodded. Alright, I'll allow you to skip school tomorrow. Izuku had to stuff a broccoli in his mouth to stifle a victorious laugh, only because of what happened to Pai. Thanks mom, can I go quest hunting then? By myself, you know that's too dangerous. Then can you go with me? And Ko's lips twitched, her chopsticks stabbing into a piece of carriage chicken. Whenever he went quest hunting, she was always forced to chase after him since he tended to run around in an excited frenzy. If she was one second slower, he'd disappear out of her sight, having gone into an alley because he heard some suspicious noises or climbed up a tree to save a cat. As an ordinary housewife who didn't exercise, and Ko obviously didn't like being tagged along on his quest hunts, but feeling obligated to look after him as his mother, she had to do it. All right, all right, we'll go tomorrow. I'll see if I can take the morning off, but make sure you don't start off running everywhere. My legs can't handle the stress. That's good exercise for you then. And Ko scowled amusedly. Don't get cheeky on me. After dinner, Izuku went through the rest of the notifications while submerged in bubbly bath water. Title has been unlocked. More information can be found on the titles. Achievements page. The Madman. Activation requirements. Death of a loved one. Quirk. Carnage. Every non-living object within 5 meter radius will explode when you scream while in rage mode. You have unlocked by reaching maximum anger. Rage meter will rise when you're angry. When it hits caps, you can choose to activate Rage Mode, which will triple all your stats for however long you can maintain maximum anger, but your logical thinking ability will be hampered momentarily as a result. This was probably what caused his world to flash red when he saw Bakugo kill Pai. On the bottom left of his vision, there was a faint, barely visible circular icon with the word Rage in the center. It had a dim orange hue glazing over it, which would probably turn red when Izuku was angry. Tripling his stats would be awesome. But losing his ability to think logically could be very dangerous, so Izuku decided to only use rage in a pinch. The next notification was a quest alert. Quest alert. Description, your beloved pet, Pi, has just been killed. And as its master, it's your duty to get revenge on the killer. Time limit, none. Reward, 300 EXP. Failure. And it seemed that it was automatically accepted after receiving no reply from him and was marked as complete when he dumped poop in Bakugo's mouth. Immediately after was another quest alert. Quest alert. Description, Bakugo Katsuki is a bully to many people. Be a hero to these people and kick him out of the school. Time limit, 1 month. Reward, 1000 EXP, 50 rep points. Failure. This quest was practically designed specifically for him. After everything that happened, Izuku would prefer to never see his face ever again. But how to kick him out of school? Izuku couldn't think of anything he could do alone. He would need as much help as possible. However, this would have to wait until he returned to school, which would be after he earned enough rep points to buy a pistol because that took priority at the moment. He didn't think he could concentrate in school while suffering from PTSD. At first, he was slightly surprised that the reward was 50 rep points, but it made sense when he thought about it. Not many people liked Bakugo, so if he got kicked out of school, there would surely be many who appreciated it and felt saved as a result. That was it for the notifications. The bath water was getting cold so Izuku quickly washed off the soap and left the steamy bathroom. That night, he slept next to his mom. The nightmares still haunted him, but when he woke up screaming and struggling, and Ko was right there ready to soothe his fears away. Listening to her soft voices while snuggling into her warm chest, Izuku drifted back to sleep. It was a restless night. The next morning, Izuku woke up early to go quest hunting. The morning rush filled the streets with panicking students and office workers running towards their destinations and elders taking a relaxing stroll with or without a pet dog. Opening the door, Izuku got a face full of sunlight and the fresh morning breeze. He took a deep breath, filling his lungs with the smell of nature and city pollution. Revitalized inside and out, he excitedly grabbed onto Inko and dragged her towards the busy streets. Three hours later, they were sitting in a small but cozy coffee shop. Izuku had a cup of warm green tea and a slice of cheesecake. 
while Inko ordered a cup of coffee and six dainty pieces of Petit Fours, her favorite sweet. According to Yuuga, Petit Four was a bite-sized dessert that originated from France. Just one sip, please. You're too young, Izu-chan. Maybe ten years later, Inko chuckled as she sipped on her coffee and placed it out of his reach. Izuku lay his chin on the table and his arms across, a grumpy look crossing his face. Caffeine isn't good for kids. It's not good for adults either, but worse for kids. But I'm tired. Then drink your tea. It can wake you up faster than coffee can. Sipping his tea dejectedly, Izuku swore to buy some coffee from the bazaar and drink one every day. Behind her back, the phone icon in the corner of his vision suddenly flashed with a message sign. What happened? Inko asked when Izuku stopped complaining and sat still, staring straight at her. I got a text from Manami-chan. Izuku exclaimed as he thought of a reply, the words automatically appearing on the screen floating between him and Inko. She said she just got back from a doctor appointment and she has a quirk now. Really? What's her quirk? She didn't say. She just said it can provide a quirk boost to someone. It's still pretty cool. I'm glad she has a quirk now. Izuku sent his congratulation. And seconds later Manami replied back with a happy face. That's great. We should invite her over. Oh and all your other friends, too. And celebrate together. Good idea. Maybe after everything settled down, Izuku thought. After their lunch break, they walked home together. Izuku waited until Inko left for work before he sneaked out of the house and continued quest hunting until 4 in the afternoon. By the time he hurried home before Inko would get off work and notice his absence, he had earned 50 rep points and his legs were so sore he collapsed onto the couch as soon as he unlocked the front door. At this rate, he would earn 200 in no time. That night they slept slightly better than they did the night before. Izuku still woke up covered in cold sweat in the middle of the night from nightmares. But already used to this, Inko was able to soothe him back to sleep without even needing to open her eyes. The next day, puppy dog eyes at full force, Izuku managed to skip school again. Inko had to go to work today so she made him promise he would stay home before she stepped out with her bike. As soon as she disappeared from sight, Izuku sneaked his way out of the house and onto a crowded street in the opposite direction from where she was going. He went quest hunting until 4 in the afternoon and returned home with 52 rep points. On the weekends, Inko didn't have work so she accompanied him on his quest hunts until Sunday when Izuku reached 5,000 rep points. He picked the time Inko was taking her turn with the shower and locked himself in his room. He made sure the windows were sealed and closed the curtains. Then, he took out his phone, went on YouTube, and typed one shot one kill. This was the band Itoshi loved to listen to and they had lots of punk rock metal whatever genre they were called music. They were loud and noisy, the perfect song for this moment. He then went to the bazaar and purchased the pistol. A Beretta M9 landed on his palm from midair. Surprised by the weight of the weapon, Izuku didn't catch it in time and it dropped onto the ground. He immediately rolled into a ball, hugging his head in fear of getting shot. Then he realized how stupid this was since there wasn't even any rounds inside the chamber. Still hesitant, he picked up the pistol, feeling like the weight of the entire world was resting on his small, trembling hands. The metal was cool and felt nice in his sweaty grip. An idea suddenly came to him and he tried using metal control on the gun. It floated about a centimeter before dropping back down. Guess he needed to practice his quirk more. For the past two days, Izuku had done a ton of research on guns, so much so that if someone ever checked his browser history, they'd think he was planning to kill someone. Like he had practiced many times, he locked the slide with slight difficulty and dropped the remover round in the chamber. He then released the slide and pressed play on the music video, maximizing the volume. It started with a loud, high-pitched scream, and then the music started, reverberating against his walls and giving him a headache. Pushed by his urge to pause the song, Izuku moved to take off the safety. Hey Gola, this isn't gonna hurt or kill me, is it? Gola responded in a trembling voice as if it was trying hard not to laugh. No, it won't kill you, master. I hope I don't regret trusting you. Izuku flicked the safety off and mustered all his strength to cock the hammer. Beretta M9 wasn't a single action pistol and therefore didn't require him to cock the hammer before firing. But he would need to apply a lot more pressure on the trigger if he didn't cock it manually beforehand. Since it took roughly 6 to 10 pound of pressure on the trigger to cock the hammer back and release it in a single action and Izuku couldn't do that with one hand, he decided to cock the hammer manually, which reduced the trigger pull to 4 pounds or less of pressure. Keeping his finger straight and off the trigger, Izuku raised the gun and pressed the barrel against his temple. He closed his eyes and held his breath, his heartbeat quickening, faster and louder. He could almost hear it above the music and feel it trying to leap out of his chest. Sweat gathered in the center of his palm forcing him to put down the gun and wipe his hands on his trousers. He licked his lips as he picked up the gun again and placed his index finger on the trigger. All of a sudden he was reminded of that day when he tried to take his life, except this time he had no gentle to save him. A gunshot to the head wasn't like crashing into a cat while riding his bike. 
It was an instant death. Though using red potions to regenerate his HP. No asking Gola for help. If he had messed up somewhere and Gola didn't tell him, being the asshole it was, he would never see his mom again. No more eating cheesecake with his friends. No more quest hunting and being heroes. No more fanboying over heroes and all might and stalking gentle. No more going to cat cafes with Hitoshi. If he died, this was it. His hand shook, the gun quivering dangerously against his skin. If he was to die today, he would have lived today differently. He would have spent more time with Inko by going to places she desired and treating her to her favorite petit fours. He would have gathered all his friends so he could hear their laughter one last time. He would have visited Gentle and showed him how much he had changed thanks to the rescue years ago. There were so many things he would have done, so many things he would regret not doing, but it was all too late. He didn't realize the terror of holding a gun to his head and having to pull the trigger on himself until now. But he couldn't back down. He had come this far. If he stopped because he was too scared to shoot himself, all his effort for the past few days would be for naught. Inko would have run around with him for nothing. Izuku wouldn't care if his own time and effort had gone to waste. But he wouldn't forgive himself if someone else had to waste their time and effort for him. He had to do it. He just had to believe in Gola and digitalization that he would survive this putative suicide attempt. Midoriya Izuku took a deep, shuddering breath and whispered, I love you, mom. And then he squeezed the trigger. Katsuki locked himself inside his room for the entire weekends, only leaving to eat and take a shower. This abnormal behavior made both his parents incredibly concerned. They did everything they could to coax him into leaving the house and hanging out with his friends like what he usually did on the weekends. But seeing Katsuki ignoring all of their attempts they eventually gave up. They still have the funeral to take care of. They didn't have time to bother with him. When the incident first happened, Katsuki had hid beneath his bed with his All Might plushie. Now, he hid in his closet beneath a pile of clothes while hugging his All Might plushie. He had taken an hour-long shower every day but the sensation of calloused fingers caressing his skin still lingered even after he had scrubbed his skin until it turned red. He tried distracting himself with games, manga, movies, but no matter what he was doing, his mind would wander back to the event and he would once again remember the hot, stinky breath against his ear and the uncomfortable touches. He feared leaving his room. His parents were running around busy with their own matters and were rarely home. Every time he thought about leaving the closet, he would imagine the drunk breaking into his house when his parents weren't around and forcing himself into his room. Things didn't get any better when Monday arrived. The newscaster mentioned the possibility of a thunderstorm sometimes today, which dampened his mood even more. He was still terrified, but when his parents asked him for the reason why he didn't want to go to school, he didn't tell them. Hiding in his room already made him feel like a coward, admitting it would hurt his pride even more. He was in the middle of wrecking his brain for a compelling reason when Mitsuki mentioned. Inko said Izuku's feeling better and he'll be going back to school today. Deku's coming back. Katsuki imagined Deku going to school and finding the cruel markings on his desk, the gums on his seat, the trash dumped in his desk, and hearing the sick rumors spreading around about Katsuki. And then he would see Katsuki's absence as proof of his cowardice and think of him as a loser who was too scared to face his classmates face on. No, Katsuki wouldn't allow it. Deku was the last person he wanted to find out about the situation he was in. He changed his mind. He was going to school. But before that, there was something else he needed to do. I need some money. The classroom was empty when he entered. People often come to school later than usual on raining days. Good. As long as he arrived before Deku that was what mattered. Katsuki went to his seat and did a double take when he saw the brand new desk sitting in place of his old one that was covered in hideous writing. Someone had changed it when he was gone. Only one person came to mind. A hint of a smile ghosted over his lips before reverting back to his signature pissed-off look. He carefully placed his school bag down on the desk and took out the contents, leaving only a paper bag inside. His chair grazed against the floor as he dragged it out, the sound particularly loud in the empty classroom. Katsuki plopped down and moved to put his feet on his desk before he changed his mind. He didn't want to ruin his brand new desk with his shoes. He turned to stare at the windows, which were tainted with drops of rain that fell from the gray sky. Katsuki continued staring, mesmerized and strangely hypnotized by the sound of rain splattering over the glass. The classroom was warm compared to the chill weather outside. Without his classmate's presence, Katsuki was finally able to allow his body to relax while normally he had to constantly be on guard, watching out of the corner of his eyes in case they tried something. The door slid open, breaking him out of this rare moment of serenity. A student walked in, followed by another, and soon, students were trickling through the door like a line of ants, except they were louder than ants. Katsuki winced when the buzzing started and knew it wouldn't cease until Yama-sensei came through the door. The buzzing suddenly grew in intensity when a group of students came through the door and in the center of them was Deku, being flanked by pink head and gold eyes and the others like he was their queen bee or some shit. Deku looked over at him as soon as he stepped through the door and Katsuki suddenly had an urge to look away. 
They stared at each other for maybe a few seconds before Deku broke eye contact and went straight to his seat without a word. For some reason, Katsuki felt relieved. Perhaps it was due to Deku's return. His classmates didn't mess with him for the entire day. The day was practically on fast-forward mode and before he realized it was almost over. During lunch, the rain had stopped so Katsuki went up to the roof to eat lunch in order to get away from the noises his overly energetic classmates generated as they fussed over Deku. When he returned to class, he found a note in his desk. Deku Hugo, I want to apologize to you for what I did last Thursday. I only wanted to mess with you a little. I didn't think my quirk would have that kind of effect on a human. I still can't control my power very well. I'm really sorry for doing that and I want to apologize to you directly. I noticed you following me after school so I think we should settle this matter once and for all. Please meet me on the roof after school today and give me a chance to earn your forgiveness. Kamaki Raiden The note crumbled as Katsuki crushed it in his hand, his body slightly shaking with rage. That son of Abich thought a simple apology was enough. He thought Katsuki would forgive him so easily. Katsuki turned to glare at gold eyes, who merely smiled apologetically at him. He shoved the fist that held the note into his pocket and sat down heavily, transferring his menacing glare to his unblemished desk and immediately a feeling of satisfaction cleansed his body. Neatness and organization always brought him pleasure. As class went on, all Katsuki could think of was how would he beat the shit out of gold eyes without physically beating the shit out of him. If he actually did so he would for sure get in trouble. There had to be a way to make that asshole eat shit without breaking any rules or laws. When the final bell rang, Katsuki packed up his stuff quickly and exited the classroom. He made a trip to Deku's shoe locker and placed the paper bag inside before heading towards the roof. The door leading to the roof was already unlocked when he got there. Katsuki had to put his entire weight against the door to push it open due to the heavy wind that sealed it shut. The rooftop was empty except for a few crows chattering on the railing. Figured gold eyes wouldn't be here yet. He was probably still chit-chatting with his friend. Katsuki stepped through the threshold, allowing the wind to slam the door shut for him. He glanced up at the dull sky covered with massive, dark clouds, completely enshrouding the sun from view. It's probably going to rain again soon, he murmured as he stepped closer to the railing and looked down. Among the crowd of students leaving the school, he saw the prominent green fluffy hair walking beside a pink head. A smile crawled onto his face when he noticed Deku carrying that paper bag he had placed into his shoe locker. Fucking gold eyes better stop wasting my time and get over here. Ten minutes later, the school was practically empty and gold eyes was still nowhere to be seen. Fucking gold eyes. Where the hell are you? Katsuki growled as he paced back and forth on the rooftop with hands shoved deep in his pockets. Five more minutes passed. I'm done with this shit. Katsuki decided and stormed towards the door. He should have known better. This was obviously a trap. Of course gold eyes wouldn't show up. He never even thought about apologizing. He placed a hand on the knob and was about to twist it when he heard a click. It wasn't like the sound from the boy's locker room. It sounded like it came from the other side of the door. An answer came to his mind followed by chills that went up his spine. Don't tell me. He twisted the knob. It was locked shut. Fucking gold eyes. I know you're here. Unlock this door immediately. Katsuki howled, banging on the door with his fist and twisting and pulling the knob frantically. A voice sing-songed from the other side. nope de nope nope The fucker was right there watching his failed attempts to unlock the door and he was enjoying it. You little shit. You're so fucking dead. You know what? When I get out there, Emma. Well, get out here then. I'm right here. Don't you wanna punch me? Hum, Kakin. Come on. That was the last straw. Boom. Katsuki fired an explosion at the metal door but it didn't even bulge. Might wanna practice your quirk a bit more. It's too weak. Would've been nice to have Izuku's quirk right now, don't you think? And he dared to slap Katsuki's face with Deku's useless quirk. Anger boiled underneath his skin, barely contained by Katsuki's conscience. It burned so bad as if lava had replaced his blood, melting his soul and destroying his very being. All the hate, frustration, and fury he had experienced in the past few days were ready to be unleashed in a long string of all the vulgar words Katsuki had ever learned. But he knew it was pointless. Yelling at a metal door wouldn't help his situation. Katsuki curled his hands into tight fists and unclenched them, exhaling deeply and forcing himself to calm down. What do you want from me? Are you doing this just to mess with me? Or are you some kind of sicko who want to see me beg for you to let me out? Gold Eyes was silent for a few seconds before he responded in a low voice. I'm just tired of you following me after school. That's all. I got stuff to do and I'd rather you not get in my way. It will be a bad end for both of us. What do you mean? His reply was the sound of footsteps going down the stairs. Wait, let me out you asshole. Katsuki pounded on the door but no matter how much he yelled gold eyes did not stop. Soon, the footsteps disappeared. Shit, Katsuki glanced up at the sky. Drops of rain were starting to fall down at a growing rate. There was no cover on the roof. He had to get out of here fast if he didn't want to become wet like a drowned rat. 
The door was the only entrance to the roof. If he had rope, he could rappel down the side of the building and jump through an open window. But he had no rope and his uniforms weren't strong or long enough to risk putting his life on the line. Katsuki trod along the railing until he reached the back side of the school. It was closer to the gate and the security guard shack than the other side was to the front entrance. He gripped the railing and peered down. The security guard was dozing off. That lazy fucker. Hey. He tried yelling to get his attention but the guard showed no signs of having heard him. Damn it. Drops of rain had turned into a drizzle and at the rate it was going. It shouldn't take more than five minutes for it to turn into a heavy downpour. Katsuki sprinted back to the door and pounded against it some more. But either because all the teachers were deaf or have already left the school, no one came to his rescue. Running out of options, he went back to the railing and looked around. Directly under it was a platform that extended from the top edge of an open window, but it was about 10 feet away and was only as wide as his shoulders, barely enough space to stand on. Could he make it? Katsuki squeezed the railing, eyes set on his target. He would make it. He wasn't the type to sit here waiting for someone to save him like he was a damsel in distress. If he wanted something done he would go hands-on and get it done. Change had to start from oneself. Rain splashed onto his cheeks, seeping down his neck and disappearing into his dirtied uniform. Dirty blonde hair whipped around with the wind. Katsuki stood on the outer edge of the railing, unfocused eyes staring past his toes at the hard cement so, so far away. He clenched onto the wet railing tightly, fingers going numb and teeth clattering in the cold. He wasn't afraid of height, but on a stormy day like this where he couldn't produce any sweat to fuel his explosions, a slip of foot could end his short, unsatisfying life. Trembling hands fumbling with the grip as he turned so he was facing the railing. Katsuki closed his eyes and took in a deep shaky breath to mentally prepare himself. As the rain continued beating down on his back like some kind of lashing, he opened his eyes and let go, gripping the bottom edge of the rooftop and letting his feet hang in midair. He could feel his fingers starting to slip both from his weight and from the slipperiness. He dared a glance down. His feet were about five feet away from the platform. He had successfully jumped from five feet high before. He could make it. Time was running out. His body swayed dangerously as wind knocked him astray, his shirt puffing up and revealing his security alarm which he had hooked the strap onto his pant buckle. Ever since it had saved him during that incident, he had carried it everywhere he went. Katsuki glanced away to focus on the mission. In his head, he silently counted. 3. He trained his eyes on the platform. 2. He took a deep breath. 1. And his fingers slipped. His feet slammed against the platform and he reached forward to regain his balance. But as if God himself was against him, he lost his footing due to the rain and momentum caused him to fall backward. Shit. He shot out his hand to grab onto the platform but his fingers missed it by an inch. He tumbled in the air, the world rushing by in a blur and his arms flailing around trying to grab onto something. Anything. As he dropped past the platform on the second floor window, he managed to grab hold of it. Immediately, a sharp spike of pain shot up his arm followed by a popping sound, forcing him to let go. He knew more pain was coming. In this weather the most he could produce were tiny sparks, nowhere near the power he needed to slow his descent. The impact came faster than he expected. He didn't even have a second to mentally prepare himself before he crashed headfirst into the pavement. Pain overwhelmed him and the last thing he remembered were the heavy grey clouds looming over him ominously and a familiar shrilling cry. Izuku was nervous at first to return to school. He expected his classmates to make fun of him for crying like a baby last Wednesday. But he received none of that. Instead, they greeted him cheerfully, genuinely glad to have him back. They pampered him and made sure he was fine. They also got him caught up with everything he had missed and let him copy their homework. What truly touched him was the fact that they all avoided mentioning Bakugo when talking, knowing he might be triggered. Everyone in his class treated him like he belonged, like they really cared about him. It was so different from the way things were back then, when he was ignored just because he was quirkless. But ever since he found digitalization and changed the way he walked, talked, and acted, everyone slowly changed as well and talked to him more. At first it was only sweet requests, and then they found out he could do magic and begged him to show them. The more they interacted, the more comfortable they felt talking to the quirkless kid. And now, he was friends with everyone in his class and they stuck together like one big happy family. If someone messed with one of them, they were messing with all of them. Bakugo didn't talk to him at all the entire day. He acted like Izuku wasn't there and even stepped out during lunch as if he was avoiding Izuku on purpose. Inko had told him he should apologize to Bakugo for dumping poop in his mouth, and he admitted it was a low move, but killing someone's pet was a far worse crime. Bakugo should apologize first and Izuku refused to back off this time. He was not the weak, cowardly Deku anymore. He had digitalization, he had a quirk, and he had friends who supported him. He wasn't afraid of Bakugo no longer. When school ended, Bakugo was the first one out of the class. Izuku pouted. Fine, keep avoiding me then. We'll see who can last longer. He jumped when Gamu wrapped an arm around his shoulder. 
Hey, let's go to the game center together. Um, sure. And Ko wouldn't be home for another 30 minutes so he had some time. He could just tell her he was out quest hunting. Hey Raiden. Gamu turned and stopped the other boy who was about to step out. Wanna come with us? Nah sorry, I got things to do. Raiden smiled apologetically. Man, you never hang out with us. What kept you so busy? It's my dad. He doesn't like me wasting time after school. Damn, he's a doctor isn't he? It must sucks having an uptight dad like that. Well, we're gonna go have some fun. See you tomorrow. Raiden waved at them with a tight smile before leaving the classroom. How do you know his dad is a doctor? Izuku asked. I've known him for a while. Gamu replied as they made their way to the shoe lockers. And I met his dad once. He looks really strict and tense like someone's gonna jump him any time. Well, he deals with dead bodies every day so I don't blame him. But I just can't stand this weird vibe he gives off. It creeps me out. HM. They parted ways momentarily as they went to their respective lockers. Izuku pulled open his and was surprised to find a brown, paper bag inside. He looked around. This was his locker right. Tentatively. He grabbed the paper bag and peered inside. It contained a glass cage that held a... Izuku almost forgot how to breathe. On the bag there was a note. To Deku, it's an eastern tiger swallowtail caterpillar. I can't find one the same size as your pet and this is all the pet store has to offer. I shouldn't have killed your pet. Sorry, BK. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.